good morning and welcome to Sunday Worship. We are at the Temple of Speed for the third round in the FIA World Endurance Championship with the Autodromo Nazionale di Monza. And if those words alone don't send a shiver up your spine, would you please seek urgent medical attention? Hello, everybody, and welcome to our coverage of round three of the championship from Monza. And welcome back to fans at a World Endurance race for the first time in 18 months, nearly. Martin Haven, Graham Goodwin, and Alan McNish in the booth. And Alan, this is another one of those classic tracks that drivers just look at a calendar and go, oh, yes, please. Every time you drive into Monza, you just can't help but smile. The circuit's got so much history, it's got so much tradition, it's got such a challenge in the corners, and it's so reminiscent to what it was right back when it begins. But uh, right now, we are at Monza. It's the third race of the complete season, Martin. We've had Spa, we've had Portimao, and now we're here at Monza before we go to the next one, being the 24 hours of the month. And historically, it would have been the 1,000 kilometers at Silverstone, or the six hours, which would have been the big shakedown for Le Mans because it was a suitably long, fast circuit. And Monza is going to do exactly that. Of course, there are championship points. There's the glory of winning in Monza. If you win at Monza and say so, everybody knows the name of the circuit, don't they? So that's, you know, a feather in your cap. And for teams and drivers, there's battles to be fought with teammates, with rivals for points for the end of the season. But you're right, the, the jewel in the crown of all endurance racing is the 24 hours of Le Mans. And this is where it begins to get serious. This is where testing really, really starts to play out. Long race, long endurance testing has already been done by a lot of the teams and manufacturers. But testing is testing, and, and racing is something entirely different. It teaches you a huge amount. It certainly does. Here, you've got three sectors on the circuit, all of them quite similar in reality, because they've got long, wide-open throttle, flat, flat-out sections with uh, varying lengths of minimal corners. There is only six corners on the circuit. However, each one is a real challenge. You've got the two chicanes at the beginning of the lap, then you've got the Lesmo corners at the top of the circuit, and then you come through to Varianta Scari, which is a really tricky left, right, left, and we've seen a few incidents there in practice and qualifying, and then Curva Parabolica, the last corner, which is a long, long right-hander leading on to the big straight. You need to have good car balance here because the drivers need to have confidence, and with such a high average speed, straight line speed, as well as corner speeds, then uh, it really, you have to trust what's underneath you. Part of the issue that they're going to have this weekend is that everybody is using low downforce, low drag kits for them on. And so high track temperatures could see, with, with lower aero grip, could see tyre degradation being maybe more of a factor here at Monta. But look at the tarmac, Alan. It's very pale. Yesterday in qualifying, air temperature was 30 degrees. Track temperature was only 46. I mean, it wasn't 60 degrees like it would be on a really dark black tarmac. No, but the other thing for grip in this section here is we see uh, Franco de Perodo's car that qualified second overall yesterday, but then had a penalty and is starting right at the back of the grid. When you actually have these big long straights, you need to increase the minimum tyre pressure due to the fact the tyre is turning. We're doing 200 miles per hour at the end of the straights here, and so the centrifugal force, and that means that you actually lose mechanical grip. So you've lost aerodynamic grip, so you need to be fast down the straights, get rid of that downforce, but at the same time, you lose mechanical grip from the tyre as well. So that's going to be a real struggle when we start to talk about the second stint on the tyre, Graham, where they've got a limited number but that second stint, I think, is going to be absolutely critical, especially in the GTE Pro and also in the LMP2 battles. A very different circuit indeed. Good afternoon, everybody. And it is scorching out there, 32 degrees at the moment and still climbing. We saw, didn't we, on a very different track at Portimao, extreme degradation on those tyres. Here, Alan, though, different sort of challenge. They've got to stretch the envelope as best they possibly can. Here, Fuel is going to be an issue as well for all of these cars. The GT cars, if this stays green, they'll be will not be able to keep to a full hour's running the cars because there's so much full throttle here. And at uh, number, 80, uh, the number 47 car we just saw coming around there, they settle our car, one of a number that's been in trouble here. It's going to be busy. I can't see this race running full green uh, throughout. I think we're going to have a very busy racetrack. Yeah, you always have some incidents and things like that. And you said about wide open throttle, you're about 70% flat out 
and so therefore that just consumes so much energy. At the same time, with the slow corners at the beginning of the lap, the chicanes, then you stop the car, and then you have to accelerate all that weight and momentum to get back up to top speed again. And so you're right, fuel economy is going to be one of the factors. Juan Pablo Montoya, he actually understands very well how to do that from racing in America. And so I would think the experience of some of these drivers actually could come into play as well as the strategy from the teams themselves. And that's the other thing, isn't it? Because we've never been here before for the FI World Endurance Championship, there are a number of teams and drivers that have little or no experience in these cars here, and that's going to come into play as well. And it is worth saying that, that sentence again. The World Endurance Championship since 2012 has never raced at Monza. It seems almost impossible that that could be the case because it's Monza Spa, Silverstone, they're such classic European endurance race venues, but with a relatively limited number of races that you can run globally, it just hasn't been possible to come here. Thankfully, this year, for reasons that, of course, that we all understand, we are here and the cars are on the grid. What about temperatures? There's actually quite a lot more cloud cover than I was expecting. We kind of think it might be really bright blue and Scorchio. Will that cloud cover help with cockpit temperatures? And is that going to be an issue for the GT cars particularly? Because, of course, these closed cockpit cars do have temperature monitors inside and you're not allowed to exceed a certain delta above the ambient, ambient air temperature. And the ambient air temperature being high, with the cloud cover stopping the cars maybe heating up quite so much from the sun, that gives them just another degree or two of margin, and sometimes that might be enough. It might be enough, but, I mean, anything above 32 is going to be pretty darn steamy anyway, mm. isn't it? Uh, cars certainly getting to the grid here, they're going to be warm. It's going to be very hot. You're going to see some very hot drivers coming out of these cars. Here's the number 56 car, Eugenio Perfetti, the man behind this effort from Team Project One. And uh, he's the family-owned company that uh, owns, amongst things, the Mentos brand that's uh, adorning this car. Yeah, Mentos, Chupa Chups, and a whole bunch of other... Um, Smint. Sweet comestibles. Indeed. <laughs> things that your parents say you can't be having those. Um, obviously, we have plenty. But uh, former champion as well. And and in terms of being a gentleman driver, we talked during qualifying about Egidio Perfetti and about Ben Keating, and some of, you know, some of the gentleman drivers in these cars are real stars. I mean, they are really, really bringing their game up. There's the 47 Chetila car. That's our championship leader after the first two rounds of the season. AF Corsa's number 54 car in second place, TF Sport in third spot with the car that is actually next to them on the grid. So, and, you know, we go to Le Mans, double points for Le Mans. We'll go then to rounds five and six, which will be a double header weekend, or two weeks in a row, not the double header weekend. That would really be quite endurance <laughs> uh, based uh, in Bahrain towards the end of the year. And there'll be points for the first race and points and a half for the second race. So there's a lot of points still on offer here, more than half the season's points up for grabs. Ben Keating, our pole man in GTE Am, shares with uh, Ultra Mobile One Super Cup ace Dylan Pereira and uh, the TF Sport team on the top of the pile in qualifying. It was a it was a good qualifying battle as well in the GTM. It was a great qualifying battle. Uh, unfortunately, these, there's been a change post-session. We'll talk about that when we get a chance to have a look at the number 83 car and a potential wrinkle in their plans, not just because of a change in grid position for the 83, but also the fact they're going to have to start Alessio Rivera and not Francois Perodo. Good luck there at two of the six drivers here yeah, well, for the Glickenhaus, Scuderia, Glamcar and Glickenhaus. The first ever occasion we're going to be able to see two of those cars starting as the band fires up. Yeah. It is time for the Italian national anthem in a few minutes. Well, let's get down to the grid with our pit reporter, Louise Beckett. An Italian racing in Monza in a Ferrari. That is peak Italian. Let's hear from Alessandro Pierguidi. Alessandro Pierguidi qualifying the 51 Ferrari in P2. You're going to be doing everything you can to hunt that Porsche down, especially here in Monza. Yes, of course, we will try our best to, to win in Monza. It will be very special, should be very special uh, for us. Uh, it's first time in Italy for the WC and racing with Ferrari is always something special. Um, even more this time that we have some spectators, so it, there is the fun again. So we will, uh, we will do everything we can 
Uh, and let's see, six hours long, we, we need to do everything perfect, like always. If you're not, you, you can win this kind of race. And it is a big one for Ferrari. You're going to be leading a pack of 10 Ferraris competing here today. As you say, in front of this limited, but we've still got a crowd. It's great. Yeah, it's very great. Uh, to have 10 cars here is a big success for Ferrari, I think, and show how is the car is good and everyone wants to drive a Ferrari. So I'm very lucky to, do, to be a factory driver and drive a pro car. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well, let's talk a little bit, Graham, before we get to the sharp end of the grid about the future and about Ferrari's oh, plans, yeah. because this is all part of the driving force of aligning the rules on both sides of the Atlantic, basically European rules based around Le Mans and the American IMSA regulations. Ferrari wants to go hypercar and Ferrari wants to race in Europe, around the world and in America in the IMSA series. And, you know, when you've got a manufacturer with that kind of emotional clout looking for convergence in the hypercar rules, that's the sort of thing that drives it across the lines. Absolutely. It? And, you know, Ferrari coming, the Peugeot's been here this weekend already. Mm -hmm. Ferrari coming, Audi coming, Porsche coming, all sorts of other names uh, around the world. BMW are coming, GM are coming, Honda are coming. Yeah. Uh, and uh, here this weekend, we've uh, spotted lots of people with Lamborghini. Um, badges yep. on their on their shirts they're likely to be coming at some point too this is a fantastic time to be part of what is going to be a very rapidly growing family of sports car racing fans and these are the green shoots of that with lots of established and young talent that are going to be coming in and competing for what is going to be a vastly increased crop of factory and factory supported uh, driver postings and the, his two guys that will be hoping to be part of that james collado yeah. and alessandro pierre guidi already world champions remember absolutely the wc uh, world drivers champions in the wc and they are going to be hoping that they're going to get the nod in what we now know by the way is going to be an af course a run ferrari factory team in hypercar from 2023 and you mentioned as well there the absolutely extremely fantastic news that we've now got full convergence. That means that all the cars that we're going to be seeing in the WEC, whether or not they be the Le Mans hypercar versions that we've already got in the WEC, all the LMDH cars that will be coming along in 23, that now IMSA's WeatherTech Sports Car Championship will accept both as well. That opens up huge opportunities, both for factory teams and for what we expect to be a slew of uh, private, privately funded hypercar teams in both both championships and also being able to do a bit of a pick and mix. Yeah, and and everybody's rubbing their hands with glee, going, "It's Group C again, isn't it?" And and it, and and it's not. But it was that sort of global acceptance of one set of sports car regulations that made Group C such a huge success. You can do the Daytona 24 hours, you can do Sebring 12, you can do Le Mans 24 hours, you can race in Japan, China, Australia, you know, wherever, and customer cars were, was key to the success of being able to go out and race with the same kit against the factory that's what customers wanted they want parity that's whatever because they all want some advantage but they want parity real team racing leading the point standings in the pro-am category in lmp2 that's new for this season to reflect the influence in lmp2 as in gt that AM drivers, gentlemen drivers, professionals in other spheres who happen to love coming racing, really have in the LMP2 field. Yeah, everything's about, uh, you know, the, the focus goes on ex Grand Prix stars or, or like, let's say, Antonio Felix da Costa, you know, the champion in, in uh, Formula E or Ann Davidson, another ex Grand Prix driver, an ex Toyota driver, you know. But it is the gentleman like Roberto Gonzalez in that car that produce the funding and also are absolutely pivotal to the success of the car. You can put two superstars in. If your gentleman driver can't improve with every time he gets in the car, then you're going to really struggle. And and that's all part of the deal in LMP2 and GTE. And. Yeah, you had the picture there of the two, if you like, subclasses in LMP2. Their, uh, their championship leaders are next to each other on the grid after some woes for Jota in qualifying yesterday. That's LMP2 Pro-Am class. And here's an addition to the grid, by the way, uh, one of the cars we'll see at Le Mans. Uh, next month, this is the Rissi Competizione, and once that cover is taken off, you will see that the tribute to their regular livery is complete. It does look absolutely stunning. We'll see this car at Le Mans as well. It's a crew partially made up of their American crew, as uh, yeah, cartoon-like. <laughs> <but>, uh, <laughs> 
That's well, the racing team they've linked up. A couple of changes in racing team leather. Nick de Vries is back. He missed the last race because he was uh, on Formula E duty, but there is no Gerda van der Gaard. Gerda tested positive before travelling here, and so uh, Paul Chatin has been dropped in into the car. Well, Nick shouldn't be in the car at all this year. We've had, uh, rather oddly, and very unfortunately for the team, a couple of po uh, COVID positives with Jan van Utrecht last weekend, not able to take part here, and Gerda van der Gaard are at home now, being tested positive. Uh, stay well, gentlemen. I'm sure you're watching in. Absolutely. It is Henrik Edman. Um, um, at the Dragon Speed car, the 21 car. The Pro-Am uh, squads, by the way, of which this is one, what defines them is one of their drivers, at least one of their drivers, must be bronze ranked by the FIA uh, in the driver rankings. And that effectively gives us two sets of competition. These are the bronze drivers with whatever package they've managed to garner around them, uh, able to effectively race against their peers. And when you talk to these guys in the paddock, that absolutely motivates them. Here's an opportunity, though, Martin, with the seventh place car on the grid, second in the uh, on the grid for LMP2. What a topsy-turvy season it's been already at Spa. This team, the 22 uh, squad, absolutely dominated. Um, you know, almost a lap ahead of the competition, and then at Portimao, complete change after that lap one. Uh, fumble between the two Jota cars. They came back and bossed it with a one-two. Astonishing stuff, and still. They're going head-to-head -head here again. Uh, this one is going to be a tale that will run and run all the way to the final race of the season, the eight hours of Bahrain. And WRT there, Pole Citizen LMP2, they really feel that LMP2 owes them a win because they've been so strong in European Le Mans series racing. It's such a strong team and lineup. They just haven't managed to avoid silly mistakes and that, you know, errors, silly mistakes, bits of contact. And uh, the LMP2 pole sitter starts in seventh place on our grid. described numerous times as the national anthem of motor racing and certainly here it is there are two official state religions in Italy of course Catholicism and Ferrari and the Tifosi are here in number you will see lots of Ferrari flags in the grandstand as rightly should Pierre Fion the president of the Automobile Club de l'Ouest the governing body of Le Mans and Le Mans series racing of which the World Endurance Championship, of course, is a highly dedicated acolyte. And uh, between the ACO and IMSA, the governing body of sports car racing in North America, finally, convergence is not just on the horizon, but rushing towards us in the shape of 2023 and the arrival of Le Mans Daytona hypercar to go with these cars, the hypercars. Now, it may look like a P4 Ferrari, and that's not by mistake, not because it comes from Maranello. No, 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 no. It comes from New York, because this 
is the Glickenhaus team. Scuderia Glickenhaus, and they have now, for the first time, two of their fabulous hypercars on the grid. And Graham Goodwin, it's great to see Jim Glickenhaus and his team. A man who just loves, he's so passionate about cars, about racing. He just saw the opportunity here in the hypercar rules, which are basically, if you've got a car or you want to build a car, you can build whatever you like and race it. And that's what they're doing here. Well, let's catch up with the 708 driver, Gustavo Menezes, who will also be having a role in hypercar in the future. Gustavo Menezes is back with us in WEC. It's lovely to have you back in the second of the Glickenhauses at 708, the faster of the two. What's possible with this race? Yeah, honestly, always happy to be back in this paddock. I absolutely love the environment at the WEC Championship. And to have some fans back today really makes it special. You know, after over a year of this uh, difficult situation in the world, to have everyone back is great. Uh, it's been an honor to drive for Glickenhaus. And uh, on our first race, you know, I think there's some real possibilities to look for a podium. So right now, our only goal is to keep our nose clean, make no mistakes, work on the reliability as it is, a build-up for Le Mans. And uh, we'll see where that result puts us at the end. And of course, you've got two hats here this weekend because we had the world premiere of the Peugeot that's been launched uh, and you're one of the drivers. Yeah, honestly, as everyone's seen it, it was a little bit of a shock with the, the different style and approach that they've made. But this is why I absolutely love this with this new hypercar regulation to see differences between each team. Um, you know, that car is definitely a big step towards that hypercar direction. Um, Obviously, I'm 100% focused on this season, and once we, uh, we cross the finish line for the last race, the chapter will turn, and uh, I'm very proud to be a part of that fleet for, uh, for the oncoming seasons. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you, guys. It is a phenomenal-looking device, really major echoes of the, of the current new family face of Peugeot's road cars. You want to bring a road car-based hypercar? A Valkyrie or something, you can. You want to bring a pure prototype, purebred racing car? That's what the Glickenhaus is. You can. You want it to be hybrid? You can. You don't need hybrid. You don't have to have hybrid. It, it's a phenomenal, almost, almost Can-Am style sort of open rules package. If you've got a car or you can imagine a car, chances are you can race it in hypercar. So to wit, we have the two new Glickenhauses. We have. The Alpine here, so we've got five for the first time, five hypercars on the grid, and Alpine qualifying in third place. But they are still going to be, although maybe matching the Toyotas on pace, Graham, they still are going to be with that fuel tank deficiency over their rivals. Yeah, we think maybe about four laps difference in the stint. I'm going to correct you on one thing. You are correct that Glickenhaus are based in New York State. Mm. Um, you're incorrect. That car was built there. It was actually no. built two hours down the road in the Oster yes. Valley <laughs> at Podium Engineering. That is where all the Glickenhaus race cars have been built so far. Podium Engineering here as part of this package, together with Joost. And uh, we've had a whole tranche of, well, household names involved in the design of that car. They do look absolutely stunning. They sound yep. great. It's great to have them here. And let's just see what can be done about the Toyota attack here. The thing we've learned so far, gentlemen, um, in the WC so far, with the changes we've seen with this new class structure, and the changes to LMP2 as well, you've got to be perfect. Traffic is more of an issue uh, with these uh, these new regulations. We've got a lot of that here. There are 37 cars here. We did lose, I'm afraid, one of the entry yesterday. Um, we're not going to see the Inception racing Ferrari this weekend after a, uh, an incident in practice. But you've got to be perfect. You've got to be perfect on track, perfect in the pits, because now these regulations will punish you. And Alan McNish, you know, this is the biggest field we've had in the season. And even on a long, fast track with good sight lines like Monza, there's going to be a lot of traffic after the hypercars, you know, probably lap three or four. They're going to be in the tail of the field. And after that, it's six hours of surviving every passing maneuver that you make. Yes, yeah, certainly. But uh, here in comparison to Portimao, it's a little bit easier for that. There's bigger straight line speed differentials in the categories. And uh, to some extent, you always know where you're going to overtake. It's either going to be in a braking area or it's going to be on the straight. Whereas uh, some of the other circuits, when we go to Le Mans next, there's a lot of inside, outside, round, every position possible. And so I expect that the fans who are going to 
happy. I'm sure cheering on the start are going to get a great race, but from a driver's point of view, it's about precision. They need to be very precise all the way around. We've seen people making very small mistakes, but due to the speed and nature of the circuit with very big consequences. Yeah, absolutely right. There's, it's, it's a proper old school track. It doesn't forgive errors. There's a lot of grass and a lot of gravel and very little in the way of runoff area. Let's hear from the Alpine that starts third. Okay, Alex, so the new stuff to get there. All okay for you? Yes, everything is great. We roll off in 26 seconds. Everything is great. Well, that's exactly what you want to hear. That was Andre Negrau feeling very chipper. And what we're going to see, Graham, probably in the first hour is the Alpine really attacking hard, trying to force some kind of crack in the uh, Toyota defence. Has to, and then has to go uh, into, well, it's going to be a, a tricky one. I'm keen to hear what Alan's going to say about this one. Attacking, but also preserving what they can of that fuel mileage. Uh, I think we're going to see them lifting and coasting again into turn one to preserve some of that uh, to try to close that that built-in gap and it's only because this is a grandfather car this is not kind of unfair to them it's just the way these regulations are voiced five cars in hypercar it's going to get much much better than that in the next couple of years I'm truly excited about the prospects not just for what we got the next six hours but for what we've got for the next five to seven years that's for sure certainly with the uh marketing director of Ferrari there waving the green flag to get this uh, formation lap underway Ferrari obviously here with uh, their GT cars and uh, they'll be fighting out to try and win the GT Pro and also the AM categories however they will also be coming into the top category returning to the top category first time well they were there when I started in sports car racing back in uh, the late 90s but uh, since then they've always been focused on GT now they're coming back and it's good to see that sort of that support coming into it let's take a look at our starting grid for the six hours of Monza Sebastian Buemi on the pole position uh, for a big pub that's Mike Conway on pole from Sebastian Buemi Andre Negrau and then our LMP2 Pro-Am pole sitter is the uh, Dragon Speed car number 21 of Juan Pablo Montoya and that car starts in sixth pos uh, in eighth position. Looking further back, Rishi Competizioni there, making their first World Endurance appearance with the LMP2 car as they prepare for Le Mans. Number one, Tatiana Calderon starts the Richard Mill Racing Team. Just two drivers here, her and Sophia Flersch. As, uh, they are the ones who are available. In the GT Pro class, Kevin Escher sitting on pole position. And he heads up the Ferraris and Porsches. And then our GTE and pole sitter, 22nd on the grid for Ben Keating behind Miguel Molina. There will be a gap between the prototypes, LMP1 and LMP2, and the GT cars, just to give a little bit of space. Looking further back, uh, 54AF Corsa car, qualifying in 26th position ahead of the 98 Aston Martin. There are a few cars with problems in qualifying. Rinaldi Racing making their first start here and then towards the tail of the field. Team Project One had problems getting a lap together cleanly and Andrea Puccini, the 60 Iron Lynx car and Alessio Rivera, the 83 AF Corsa car at the back of the grid. One didn't go out in qualifying and one lost all its times because of a ride height issue. So that is our 36 car grid wending its way around the Autodromo di Monza. And that's, uh, you mentioned the 83 car, that has compromised the 83 car. They would, I'm sure, have preferred to have started Francois Barodo. The way the rules work is, having lost their qualifying times, they have to start the quickest driver in free practice. That's Alessio Rivera, my view, is they would have preferred to have kept the lightning fast Italian uh, to complete the attack later in the race. Because of course, if you're gonna get an incident, it's most likely to be when the cars are this close together. And that could lead to them burning some of the time of the quickest driver. On board with our Inter-Europol competition LMP2 car, car number 34. That being started by Alex Brundle. You can see the gap now between the tail of the LMP2 field, where the 38 Jota Sport car is after a crash in qualifying, having not set a time. And that car rebuilt overnight. The team got away about midnight, and then the gap. Kevin Estre in the white Porsche on the front of the GT field pacing them. So we have six hours of racing here, round three of the FIA World Endurance Championship at Monza, with the Toyota lockout of the front row. Red lights are on. 
holding their speed and away we go. The Tricolor flies. We are racing at Monza, round three of the FIA World Endurance Championship. Toyota 1-2 on the grid, Alpine, and then the two Glickenhaus cars right behind. Side by side they go, nobody wants to concede here, it's a little bit of a traffic jam as ever, and the Alpine moves up to second place, uh, no change at the front of the pro field, and Ben Keating with his elbows out, the Cetela Ferrari trying to get around the outside, loses a spot instead, Alan McNish. Yeah, but there's been a lead change in uh, LMP2, as you see there, the two Toyotas, Line of Stern, come in, but it's Phil Hansen that ran round the outside of everybody at the first corner there. It's overtaken in LMP2s. So there's another battle, Toyota's slow, yep. and uh, the Alpine needs to try to make this move, Graham, very, very early. Absolutely, what? trying to put the car under pressure now. The crowd jumped the second Toyota away from the line. He got ahead into the first corner, so Kurt clearly around Curva Grande and into the Retifilio. Sebastian Buemi has come back past him. And now as they exit the Lesmos and head down under the old banking, from this originally 10-kilometre road and oval combined track. It is the number seven car from pole position who leads the field. Now, they outraced in terms of pace their teammates in number eight last time out in Portimao. The number eight car, feeling they couldn't match their rivals on pace, went on fuel, and that was the deciding factor in the race balance. They beat them on fuel economy. Yeah, they had a safety car late in the race and that allowed them right back into the game. But I think this one right now, everybody's looking at it in pure pace. Very interesting for me what happens in GTE Pro, this category here. We've got two Porsches and two Ferraris. What we've seen is Porsche delivering Kevin Estra three pole position. Oh, three wide. The AF Corsa 83 car coming from the back of the field, going by and the D-Train uh, Aston Martin also trying to go by the Rinaldi Racing Ferrari. That's the red Ferrari. In fact, that's the only red Ferrari in GTE Am. Two. I beg your pardon. Sorry. 61 is so that was, right. was a great move around the outside. Kept it kept away from the trouble, but that looked like it was trouble from the inside yeah. with the 777 trying to make the move. Now the two Glickenhaus are getting involved with each other. 709 from 708. It's and Richard Westbrook from uh, Pippa Durrani. That's a change. It is a change, yes. They've swapped positions. Westy on his way or after the Alpine. And that, that 709, this is its first race, don't forget. But it looks like it's got some sort of issue there because it's dropped right back into the clutches of Phil Hansen, who's leading LMP2 directly behind. Let's take a little bit of a view on this after maybe one lap when we see the sector times building up to see where they actually are. But Glickenhaus certainly switched to two cars and uh, the 709 is now on its way. Richard Westbrook is still, he's 1.6 1 behind uh, third place to Andre Negrau. Red, white and blue, that is our LMP2 leader, Phil Hansen in the number 22 United Autosports Orica, right behind WRT with Robin Freens, then Nick de Vries, yellow and black, then the white car with the blue stripe, one Pablo Montoya, won his first Formula One Grand Prix here for Williams, the fastest ever recorded Grand Prix lap at that stage, it's only just been built, beaten nearly 20 years later. But he said, boy, this is a very different racetrack. He's one of a number of drivers that was here last week in European Le Mans Series racing. He said, this has really changed since he was here in F1. And again, the back of the queue there, you can see the AF Corsa 83 car with Alessio Rivera. He's certainly using all his pace. Cetelar under pressure, Roberto Lacorte from Fr Francesco Castellacci in the silver car. The most Italian battle it's possible to have <laughs> of the Psychos Castellacci. Like a clean move there. Cetela, the blue car to the left, the 47 car that leads the championship, the 54 car. Not giving it up, is he? No, he's not. Well, that car's already had a bit of wars this weekend. The Cetela car in free practice went off at Lesmo 2 and was heavily damaged, but managed to get it back out to see them running in a podium position. Certainly wasn't what I expected when I saw it burying itself <laughs> into what seemed like a different country. It was that far off the track. Yeah. It was a, a big issue with the brakes, they think. Through they come, still closely spaced in LMP2, as we're getting used to these days. I tell you, a new car here with an Italian name, Risi Competizione. There you see it, the number one, just uh, dances in the car behind the uh, Dragon Speed, this one. And uh, this is new to the category. It's also going to be racing at Le Mans, but Oliver Jarvis is grabbing a hold of it. He was super happy with the car balance in qualifying. Nazar, Felipe Nazar, said that he could have been third on the grid if they had finished their lap when the red flags came out. 
really misleading livery actually because it's got a big one in the middle of the nose that's first form their sponsor which is a, a fitness app car number one is the richard mill racing team same color, so, yeah, same same color. color. thanks everybody 82 <laughs> 82 the Richie competition car and great to see them yeah. and it here it does look spectacular fastest lap of the race this early on has just gone to the lead car mike conway with a 137 296 that lap, by the way, from Pippa Durrani when he was passed by the sister car, he was something like two and a half seconds down on the pace of the 709. He's recovered some of that, but not a lot of it. No. So, looks like a problem for that car. 1.6 seconds on the last lap, a little bit off the pace, and he's sort of actually holding up the P2 cars a little bit. And you can see Castellacci there, he's disappeared. Last lap, he overtook the car, but on the inside, you've got a Porsche, and then yeah. you've got looking to go three wide as uh, the recovering uh, Ferrari, which started at the back of the grid. Yeah. We've got to remember that for a post-qualifying penalty. And so he's made his way through very, very quickly. Alessio Rivera is in the 83 car. We'd expect him to be making progress. He's been stellar all the way through the season. And uh, we're hearing from Louise Beckett that that Flicken House is going to be making a very early pit stop indeed. Here comes that move up the inside of the number 56 car, Eugenio Perfetti. Gives way for Rivera. They'll know who's been aboard that car. There's little point at this stage with too much robust defending yeah. in these circumstances. It's a clean start, though, guys. Yeah, it was a clean start. And I'm sure that the advice there to Eugenio Perfetti, let him go, look after your tyres, it's not our battle. Yeah. Not our battle at the moment, but it will be the battle later on. Francois Perodo, the driver that did the qualifying yesterday of the second car in this lineup, which soon will be, I think, the first. He goes to the outside. This is going to be a tough one into Ascari round the outside there. He's going to need a lot of help from Lacorte, who says, uh -uh, not Odin. Oh, you little fighter. Lacorte didn't give away second place in a hurry and a straight run down into the braking area and was not about to be tucked up in Ascari around the outside either. There's pride on display here, isn't there? This is, uh, this is the Privateer Ferrari contingent yeah. and uh, they've moved to, uh, Settler Racing moved to the Ferrari this season. He's loving it, absolutely loving it. Another move up the inside. Yeah, that's the, D the, the D Station Alpine, uh, Alpine D Station, Aston, beg your pardon, trying to get by the Iron Dames car and that's been started by newcomer Sarah Bovey. So this is her first World Endurance race with the team, and right behind the D-Station car. It's Belgian driver Bovi, and uh, she's got a lot of experience, not necessarily in the World Endurance Championship, but getting on with it. But that's twice in four laps we've seen that D-Station oh. car diving down the inside and up over the curb. And it's got by her, and next up is the 98 Aston Martin. Paul Dallalana has started that. We're expecting the number 60 Iron Lynx car to come in, in as well. Is in. He is in already. Now, is that in. car had a very significant front-end impact in FP2. Didn't make it out for FP3. Did go out in qualifying, became straight back in. And Dalalana doesn't get it done at the Roger and will have to give that away. Yeah, he's got to give the places back because he took a long-lasting <laughs> advantage there. That's probably 30 metres off the actual track length on this occasion. Oh. For third place up the inside, Alessia Rivera makes no mistakes in Lesmo 2. That's a tough corner though, Al. It's very easy to get that wrong. It is, but it's a lot easier than he's trying to go round the outside in the middle of Ascari that he did on the last <laughs> lap. And so he's certainly not hes not shy on bravery at the moment and uh, getting the job done, pushed his way through, effectively pushed his way through. But right now it's sort of starting to settle down with people making their way forward and others maybe settling into position. Tom Ferrier needs to be on the radio to uh, Paul Dallalana in the 98 Aston Martin because although he's allowed the other Aston by the D-Station car of Tomonobu Fuji, he has oh. not, oh dear, he has not allowed the... Uh, Iron Dames car to go back in front and he must or he'll get a penalty. Well, that's... Is that coolant everywhere? Yeah. Looks radiator like Radiator coolant flying everywhere, the 60. That car's the one that had the front end damage, as you said, didn't partake in qualifying, started absolutely last on the grid due to that. And uh, they had temperature issues straight away, which suggesting the maybe he wasn't quite wired up directly afterwards. Yeah, it didn't look a happy car in qualifying, did it? And that car already, even if it does get back in, owes us a drive-through penalty. Uh, 98, Paul Dallalana being told now by race control to give the position back to the Iron Dames car, which he does, but he's held them up for a lap. 
and allowed his teammate, the Sister TF Sport uh, Car, to not, go no, away. No, not a Sister TF Sport Car, that's the AMR run car. Oh, the AMR car, yes, yeah, so, so it's This is a yeah. replay, comes in on the outside into the second chicane, basically far too fast, couldn't get it slowed down. It, you're meant to go round the outside of the cone that you saw on the far left of the picture. If he had done that, then everything would have been fine because he would have slotted in behind naturally. Here we're at the lead of LMP2. Phil Hansen took the lead at the first corner from Robin Frins in the WRT car in second and Nick the Three shadowing. And so it's pretty much status quo in the gaps between the top three, but they're edging away from one Pablo Montoya in fourth place at the moment. Just taking a look at the drivers who got involved in this battle in LMP2. Uh, Phil Hansen, the defending champion from last year, everywhere. Uh, Robin Frins, Nick de Vries, Juan Pablo Montoya, Oliver Jarvis, Loic Duval, Alex Brundle. And it's an amazing lineup in yeah. LMP2. And the last car in the train is Stoffel van Dorn. This man, he had a shunt in qualifying coming out of the second Lesbo. Crash, that caused the red flag, it wasn't restarted. And uh, that compromised that car significantly because it had to start from the back of the LMP category grid. At the same time as well, damaged the tires. And he's got such a limited number, that's gonna compromise them all the way through. So they're trying to start on those tires to see if they can get away with it. Issue is, Graham, with this high speed nature here, if you've got any flat spot, the vibration is insane. Uh, up the inside of Eugenio Profetti goes the D-Station car. Uh, but uh, the 28 car, tellingly, has not managed to get by the ARC Bratislava Ligier in the hands of Oli Webb. Yeah. Well, here is a position change. D-Station, Tomo Fuji up the inside of Egidio Perfetti. And so that car now moves up D-Station up into fifth in GTE Am ahead of the former champion. And Oli Webb in what we believe will be the last race for a Ligier, certainly in the current iteration in World Endurance, because ARC Bratislava that run that yellow car with Oli Webb, with Miro Kinopka and his son Mate, they will be changing to an Orica chassis for Le Mans, and onwards, Ligier just a little behind the eight ball over the last couple of seasons, but it's what they had and what they brought to WEC, now they feel that they need just a little bit more in terms of competitive punch. The story of the season so far in terms of qualifying has been Kevin Escher has been in a very different class of GTE Pro. He's had pole here as well, but have they got enough tires? Okay, so car seven, same target, consuming more, slightly more. Ah, is the number eight car playing the fuel strategy game again? They might be. Now then, there is a drive-through penalty applied to the number 60 Ferrari, which is in the pits with overheating and may not come back out. And that is because it caused a multi-car shunt in free practice. In fact, the very last lap, the chequered flag lap in, uh, in free practice, two, three. In, uh... Anyway, uh, but that's now been applied, but they probably aren't going to take it. Opportunity now for the first time in race conditions to see probably the kind of differentiation between these classes we're going to see more of at Le Mans than we did at Spa or Portimao. And no problem in the traffic at the moment in the high speed sections of Monza as they get with the GTMs now, the two Toyotas. So we might see that gap close up depending on who deals better with the traffic. It's been a feature of the 2021 FI World Endurance Championship. Take a look, take a look of the number Eight, curb hopping. Oof, dear me. That's a lot of curb. That's not a hop, that's a thump. Dragon Speed's one Pablo Montoya with the stars and bars. Headlights are flashing ahead of the Risi Competizione car. So two US, normally US-based teams, Dragon Speed and Risi. Risi have spent their entire racing life in North America with ventures out. They've come to Le Mans on numerous occasions and always eager to do so again. United Autosports leading from WRT and Racing Team Netherlands. Dragon Speed and Risi battling for fourth. And then Real Team Racing, the dark blue car, you can see with Inter Europol right behind them. That is the battle for sixth and seventh. And of course, in Pro-Am, Nick de Vries leading Pro-Am for 29. That's the Racing Team Netherlands black and yellow car ahead of the second Pro-Am car, uh, Juan Pablo Montoya. There's Henrik Hedman, he's the man that makes that car what makes it happen, but also the man that makes it a pro-am car. And Henrik and Ben Hanley particularly have been uh, racing together for a number of seasons. And the job for the, the 
the pro drivers in that Pro-Am lineup, as in GTE Am, is to help their colleagues learn how to be faster race drivers, and that's exactly what they're there for. Let's catch up in the pit lane is Louise Beckett. Louise, you've had a, a chat with Glickenhaus. What are they telling you about their slower car? Yeah, so we saw that the uh, team came out ready for the car to come in for a pit stop, and then they all stood down and went back. The team have confirmed there definitely is some sort of issue with the car. They think it's electrical, but they are gambling it on how much time they're losing on the track versus bringing it in to sort it. Uh, and the, the sadness there is, look at the moment of where the 709 car, it's not about a battle between the Alpine and the Toyota at the moment, it's the 709 Glickenhaus with the Alpine. I think the thing we've got to also look at here is the Alpine strategy going forward. It, we know it's got a deficit on uh, Jim Glickenhaus, Mr. Passion there, <laughs> just uh, willing his car on. Unfortunately, I don't think uh, Richard Westbrook needs, or fortunately, doesn't need any sort of willing on because he can see the sights. But I'm interested when we get to the end of this stint where they are with their fuel strategies, because that will start to dictate the bigger picture looking forward. I love the little flowers. Oh, losing power, says uh, the Alpine team radio of Andre Negrau. Last lap was 1.6 seconds off the pace, uh, but the quickest car on the circuit that last lap was actually Richard Westbrook, um, so the Alpine dropping back. Let's just keep an eye on these uh, on these sector times coming in, because that'll give us a bit of guidance. Well, he's got purple in the final sector of the yeah. car, so I think he's got the power back somehow. <laughs> but possibly so. 38.9 was his last lap, and it was a 40.9 the previous lap before that, where we heard the radio message from. Christoph Ulrich under pressure from Paul Dallalana in the background. Dallalana sends it down the inside, and right behind is the Glickenhaus that's just squeezed in front of Sarah Bovey in the black and pink Iron Dames Ferrari, the 85 car. This is the 708 car. This yep. is Pippa Durrani trying to, well, do as little damage as he can with what is clearly not a car that's up to speed, Alan. No, not, but now the Signatec Alpine's going to get held up a little bit into the second Lesmo. That will allow Westbrook a run in the Glickenhaus through the corner to see if he can manage to catch up. This Aston Martin's also going to be on the limit of holding up the Alpine through Ascari as well. So some opportunities in traffic starting to present themselves to Westbrook. And while we're doing that, that they are the lead three cars in GTM. They're the gaps. Ben Keating has run away and hid, but has been reeled in by Francesco Castellacci with Alessio Rivera catching both. Now, don't forget that although Rivera started from the back of the grid and they might want to have put Francois Perodo in, he didn't have ruined tyres. They only lost their grid spot because of a ride height issue, so he's got quick tyres and a quick driver, and he will very likely bring the car in at the end of the stint for its first fuel as the leader in GTE Am. Richard Westbrook has closed, but it looks as though the Alpine has just got a little more in terms of straight line speed. And that's a bit of an issue here at Monza because if you can't close into the braking area, you could be having trouble. Actually, looking at the at the information that came out of free practice, the actual Glickenhaus was a little bit quicker. The issue was it wasn't getting off the final corner quite as quick, so it took all of the straight to catch that distance back. Then it came to the next one, and it was a concertina effect. So he needs to use a little bit of traffic to be Whoa, able to closing. have a close enough time to actually have an attack. Yeah, yeah. It didn't have a great run uh, out of Parabolic, but he had a much better uh, run in this sector uh, section of the track. And it's now back with the Alpine. Through Curva Grande, closed up into the El Roger, through the first of the two Lesmo corners, named after the village just on the other side of that wall. Yeah, but here you need, to, if you're the following car, you're in the wake, dirty air coming off the Alpine, and you need to just get a little bit extra front on it. And that's, I think, going to be the struggle for him without the, a bit of traffic, starting to take something away from the Alpine. So he's got to, sorry, Graham, he's got to stay in real close contact to keep this Alpine honest, to make sure the ground knows that if he has any slip up, boom, he's there. Absolutely. As quick, if not quicker, on a straight line here. It's struggling though for traction out those those uh, high speed turns, Alan. Yeah, I think it's just the front wash. It's it's not actually able to keep the line uh, close enough. And now he's at the point where he's dropped out of the the aero effect. 
be interesting how their left front is holding up. Everybody's trying to simulate Le Mans as much as possible. Look at the rear wing element on these LMP2 cars. It's, you know, as flat as a pancake. It's as little drag as you can possibly get because drag equals slowing you down in a straight line, and these guys want to be quick. Juan Pablo Montoya flashing the headlights. Following him through is the Risi car of Oli Jarvis. Jarvis looking to try and jump both these LMP, uh, both these GTE AM cars. That's the D station, Aston Martin of Tomo Fuji, closing in on the Chetelar, the blue Ferrari of Roberto Lacorte. Actually, he had a pretty decent run through there, Oli Webb, uh, Oli Jarvis. Too many Ollies in the race for me. Behind as well, we've got Louis Deval under pressure now from Alex Brundle in the Inter Europol competition car. Well, two fifth places for that car. Yeah, so that's, far. that's been the same right from the la first lap. Alex Brundle has been desperately trying to get by Louis Duval. He loves a scrap, Alex Brundle. He yeah. comes out there swinging and he'll keep on going and he just, he's like a little tiger biting at your heels all the time. And Loic will, you know, be looking in the mirrors as much as he's looking forward, but Duval's got the experience to be able to sort of look at it. Aston Martin down the inside of Lacorte into the second chicane. Yeah. So it's up a position. Fuji saw that coming, didn't he? He saw that Lacorte was having to stay tight because the P2 cars were on the outside. That cramp compromised his speed there through Curva Grande, Curva Biasone, and the Aston Martin could follow the quicker cars through because he used all the road and had better momentum. That's thinking racing driving. But that's what you get with endurance racing, mid-class endurance racing, parachuting one race in in the middle of another one, yep. and that's what you'll get is the drama that comes from it. The LMP2 cars have made their way through. There's another batch behind them to make their way through the mid, uh, midfield runners in GTM, and away we go again. And we've got more than five and a half hours more of this to come, gentlemen. As we see the third place and fourth place cars coming down, sorry, fourth and fifth in LMP2, just going to the back of LMP2. 20 seconds further back now is the second Jota of Stoffel van Dorn. So they, I don't think that starting on those tyres that were slightly damaged from the spin yesterday has given him a lot of fun and entertainment in that car. Well, that's a good question. You know, when, when you spin, you just shave rubber off the tyre they don't shave rubber off the tyre all the way around, do they? Because otherwise there's, there's no life left in it. Well, you, you start to struggle a little bit to make it round anyway. Yeah, and the problem yeah. is that when you break, then you actually tend to lock on the flatter part. And so it just multiplies itself. But here, the bigger issue is with the high speed nature, the fact this wheel is rotating so, so quickly, then you get massive vibrations, which is difficult for the driver. I don't know how bad it is for Van Dorn, but I can't imagine it's too nice. Watch the Alpine at the start here battling for second place under braking but then the number eight toyota is really deep into the first turn here at the retifilio and watch the alpine he did sneak through into second place just got around the outside of the number eight car when we went okay boy you can have that there and then through curva grande allen came right back at him yeah he certainly did that's when the boost would be kicking in because the toyota cannot boost from zero kilometers per hour as it could in the past. And so it's regulated in a slightly different way. And that was purely the hybrid boost that took him past Lapierre and back into second, or not Lapierre, sorry, but uh, Negrau and took him back into second. Yeah, we saw Lapierre watching, which is what led you astray there. On board the 91 Porsche, this is the fourth of four cars in GTE AM at the moment. On their fresh rubber, the Porsches are holding their own against the Ferrari. Chetelar from second, Roberto Lacorte on the gravel. Lo aye, aye. <laughs> Losing a spot there to the uh, Porsche of Egidio Perfetti, but Perfetti slipped down the order a little, and he's now down to six in GTM. He was second in the second corner, so or in the first corner, so it looks as though the Porsche doesn't quite have what it needs. Aston, Ben Keating leads from Francesco Castellacci and Alessio Rivera, and in fact, Castellacci is such a long name, you can't say them in the time it takes them to go by you. This is the, t the battle for the lead in GT Amos. We've had Loic Duval go around at uh, the first turn. Brundle's gone Alpine. through. You can see the yellow and green car disappearing into Biasoni, into Curva Grande. So did he lock up? Was there contact? Had Brundle had a dive? Well, we're, I'm sure we'll see. But uh, I'm about to say, by the way, GT Amos has been where the battles have been. Here is Loic Duval. Did he jump or was he pushed? Yeah, ah, touch. 
That's a touch. I'm not sure from that angle exactly. Uh, you can see in there it's left front to right rear, so I suggest that's going to be investigated, but uh, definitely a touch there. So, so easy to do, I have to say, at that point. Yeah, this is one, two, three in GTM. It's been dealing out all of the entertainment so far in this race, and that's not going to go anytime soon. Castellacci looks to the outside. Oh, ben, to the inside. Ben Keesey was lucky there. You know, we were talking as they came by a couple of laps ago about how the LMP2 cars fared in traffic, but there, it was what that second LMP2 car, the red Reese car, was going to do to the Aston. Was he going to just jump in front of him at the last moment, force Ben Keating to break harder than he wanted to, or earlier than he wanted to? It didn't happen, but Keating, with the two Ferraris hoovering up the toe behind him, and with Alex Brundle now on a mission, Keating might be in trouble in the braking area unless he can latch onto the back of the inter Europol car and get a bit of a, a slipstream from Brundle. Castellacci fortunate there. A thought about a lunge, I think, that compromised him through Parabolica. That almost gave Rivera the run. Now he's going to look around the outside coming out to the first chicane. Should be no way through there without uh, unnecessary contact. But Rivera takes yep. the opportunity as Alex Brundle's gone straight on this time. Oh, power slide through the second <laughs> element of the chicane. And now with Castellacci, uh, back on comes Brundle. Yeah. This doesn't lack for excitement, does it? No, yeah, Rivera there in the chrome Ferrari with the bit between his teeth and just mashing the throttle there, desperate for traction. Here comes Alex Brundle. This is down here this weekend. Around the outside, no way through there into the Roger. Just too tight to try and get by a pair of Ferraris that are barely longer than your own car. <laughs> yeah. Yes, he's learned Italian, hasn't he, Francois Brodo? Uh, yeah, <laughs> among the many languages he speaks, yeah, hand signal Italian is definitely one that we can all relate to. Brundle is going to split the difference between the two Ferraris, and that just holds up Alessio Rivera a little. Oh, dear. Now, Rivera will have to hope that Brundle also jumps in front to Francesco Castellacci and holds him up under braking. And in fact, Brundle's going to be on the inside. Castellacci can't take the line he wants there either. Oh, oh an 88. Second chicane. That's, uh, is this... that Andrew Harianto? Yeah, it, it is. is. Wow. That car had trouble in qualifying as well. Yeah. It was here as well. Did exactly the same as this in qualifying. Didn't go into the gravel, but it looks like it's stuck and beached into the gravel. That could be a slow zone. Yes, that should be easily rescuable. It's not as if nobody ever goes off there. So the marshals there are. Look, here comes the grab it. Yep. Um, Prepare for full course yellow at 12.28.00. We are going full course yellow at 12.28.00. So that's 45 seconds from now. That's the voice of our race director, Eduardo Freitas. That's quite late considering there's a grab handle going out a car in there and there's about 20 cars will pass through in that time period before it goes full course yellow. Looks like he's going to try and let most of the field get through before they put the, uh, the grabber out. 28 minutes in, no one's yet in a field window, but it's close-ish for LMP2. Mm. I think they'll try and extend. Well, most LMP2 cars will do a standard 25 laps here. They might squeeze out 26 or possibly even 27, but the first it will be a lap short, so it should be another seven or eight laps before they're due, and this full course yellow will be long gone by then. Yeah, but the full course yellow means that the consumption's that little bit less. The question is, where does it put them at the end? Does it actually increase a stop or reduce a stop? Now, you, you know when you're on the mo motorway and there are two trucks on the speed limiter and one of them's going slightly faster on the speed limiter than the other, that's what you had there, Racing Team Nedland and the Glickenhaus. You can't, I don't care if you are quicker on the limiter, you can't go by under full course yellow because it's still a yellow flag. Looks to be the 708 has dropped back behind the leading cars on P2. Yeah. Well, we just saw that, didn't we? Because he was uh, the racing team Nedland car was alongside. And 708, I think, is coming the way of Louise Beckett, Alan. And it looks like it's also got the trolley jacks to take it into the yeah. garage as well. I saw them there in the corner, so Louise will be ready as uh, the jumbo LMP2 car with Nick de Vries is actually on the inside, which will then block, oddly, uh, the Glickenhaus to get yeah. into the pit lane. Well, that, that might be somebody from Glickenhaus legging it down the pit lane. And could you please ask him to go the other way because we want to come into the pits while it's still yellow. This is going to be a very, very short full course yellow, though, because that car's already out. There's Jim Glickenhaus. 
Thumbs up, he says. Uh, it's not oh, quite it's a thumbs up moment, though, but uh, as you say, his enthusiasm is he's got, overwhelming. He's got both his babies running on track, you know, and we're at Monza, what, you know. He's, he's a massive, from childhood, a massive Ferrari fan. And he, he may not be the only car going in either. Is WRT going in? WRT's in. They have to do it this lap, because if they do it any other lap, then it'll be too late, because the full course yellow will have gone. Factory Porsche in. Oh. Risi is coming in as well behind Risi. That was the inter Europol car. Now, this is a moment to think about here, depending on how long this uh, full course yellow stays out. Watch again, this is that incident with Louis Duvall and Alex oh, Brundle. Oh, Alex, that's late, 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 late. Very yeah, that's late, yeah. late show, I'm afraid, and uh, that will very likely result in a penalty. We well, just have to remember that uh, when we talk about late, 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 Alex is travelling nearly 90 metres a second, mm. and so therefore if you're a couple of tenths of a second late on the brakes, then that's 18 metres, and then there's no recovery from there. As we see now, some teams splitting strategies. Porsche's split strategies, bringing in Jimmy Bruni, and uh, leaving the sister car out of Kevin Estra that's leading. LMP2 is predominantly in the 708 going into the garage as Louise predicted down in the bit lane. Yeah, absolutely right. So whatever ails the car, they're not going to let it just run around and stop out on the circuit. A chance to come in under full course yellow, you lose just a little bit less time and all of that makes a difference. But also another split strategy as well is Jota. They've brought in Stoffel van Dorn that was last overall. All the LMP2s have been in except Roberto Gonzalez, uh, who was seventh in the 38 Jota Sport car. And uh, he will, I re think, resume behind Phil Hansen, who's the other LMP2 that didn't pit, apologies. Yep. And so there's two of them didn't pit and everybody else did. Track position or fuel, which do you plump for? Well, Stoffel van Dorn, uh, staying, uh, coming in rather, but the other Jota Sport car staying out. You just saw that, so didn't change tyres on Stoffel van Dorn's car. They can't afford just to throw fresh rubber at it. Was a driver change. Lloyd Duval out at Real Team Racing, and I would assume now everybody, now that we've got past the potential chaos of the start, get your gentleman driver in now. Now, if get his time in the car started. If Jota don't get the opportunity to pit the 38, we saw there as the as Roberto Gonzalez came back, Dragon Speed and Rizzi cars coming uh, back out of the pits, having had a full service pit stop mm. and tucking in behind. Uh, almost nil not lost to them yep. in terms of track position. Uh, so if Jota don't get the 38 car around within this uh, full course yellow period, that could be a major blow to them. Clearly got a strategy in mind though, Martin. Leaders are in. Seven and eight. Now, Alpine... Alpine earn nothing by having a bit of a tank full here. That just doesn't help them. They have to do something that Toyota aren't doing, and that forces them... I mean, you know, it paints them even more into a corner because yeah, actually their disadvantage is they can't carry enough fuel. Uh, speed was their asset in Portimao. They were faster, they were able to overtake, pull away, not quite enough to compensate for the pit stop losses. But round here, it's Toyota that actually have enough speed to be able to maintain the gap to the Alpine. So right now, they don't have many cards to sort of throw onto the table. But, uh, you know, we're still five and a half hours from the end of this race. As the Totas come back off pit lane, other strategies to report in GTE AM, a couple of the cars stopping there. The 83 cars now put Francois Perodo aboard, remember they're forced to the position where they yeah. had to start Alessio Rivera. Uh, Thomas Flort now replaces Francesco Castellacci in the 54. Uh, 47 it is in and out, but Repoto Lacorte stays aboard. I think there might have been a driver change in the 777 as well. Yeah, I would Check be at all surprised, you know. It is the time to, to get your gentleman drivers in. It looks like Fujisan is still aboard the triple sign, right. but they've been in and out. 78 is back on the pit apron, so it's had a couple of electronic issues, that car. Uh, we saw in Portimao it had ECU, GCU problems, engine control and gearbox control units, and, and, and often it's electronics sets not talking to each other properly. Look how close it is with the limiters, just how accurate you have to be. <laughs> They're all coming in, though. The, uh, the yeah. cars were missing last time around. I think we're all back in. Uh, him and Louise, the United are on the way in. They're the only front-running car. And there'd be two that haven't stopped, with the exception of that 38 Jota. Stopped it further down the grid, than, the grid than they would have hoped after the disasters in qualifying. 
everybody's came in because this full course yellow is extended yeah. a lot longer than the car just being lifted out the gravel for whatever reason much longer than anticipated in that respect because it could have been clean and green about one lap ago yeah. it's, it's almost as if it's a, a, an IMSA decision to make sure that everybody gets to short fuel and then see where we go from there so you just basically reset the field everybody's got fuel okay let's go again absolutely Ben Keating in the 33 TF Sport Aston, the four horseman car that led in GTE Am, remains at the wheel. Triple Seven have been in. So it looks as though they're sort of splitting their thinking on that. Yeah, 33 stays out. Uh, we've seen the second and third place cars have both pitted. As Gidio Perfetti stayed out, as did Christoph Ulrich yep. and Sarah Bovi. All of the GT Pro cars have, st have stopped, and now the Jota 38 car stops too, so that's the whole LMP2 field has stopped, the whole hypercar uh, field has stopped, as have the GT Pros. So four, at least four AM cars have yet to stop. This is the mighty 38 Jota Sport car, Roberto Gonzalez. One of the things that may be playing to the GT AM strategy here is, remember, we said at the start of the show, because of the full, the, the full throttle nature of this, they might be just hoping for a bit of luck here, sticking with their driver uh, strategy, are they trying to burn that possibility of a splash later in the race? It, it, you know, it can all help. That, that was a, a half a stint there, pretty much, wasn't it? And so, yeah, that, that takes that potential question mark out. They're 20 minutes away from their ideal fuel, uh, fuel fueling point uh, under full green conditions. Yeah, yeah. So that should cover off what the, the, the sort of tail that ended uh, prematurely with full stints. Number seven Toyota, Mike under Conway, our race leader. Full course yellow, we are under one minute to remove full course yellow. Louise Beckett just saying in our ears, do we know how long this is going to last? It's almost like Eduardo can hear us sometimes. So number 708, Glickenhaus, just about to come back out. They have dropped a long way down the order outside the top 20. They're, they will return to the track amongst the GTE and cars. 30 seconds to remove full course yellow, under 30 seconds to remove full course yellow. I, I, I feel potentially, unless there was work going on that we didn't see elsewhere, and that does often happen, that that might just be to allow the full field, the opportunity, the full opportunity, because if it goes full course yellow and you've just nine, gone by the pits, eight, seven, you can be hung out six, to dry. Five, four, three, two, one. Full course yellow removed. Full course yellow removed. Oh, oh, oh goodness me, Henrik Hedman, not off the speed limiter. The speed limiter Still will on. not release. Ollie Jarvis has gone. Now he has. He started bashing the steering wheel. Come on, come on, come on. Got jumped, and that was really unfortunate. He's just got into the car. Now, let's just quickly, before it gets noisy, Louise Beckett, what did you hear from Clickenhaus with 708? A loom issue, and, and so, yeah, potentially something not talking to something, and that's so often really tricky to diagnose. Well, Henrik Hedman, yeah, what a disaster. Though, of course, whether it works or not, we'll find out in a moment or two. Porsche, Ferrari, Ferrari, Porsche, that's a change, Graham Goodwin, the 91 car. Uh, now behind Miguel Molina. Yeah, it's now Kevin Est, uh, Pierre, and, uh, Sandra, Pierre Guidi, Miguel Molina, and Jimmy Bruni is the running order, so you're absolutely right, that is a change. And it's a change because of the pit stop. The uh, Porsche pit stop was three seconds slower than Molina, so it was a jump in the pits was uh, where that actually came, not on circuit. Absolutely. Quicker in the pits as well in the hypercar class for a Toyota to their competition. 50 seconds each for the two Toyotas, 53 for the Alpine, 52 for the Glickenhaus. Drive-through penalties coming, though, unfortunately, for Alex Brundle for that tap with Loic Duval into uh, the first chicane. And so they're taking it right at this moment in time, very, very early on. Very fortunate here in a way that it's a short pit lane. However, on the flip side of it, you're going very fast when you're on the circuit. Yes. Uh, the, the other uh, point to note, uh, Alan's point about the pit stop uh, uh, times, uh, United Autosports picked up four seconds on WRT, 51 seconds to 55. Wow. And the Racing Team Netherlands uh, team picked up four seconds on them as well. So 51 seconds pit stops either side of the WRT squad. 56 seconds stop for Dragon Speed. That involved a driver change. None of the others did. Stoffel van Dorn, that was a one minute, uh, no, one minute stop for 
uh, for Henry Hedman and Dragon Speed. So, yeah, they lost nine seconds with the driver change, but of course that has been made. 708 is back out and running. Almost seven minutes on pit road, though. has dropped to 25th position in amongst the GTNs. What happened at real team? Esteban Garcia took over. We saw Loic Duval getting out. One minute 19 compared to a 51 second. That's a 30 second loss. Did they have damage after that impact with uh, yeah. an enormous possibility there? Car 8 is under investigation. The second place Toyota for not respecting the chicane at turn one. That is Sebastian Buemi at the, lead, at the uh, wheel of that car. Three seconds off the lead, but with uh, Andrena Grau just seven seconds back and Richard Westbrook five seconds back from that, any kind of penalty is going to have dramatic effects on the running order. Yeah, the swing is that if you do make a mistake, you have to then go through the polystyrene blocks to the right-hand side as we're looking now. Um, but it is very possible that in the situation they just jumped across the chicane. I presume that is what it's for. It's a warning only, Alan, by the look of it. Warning only. Yeah. So got away with that one. Here comes the uh, Rishi Competizione. I'm having to actually physically stop myself from adding Ferrari to the end of that. <laughs> no, you do though, yeah, don't absolutely. you? Because for 25 years, probably, I've been saying Rishi Competizione Ferrari, and it, it, it's not. It's a, it's ahead of a Ferrari. So no, that's close enough, and it's the right colour. Stalwarts of uh, endurance racing. It's been great to see them having a couple of races in uh, Europe in recent years. Giuseppe Rishi at the Spa race some, uh, some couple of years ago. First time, I think he, I think he remembered the telling me the first time he'd been racing there for something over 20 years yeah uh, but a uh, great team great to see them the number one and the 44 yeah driver change for richard mill racing team uh, uh did they i think so no did, did, no catch you on Calderon started, yeah, since she she? started yeah, since so it was a car. slower stop one minute two for them not quite sure why but that brought ollie jarvis into play they were five seconds quicker and ollie looking to go the long way around into the variante della roccia Tatiana Calderon just defending position there, getting the job done, as now we see uh, Robin Frins is caught right up in the back of Phil Hansen. This is a battle for the lead. Frins was on pole position courtesy of his teammate, but got jumped at the start by Hansen. Hansen has controlled the situation, pulled away before that full course yellow uh, section came in in the pit stops, but since then, Frins is back onto it. Now, th this is a second stint on the tyre. This will be an interesting point for the vision going forward in the race. It's kind of not yet, though, is it? Because we didn't get a full stint, we, that was a short fill, so... But are they going to do one and two thirds stints, or are they going to try and? No, now, you this do is one and two thirds because it's a green circuit, yeah. and also it's the hottest part of the day, so it's only going to get staying the same or cooler later on. The other thing is it's on a fuel full fuel tank load as well, which puts more energy into the tire. Yeah, it's reversed again. Third position, gone back to Jimmy Bruni, got put himself ahead of the 52. And of course, a Ferrari and Miguel Molina. This battle's going to go on throughout the day, without a shadow of a doubt. Real teams, Loic Duval telling Louise Beckett there wasn't an issue with the car, so it was just a slower pit stop. And there's the dive bomb down the inside, nice and clean. Didn't have to cut the chicane to complete it, so that's always a, a sign of a good pass. I've got to say, sign of a good race. It looks like Porsche's reversed the balance a little bit at the moment. They're able to hold on and keep position. We saw Jimmy Bruni going backwards in Portimao at the last round, yeah. and the Ferrari pulling away, but it looks like it's certainly, at least at this stage, it's a little bit more balanced between the red and the white cars. Portimao's got the sort of tire deck that you expect from a cheese grater, doesn't it? This track is 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 much better in that aspect it's much less abrasive on the tire and the temperatures aren't as extreme either you know high track temperatures are 46 47 ish rather than knocking on 60 like they were in portimao color dream motion in both of those cars it's going to be a close run thing between the two factory gt pro uh, squads throughout the day. And it's uh, Phil Hansen having to defend here. Remember, this uh, close battle, this includes Franz uh, closing up that four seconds lost in the pit stops. So he's, put, he's pulled back quite a deficit uh, to Phil Hansen in this. Oh. Oh. Robin, you've got to give him, the, give him the room there. That was very, very close. Gave him a millimetre. <laughs> well, listen, he's just come back from racing in New York, so he's used to giving a millimetre and not two, isn't he? Nick DeFries sitting there in the yellow car that's fourth in that particular train, third in category. 
And uh, he's sort of sitting in there, wouldn't necessarily charging forward, but in a hanging on brief. After that, there's 12 seconds back to fourth place, which is Oliver Jarvis in the DC Competizione. And De Vries is the lead Pro-Am car as well in third place. The Risi car not registered for the Pro-Am competition. Ryan Cullen and Felipe Nasser sharing with Oli Jarvis. Ryan Cullen's going to go second in that car with Felipe Nasser third. Oh. And uh, then it'll be back to Jarvis coming through. Oh, no questions asked there. No prisoners taken by Stoffel van Dorn. Down the inside of Henrik Hedman, whether Hedrick allowed him to or not. And he is on the move. I have to say, he may well need a visit to the dentist and the ophthalmologist after the end of this. If he does a stint and three quarters on flat spotted tyres from qualifying, and it was, if you haven't seen it, you can go and have a look online later. It was a massive looping spin. That really would have just ripped the tyre completely flat. Yeah, it, it was actually quite a quick spin into the barrier, so in some respects, he could have been fortunate yeah. that he got away with it with minimal damage. But uh, certainly, he's now back in the mix because they're up into fifth overall. They were struggling off the back before that full course yellow and not quick at all. But uh, they seem to have sort of came a little bit more into their own as uh, this next part of the race is progressing. Looking at the AM class battle for third, Thomas Floor has taken over from Francesco Castellaccia. Gidio Perfetti remains in the Team Project One Porsche. Looking for third place here, not going to get it right there. 47, the Chetelar Racing Ferrari of Roberto Lacorte. And triple seven, Tomo Fuji's Aston Martin, the D-Station car, under investigation for full course yellow speed. So Satoshi Hoshino has taken over triple seven from uh, Tomo Fuji, but there may be a penalty to answer for. So Gidio Perfetti now with Thomas Fleur, the, uh, the man to attack, having uh, had to seek a position to the 54 car with Francesco Castellacci. A bit more of an even-handed battle here. Another one to watch, gentlemen, in LMP2. We're observing, and I'll have things to say at the start of the race about the potential strategy from Jota with Stoffel van Dorn. After that pit stop cycle has played out, he's up in now fifth position in LMP2 from the very back of the field is now the time he's pushing. Well, let's get down to Louise Beckett. Louise, while we were watching everybody everywhere, you were watching the GTE Pro class. What was going on there? Thank you very much. Uh, so, left side only because predominantly that's the tyres front and rear that get a bit of a hiding round here because the, in reality there is only a very slow and limited number of left-handers and so therefore you get a, you get a lot of right-handers load on those ones and you can even do three stints on your right-hand side tyres. Now, when you've got a limited number of mechanics that are able to change tyres at once, that's a pit stop time gain, as opposed to changing all four as well. And a limited number of tyres as well, which means you can have fresher tyres that work and, and leave the, the lead ones on, on the other side. It's less of an issue. Phil Hansen still just staying ahead of the WRT car of Robin Friens. Nick de Vries closing a little behind. Looks like the traffic's broken a fraction better for him. Is the body work loose on the no, left rear of the No, it's just the WRT? way that it jumps around, I think, and moves about as uh, Fred <laughs> Habsburg there. Look at this. Hypercar, P2, GTE. That's a tr that is Friday night on the, on the Transentaliali Nord of uh, Milan. Yeah, that's uh, quite close. The two Toyotas are closed up a little yeah. bit. Three seconds there with the traffic. And there you can see just in front is, I think, 708 flashing the headlights. Pipo Durrani going by the high-class racing LMP2 car and the Dragon Speed car of Henrik Hedman looking in front and in both mirrors at the same time. And a Porsche 1-2 on the cards going around the outside into the Parabolica of the Ferrari of Alessandro Pierre Guidi. You, oh, I no? think that might have been the 46 car. Uh, it is the other white Porsche. Uh -huh. I think it might have been the 46 car. But uh, it did look a little like the... Did, didn't it? Well, let's take a look. Well, there is the pro Ferrari in second place, and he's still shown a second place, Alessandro Pierre Guidi, so you are absolutely right. But, uh, certainly a bit of a moment for a white Porsche around the outside of Parabolica. 
busy out there right now. About to say, by the way, uh, Pippa Durrani back up to speed. He's in traffic at the moment, but he's been putting times in in the 138 since coming back out after that uh, repair in the garage. He's now ahead of the GT Pro battle. Seven minutes, though, in the pits, fixing that electrical issue. Oli Jarvis under pressure in 44, the ARC Bratislava. Ligier from Tatiana Calderon in the Arisha Mill Racing Orica. Yeah, Oliver Webb in that as we go back to this battle. Oh. There we're Webb's in the yellow car up ahead, and we're on the Toyota, which is second. Sebastian Buemi just weaving his way through. Just not quite enough tarmac, but there is enough grass just to get three wide going down towards Parabolica. And Graham is right, that was the 46 Porsche, which has changed livery again, and so that's what we saw from the heli shot. And that's actually the car that slowed Tatiana down, and Ollie Webb just managed to weave through traffic. That did look like the high banking of the Daytona 24 hours for a moment there. Go high, go low, go high, go low. Yeah, pick a side, any side. But this traffic has actually split the GTE Pro battle because you see the Porsche just going in 92 now and then the Ferrari. That's first and second in GTE Pro. And then third and fourth are now about three or four seconds further back. And the white car of Henrik Hedman there ahead of the yellow car of Ollie Webb in the parabolic. He took a very tight inside line. It's holding Webb up. Here comes Calderon. She might get a run here. Ollie Webb going the long way around the outside. Not much wrong with the Ligier speed there in nope. low drag form, low downforce form. And Tatiana Calderon trying to come around the outside of Henrik Hedman as well. His job is to survive and lose as little speed as possible in his stints. Don't fight them now. Let them go. Concentrate on keeping your speed up, keeping your lap times up. Then let the pros do their bit. Good stuff here from Oliver, by the way, up into eighth position. Yeah. Ali Jane, but uh, we believe will be its final run with the IRC Bratislava squad. They changed to their newly acquired Orica from the Mont 24 and will continue through the season with that car. A car, by the way, that's raced once and only once, uh, a lightly used Orica. But that's not the only track time it's had, Graham, no, told it's, us. It's been an astonishing story for the car that they've obtained. Actually, a track day car for SPS Performance in Germany. It has raced just the once. It was a replacement chassis for chassis damaged by Edic Sports at uh, Spa in uh, the ELMS a couple of seasons back. So it has raced just the once. That's a, a, an LMP2 car as a track day car. Now that is a yeah. toy. That is a toy. Well, SPS, you know, they're famous for having track days at Spa and also at the Nordschleife. So, you know. One, one race driver and lots of not very careful owners. <laughs> very low mileage, very heavily used. Yeah, but uh, it, you know, for them, they feel that to be battling on the same foot with everybody else in LMP2 is going to give them a fairer indication of where they are and where and, and how their progress is being reflected. Whereas if you're the only person who's left-handed, it's very hard to judge how you are against the right-handers or whatever. So here's our battle then, United Auto Sports, WRT. And I did say two or three laps ago that Nick de Vries was closing, and now visually he is really very much in touch. And if Phil Hansen catches traffic, which he won't for a long while, there's one car in front of him, 83 Pro-Am Ferrari, and then there's at least, in fact, very nearly half a lap before there's another slower car in front of them. So. This could be a battle that develops over the next few laps. And De Vries is absolutely on the money in this racing team Nedland car. Very quick right now. He's the quickest of the trio. Yeah, last time through, 42-3 for Phil Hansen, 42-2 for Robin Wright, and 41-2 for Nick De Vries. So you're quite right, Martin. This is a developing battle. So we get this for the next few laps because these three guys know how to race these cars. Well, I think we are. They've only done five laps on fuel, haven't they? So we've got another 20 laps of this ding-dong battle for the lead. One goes by the 83 car, two go by the 83 car. That didn't break well for Nick de Vries, I'm afraid. But here is the battle that 83 is trying to stay away from. Francois Perodo is currently second, which is where that car would have started. In third place, this is the battle. Thomas Floor, Edicidio Perfetti. Via Matteo. Matteo. Not sure. Friends and family. Uh, that'll be one of our factory drivers, won't it? Which. Uh, Matteo Cairoli, that'll be, who's in uh, the Porsche. 
that that, that uh, group of fans were supporting. Absolutely. In the pits, the, the 60 Iron Lynx car, although we haven't received official confirmation, I think the chances of that car reappearing are somewhere between zero and minus one, aren't they? It's a shame, but uh, big damage, a great job to repair the car, but it didn't look right after that, did it? Uh, it's not usually fluid that's meant to be coming out like a geezer from the front of the car. Not as designed, I think it's fair to say. Yeah. No, no, and if, it's, if it has been an overheating and they've lost fluid, then the, the risk is to the engine. And uh, clearly that's going to have a limited lifespan if it's got uh, some damage. And there it is, that car itself, bodywork back on, nose back on, but uh, up in the air. So I think you're right on that uh, zero percent to minus one, unfortunately. So I'm afraid that Matteo Cressoni if it was Matteo Cressoni as opposed to Matteo Cairoli, who those friends and family were here to watch, he's not going to get to drive the car today. And that car, yeah, that's taken the radiator cap off, where it says, do not remove radiator cap if hot. So that is all the pressure in the system, super over-pressurized system. I mean, they run at high temperature, but they run at high pressure to stop it boiling. But uh, clearly the system not happy. And as a result, I'm afraid, that is not going to take any further part in the race. That's a real shame because Iron Lynx, new to WEC this year, they are such a competitive team, so ambitious, racing in the lower categories of, of the ladder in the European Le Mans Series programme. And, uh, of course, they also bring the all-female crewed Iron Dames car, not just at ELMS races, as car 60, but here is 85 as well to uh, no, Le Mans Cup. It's not 60, in, it's, 80, it's 85. Here? No. In, um, in, uh, oh, is it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we've got confused, Michelin Le Mans Cup. Confused with the numbers. Yeah, we've got uh, Michelin Le Mans Cup. We've got European Le Mans Series. We've got the WEC. They've been putting cars in. We had an uh, uh, all-female crew car actually in the uh, the big race in the Italian GT Championship uh, just a couple of weeks ago with, with Iron Dames. This is a very serious program. Yeah. Let's not forget either that uh, that collaboration that's now underway with Prima Power Team to provide that career structure for young drivers coming through single-seaters uh, into high-level single-seaters, and guess what? Now into potential for GT, and who knows what in the future. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and, and clearly a team like that have got ambitions to go right to the very top. And being uh, aligned with Ferrari is possibly not a bad thing in the forthcoming years. Ryan Mar Marinello may well continue to focus their own private attentions on Formula One and allow the cars to be raced by approved race teams. On board with Mike Conway as he just overtakes coming out of Parabolica. Now he's now got a six second gap over Sebastian Boemi. We saw Boemi getting caught up a little bit in traffic, but it was at three seconds. And over the last few laps, then it's extended out to six. I think there is a decent traffic effect on here because the problem is that even though there's not many corners, when you do catch cars in the corner, then you do tend to lose a lot of time. The point to make here is uh, when we came back out that uh, four course yellow and we saw the 708 back on track, he was ahead of the Totas, he's still ahead of the Totas. Uh, so the pace from Pepe, Dur uh, Pepe Durani has been pretty good, he's in 39 deads at the moment, being closed down by the eight, but not close. So the seven has gone by him, but uh, not as quickly. That's the 20 car blowing the, sh the, the first chicane. But, yes, uh, he's, lo he's losing three tenths of a second a lap. That's pretty decent pace to yep. the, the benchmark in hypercar. Yeah, but if you also look a little bit further back, the Negrau in the Alpine, has, uh, he's 14 seconds off the Toyota, uh, the lead car, but there's a lock up in the rear. Just that last downshift and the last gear change down locks the rear, and uh, then the best option is to do exactly that, at least time loss as well. Almost collected the Alpine there as well. We've seen some dramatic incidents at that chicane in past years. Yeah, I think that will probably been. have left him with eyes like dinner plates as he saw the Toyota Absolutely. reversing hard towards him there under braking. A particular incident involved one of the commentary team in this booth. Uh, All right, we weren't going to talk about that again. <laughs> I'm not sure how aware Al was about that incident with Stefan Ortelli some years back. Ah, yeah. Watching, watching from the pits. I wasn't, I was in the car. You were in the car. I was the one that had the dark cloud flying over my head. And here we are, it's going to be Porsche 91. That's the third place, Jimmy Bruni. As we see him. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Bite of, big bite of sausage there. 
So that's where curbs modify your line, Alan. So if you're going to take them hard like that, you need to know that any fool can take off. All the skill is in the landing. Well, that's where you need very, very good control of the suspension and damping to be able to do it. But you also need downforce. If you've got downforce in the car, they absorb bumps and curves much, much better. Yeah, Estra pulling away here from the chasing Ferrari of Alessandro Pierre Four seconds to the good now, and 5.7 seconds back to Jimmy Bruni. He's just got a bit of a gap now from Miguel Molina. Yeah, not a massive margin, 1.6 1. seconds, but it's it's just creeping away, creeping away, creeping away. There they go across the line. There's the 51 car, that's Bruni. Miguel Molina raced here last week in the European Le Mans series, as did Alessandro Pierre Guidi. Yep, great, uh, battle. They, great battle at the end yeah. of that race. Not with their regular teammates, they were in different cars. Yep, Miguel Molina races in the European Le Mans series for Iron Lynx, and Alessandro Pierre Guidi a late uh, substitute for Matt Griffin. Sadly, not with us last weekend after the timely death of his dad. And Matt, if you're listening, our thoughts to you and the whole family. Absolutely. Or welcome you back in the happier times. But uh, Pierre Greedy bringing that car home to win. Well, astonishingly, we are an hour into our race here in Monza, showing no signs of slowing down at all. The Autodromo Nazionale di Monza, the heart of Italian motorsport, a beautiful, sweltering summer's day, ready for round three of the FIA World Endurance Championship. And for the first time in a long while, fans at the racetrack. Not a lot, but everything is piccolo piccolo, a little start. Toyota dominating qualifying and led the field away. A Toyota 1-2 ahead of Alpine and two Glickenhaus cars in the hypercar class. The Alpine getting the better of the number eight Toyota into the first chicane. Everybody else minding their P's and Q's. No little aerodynamic flicks or anything else being left behind. It was a fairly uh, well controlled start. Andre de Grau just getting by Sebastian Buemi. Buemi finally up to over 130 kilometers now was able to deploy the hybrid that powered him back into second place. And that was pretty much the end of Alpine's challenge in the GT cars. Again, Porsche versus Ferrari. There was a little bit of outbreakery at the first chicane. We had Porsche Ferrari, Porsche Ferrari. Ben Keating helping the Chetelar car uh, firmly off his racing line, and allowing Egidio Perfetti to move up into second to the distress of the Chetelar garage. But that didn't last for long. Roberto Lacorte then having to battle the car that started at the back of the grid. Alessio Rivera in the 83 chrome livery there, of course, a Ferrari coming from last on the grid all the way through towards the lead of the AM class. Any contact so far of any note, Alex Brundle tagging Loic Duval into a spin as they battled in LMP2. And they had a drive through to serve. 88 brought out the full course yellow, being rescued from the gravel. Andrew Harianto looping it round at the same place that he spun in qualifying. Moving up the order from the back of the field, 38 that didn't set a time in qualifying after a huge high-speed looping spin into the wall was being rescued back up the order by Stoffel van Dorn. Battles all the way up and down in LMP2. And the 91 Porsche just at the end of the first hour after everybody had fueled and tired, getting by for third place in the GTE Pro class. Henrik Hedman gentleman driver at dragon speed in the white car not getting involved in driver battles with the pros just keeping his nose clean beginning his is likely to be double stint in the car as we get to the end of hour one so one hour in no further clue as to who's going to win in uh, lmp2 in gte pro or gte am graham goodwin in terms of the battle, this is LMP2's lead duo. United also sports red, white and blue and the red, white and black of Robin Freens for Team WRT. Just behind the black and yellow of uh, Nick de Vries, Racing Team Netherlands. He's lost a little ground in traffic because he's been closing and the frustration there must be obvious. He spent 
you know, half an hour closing in on these guys, you can lose it all just getting stuck behind the wrong car into a chicane. Yeah, plenty more punches to go in this boxing match yet. And uh, look at the inside of the WRT car there. Doesn't make that stick. So Phil Hansen has a possibility here just extending the gap. The other car to look for, by the way, is the car that's currently in fifth position, Stoffel van Dorn. It's about 35 seconds back off this battle. Effectively, in championship terms, is fourth because the 82 car is invisible for points. And Frins has been caught up here and he's uh, allowed De Vries to get onto the back of the Ferrari. Certainly was Ooh, ah. too helpful into the chicane. But I was surprised not to see Frins going through uh, prior to coming out of the second Lesmo there. But that's allowed De Vries a little bit onto the back and he's given uh, Phil Hansen a little bit of breathing space as well. He's probably got another two laps before he starts to have to think looking in these mirrors. Momentum so much more important now with the LMP2 cars in the 2021 spec and just losing that opportunity through one of the slower corners. It just takes some time, doesn't it, to gather themselves back again? Well, they also remember have a little bit less downforce, so it's not as if they can actually move line quite as easily or dive bomb someone in the braking area quite as easily as before. Team Project One, Egidio Perfetti out of the car. They didn't stop during the full course yellow. This is their first visit to the pits. The other car, uh, Sarah Bovi from Iron Lynx, has yet to stop. She is currently in third place in GTE Am. So looking here at our field after the first hour, Toyota Gazoo Racing 1 2 with their C. The uh, Alpine in third place ahead of Glickenhaus. Uh, number 709, their new car, 708, recovering from a longer pit stop down in 17th place now between the GTE Pros and the GTE uh, and the LMP2 cars. United leading LMP2 from Team WRT at Racing Team Netherlands. Porsche, Ferrari, Porsche, Ferrari in GTE Pro. Our AM leader is the 83A of course, a Ferrari from the 54 car. And it's a Ferrari 1, 2, 3 with Iron Links in third. Chetelar in fourth. The best of the rest is the 98 Aston Martin of Paul Dallalana. He's in fifth place ahead of D Station's Aston Satoshi Hoshino. And the 60 Iron Lynx car in the pit, and it will not return from there. What is going on with Dempsey Proton and with Team Project One? They are both really struggling, with the sole exception of the GDA Perfetti. The 88 car, remember, is the car that had the spin at the, the uh, second chicane. So that's lost time there. The 46, I've not seen any problem with that car at all. I'll, I'll have a quick look in a moment to see just how long it's sat on pit lane. Just pace. I th I, it may well be just pace. It's not a regular lineup, is it? Dennis Olsen has been joined by Anders Burkhardt and Axel Jeffries. So we've got uh, a gold, a silver, and a bronze there. Olsen, uh, a familiar. Uh, Porsche driving face and as Burkhardt was the man who qualified at the Norwegian he spun the car there is the GR racing Porsche that's also Mike Wainwright Ben Barker and Tom Gamble a regular entry that's struggling a little for pace as well this weekend uh, lost about 30 seconds in the pit stops to its com competitors the 46 car but that doesn't explain but the only other explanation therefore Maybe two potential explanations are one a problem with the car, the other one is just Sanders Burkhardt. It is his first race this season, yep. remember? Yep. Uh, did not get to race at Spa after that. Uh, we've got lucky now at the 46 yep. and the 86. And yes. That's a change. Yeah, so that's Mike Wainwright, I think, in the 86 car. Uh, 47 has a penalty to serve. That's Chetelar. Uh, full course yellow violation, they'll spend an extra 10 seconds stationary in the pit lane. Against what we're looking at on timing, and that's going to be costly because that will cost them at least three places. Yes. Um, so that's going to be costly for the 47. And they're third place in category at the moment as yep. well, so drop them off that podium position. However, with the speed of that car and the way it's been fighting from the start, I would suggest that it'll try and get itself back up into that uh, podium position again. Say by the way, it's a decent run at the moment. Satoshi Yoshino has not been perhaps one of the quickest bronze drivers so far this season. They're doing a decent job here in the, uh, the 777 D Station Aston Martin. So the pass we just saw, the 46 Team Project One car, that was getting himself back onto the same lap as GR Racing's Mike Wainwright. Let's get down to the Glickenhaus team. Louise is there to talk to the man whose name is above the door, James Glickenhaus, the ultimate a enthusiast. Louder, I can't hear.
Yes, um, 709 is running really well. We're very happy with the speed, um, and I think we can do very well. 708 went out on seven cylinders. One of the spark plugs was broken, so that's what it was. But if you look at his times now, it's running the same speed as the top two Toyotas. So that was just a silly thing with a broken spark plug. We fixed it, and now it's running. Yeah, we never stop. I mean, uh, on seven cylinders, the car was still pretty quick, so we were happy, and uh, we were gonna keep it out. We got a full course yellow, that helped us pull it in, and Richard's car is run like a clock. I think uh, the 708 will run like a clock, and uh, I think we'll do well. Thank you. All right, well, we heard the cogent detail there. We got the answers from Jim Glickenhouse. We'll uh, sort the pieces microphone issues out a little later, but uh, that was the issue anyway for the car. Broken spark plug, you know, these things can and do happen occasionally, unless you've got a diesel engine, in which case it's only injectors that can uh, mess you up. Another good little battle here, 44-34. The two cars with yellow, Ollie Webb ahead of Alex Brundle. Alex recovering from that drive-through penalty. They served immediately that it was notified. And I always think, Alan, that's the best way. If you know you're banged to rights like that, just get in, get it done, give yourself as much chance to recover as you possibly can. I think it depends on where you are in the race, but in principle, you've got a limited number of laps you can actually stay out anyway before you get a further penalty for ignoring the previous penalty. But in the case of Alex, then he wanted to maximize the time. As you could see, the ASR Bratislava car uh, just getting a little bit too far over the curb and a bit of a kick. That's given Alex an opportunity to run out of uh, the Ascari chicane down towards Parabolic. I think there'll be a bit of defense going on, but uh, he's certainly on a bit of a mission to try to recover because he was fighting for fourth place at the time when he had that touch. It was fourth, fifth area and uh, that's dropped them down at the moment into ninth in LMP2. Great to see, by the way, this is a World Championship race. The Slovakian team and the Polish team. Yep. We're seeing so many new nations coming in to sports car racing. We've got a Turkish team in the European Le Mans series. It's, it's great to see it. And uh, OK, not a Slovakian oh. and a Polish driver in yet, but they will be. And uh, 44 from 34. Yep the battle of the yellow cars exactly right you know they're starting with their pro drivers ollie webb and alex brunnell the hired guns these are the guys that they hire not just for their speed but also to try and help lead the team in the right direction and both these teams have come up from other forms of endurance racing in lmp3 through things like v to v and the, the eset v4 cup which actually they both still race in but also up the ladder, the ACO ladder, from Michelin Le Mans Cup, European Le Mans Series here to World Endurance. And that's, uh, that's you know, exactly what the ACO have hoped to create, is that root of ambition. That's here from Inter Europol and Alex Brundle. Brilliant job, Alex, brilliant job. Keep pushing, keep pushing. Uh, we got six laps, six, seven laps, we go, seven laps. Perhaps to the end of the stint for Alex Brundle, a little bit of motivation from the team. And uh, I think in reality, in the actual end of it, Ollie Webb kind of realised the game was up and he was going to either be overtaken or just try to lose as minimum time as possible. But now Tatiana Calderon's locked onto the battle of that Ligier. And the Orica looks better at the end of the stints than the Ligier. Ligier's struggling with low speed grip and traction you saw coming out of the previous chicanes. There was a bit of oversteer and that allowed Brundle to get a real run in into the second chicane. And don't forget, Ollie Webb jumped Tatiana when she got bought in traffic a few laps ago so she's going right that's my place you've still got some beam i'm having that back so she's all over the back of him at the moment looking for a way to jump through we said this is like this is like the last race we'll see certainly with this ligier yeah uh, for ligier and the wec one of the things counting against the ligier in the last couple of seasons has been this dominance in terms of the numbers the oricas and that means when you get to things like tyre development, which is utterly critical, of course, what you've now got are tyres that are more suitable for the Orica yeah. over the longest stints than perhaps the off the Ligier. Yeah, Ligier is uh, 
certainly struggling a little bit at the moment. Tatiana is there, but Alex Brundle made a bit of a mistake into the chicane, so it's allowed the three of them to sort of join up again. But I think uh, the quickest card off that trio is Brundle, and I expect him to start to ease away again. Well, we're starting to get towards the end of the tyre life. We, we are now at 50 laps. Uh, no, we're not. We're at how many laps for the lead? 41. Yeah, okay, 41. So we've got... Uh, when did we have full course yellow for these? How many laps have they done on their second? They're about halfway through their second stint, aren't they? Because they've got sort of three quarters of a stint. So they're getting towards the end of what they're expecting the tyres to do. Here comes Tatiana Calderon again. Yeah, but Calderon is looking everywhere. Webb just kind of hanging on to uh, a slightly rivy ARC Bratislava Ligier at the moment. Uh, further up the road on LMP2, the um, 38 Jota car, 28 Jota car in the hands of Stoffel van Dorn. He's putting in faster lap times than he has so far in the race. He's beginning to close that gap down for the Rizzi Competizione car. 13 seconds now as still Tatiana Calderon and Oli Webb. And yeah. Calderon not getting away from this fight. No. And Tatiana was very nearly in the Alex Brundle on Real Team Racing zone there. She just got it stopped, kept her nose out of the way as the 44 car turned across into the uh, first apex of the uh, Retifino. Oh, now she sent it at the Roger. And Ollie Webb's going, I've got the line. Good stuff from both drivers, really calm from Tatiana Calderon. She's inside into Lesmo 1. She makes the pass completed. She started and riffing out wide in Lesmo 2. Here comes Ollie Webb. This is Back great down stuff. the inside. Yeah. Great stuff. So Ollie Webb has got some front end on that car because he managed to come back tighter underneath Tatiana, who should have maybe had the momentum, but perhaps just had to breathe out of the throttle to keep it out of the gravel trap. And Ollie Webb back in front. Philippe Signor in the Signatech Alpine squad, and uh, they, of course, Signatech look after this number one Richard Mille racing team uh, car. Looks like we're flush, ready to for a drive board. change, absolutely. While watching all of this, you're not missing close battles at the front of the LMP2 uh, ba uh, battle because Phil Hansen is pulling away again from the Team WRT car and the Racing Team Dublin car behind. Those gaps are coming out again after we saw them nose to tail, what, 10 minutes ago? Uh, it looks to be at this phase of the extent, Phil Hansen's got a better car underneath him. Great stuff from this battle between the 44 Ligier of Oli Webb and Tatiana Calderon. And just up ahead, we've got Alex Brundle, who now his team manager has got to go and see the race director about some something or other. Not sure what that is, but it'll be, uh, I'm sure, a very frank and clear discussion. <laughs> but at the same time, all the LMP2 cars are about five laps from the end of their stints, and so they'll be coming up to their second pit stop. Remember, the first one was slightly earlier than expected due to that full course yellow. The second one's going to be a full stint. Now, possibly the reason that Alex Brundle's team manager has been sent to the race director is that they are now showing the 34 car a black and orange flag, and that means we think there's something, or we know there's something wrong with your car that you may not want to uh, You've got continue a pit. with. You've got to pit. Yeah, you are forced to pit. Now, it could be, so it can be something like a illuminated door panel not being illuminated or something. It could be your bodywork's flapping and, you know, you're dragging a bumper at the back. Uh, you're going to try to push it as long as possible because they're coming into their pit stop window. So they'll try and extend it to the maximum allowed time due to the regulations and then pit on that point because it'll allow them the biggest flexibility for strategy later on. Well, normally, if you have, are applied a penalty, serve a drive through, you, have, you can cross the line no more than three times after it's been notified. Uh, black and yellow flag, I would assume, a black and orange flag, but I would assume, will be the same. But dive into the specific championship regs. And Ollie Webb just creeping away from Tatiana Calderon. As Sophia Flersch high fives the team, getting ready to get in the car. And as we pointed out, just the two of them racing here, and actually perhaps pretty glad that it's not the temperatures of Portimao. It is, the sky is clearing a little, but there is still a decent amount of cloud cover. It's still gonna be pretty hot and physical, three hours each in the car. 
92 Porsche leading in GT Pro from the 51 AF Corsa Ferrari. Whoa, 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 whoa. shoot the chicane. Just getting it wrong, Jimmy Bruni finding the back, locking up there. That might have been a late dive in traffic. What comes through the shot next? No, that was just driver error. So we're starting to see LMP2 changes. WRT are in, Robin Freens is out of the car, 30 Habsburg. Uh, he's easy to spot because all the other racing drivers essentially just come up sort of barely halfway to his chest. So he's easy to spot in the pit lane. Reese are in, Ollie Jarvis. Well, ditto with him pretty much likewise. He'll probably be getting out of the car. Maybe your inset is the WRT team. We have full set of tires for them. And high class have already pitted and left Jan Magnussen, who of course will share a car for high class with his son Kevin, another of the Peugeot drivers for next season. They will be sharing that car at Le Mans. So Jan Magnussen at the wheel of the high class car. Yeah, two really good looking driver squads for high class at Le Mans this year with Kevin and Jan uh, showing with Anders Fjord back and uh, confirmation this week that the 20 car, this car, will have Dennis Anderson aboard. Uh, with Marco Sorensen um, forming part of that crew, and I've immediately again forgotten who the other driver was. Well, what we know is it's not Nicky Team. Yes, we're not. expecting it to be the Aston Martin Dane Chain duo, but Nicky Team got a late call up to join that car actually, the 98 AMR Aston, because our, our Gusto Farfus will not be available for the Le Mans 24 hours for the team. I'm sure he's very disappointed about that, but the family demands back home. Uh, Miro Kanopka, I believe, is getting into the ARC Bratislava car. And Sofia Flush, very different. Uh, and it's almost actually 30 Habsburg Charles Milesi height difference between Sofia here and Tatiana Calderon. So, a very, very different seat insert required. Sofia actually really needs to stop growing. She's definitely grown out of being uh, single-seater height. In comes the real team car. That means the number one has to be oh. pushed back. Pushed back, that's about four or five seconds pit stop time loss there. But actually you have to pull to... back or push back on the, on the pit apron. Here is actually a very narrow uh, distance between each car in the pit lane. And quite often you do get it. Dragon Speed in, Juan Pablo Montoya will be out the car. Uh, sorry, uh, Henrik Hedman out the car, Juan Pablo started this one. I wonder, Willie, I would leave him in now. He's done a stint and put him in on fresh tyres. I think you could get all of his driving hours out of the way and then let the other guys carry on later on. He's in the rhythm. We will see. Ferdy Habsburg has taken over in WRT. Let's hear from Andre Negrau and the Alpine team. Yep, you go to six and six. And box, box in is up for driver change. Driver. Okay, there you go. Driver change coming up for Alpine. And they are making their second stop. Lap 48 6. Uh, Ricky Taylor, by the way. Ah, yes, the indeed he was. A Sorry, double, Ricky. A double proper champion uh, lineup there with Ricky yeah. Taylor. He's a champion, of course. and. Marcus Sorensen, reigning world champion uh, in the GT Drivers' Championship. First of our hypercars to stop is the Alpine. That's because both the Toyotas and the Glickenhaus, built to hypercar regulations, have bigger fuel tanks. Oh, oh and Chetelar in the barriers, and that's where their race ends, I think. That's a lot of damage front and rear for Roberto Lacorte, must be coming towards the end of his stint. And that is on the exit of Lesmo 2. That's exactly where. Uh, Stoffel van Dorn planted the Jota car in LMP qualifying. Well, I presume he's dropped his left rear wheel coming out of the corner onto the gravel, and that's what's looped him around. Didn't even get to the gravel, just on the power. Touched uh, the, Porsche touched him. The Porsche touched him. Yes, he did. Yeah, you're right. On the right front. He'd already Which lost Porsche it, was that? That was one of the two factory cars, yep. wasn't it? Um, because that will be something that will be investigated, I'm sure, if there was a touch. I think he'd already lost it, uh, but it certainly was contact. You could see the front right corner of the Porsche. There we go. There, it's 91. 91 car. That's the car that's in third place. Jimmy Bruni, the local hero. Let's take a look again. He lost it there. Cause then, or effect? No, no, no he'd, he'd lost, lost it. It, it yeah. was just the final tap. I don't think there's anything Jimmy could have done there. No. 
He was lucky to get away with so little contact. He was so close behind on board. Don, yeah. <sighs> The guy is throttled, he just lost the car, hasn't he? Copy, copy. It's going to be definitely aero loss there for the 91. And it's very loss. sensitive around about that front aero, so I think they'll be trying to understand now uh, what they can do at the pit stop, because this, I would assume, will go full course yellow at stroke least. safety car. At least. I think full course yellow, again, Exit at Lesmos, not a hard place to predict that cars are going to be requiring a tow at some stage. But time lost on track and time lost in the pits, fitting a new front end. And that to me hasn't damaged the floor. It didn't look like no. it would have, but who ever knows, you know, things happen in accidents. So actually watching the Porsche team practicing the uh, front bodywork yep. changes. Modular Leeds. stuff there, that's Richard Leeds, absolutely. Suited and boosted, well, you know, it's, it, we're kind oh. of, oh, well, Chetela backing out Roberto Lacourt. If he hasn't damaged the steering and the suspension, it might be a relatively quick fix. We will see in a moment or two when it starts tracking down the straight, if it is tracking straight down the straight. Double waved yellows at turn seven. Eduardo Freitas, our race director, might get away without having to go full course yellow on this. If he gives the Chetelar car another moment or two. Alan, we hear in, in uh, Formula E all the time, the race director can talk direct, talk directly to the driver. Can you restart? We can't do that yet here. He can message them, but they can't message back. But Yeah, but you can through the team, and the team will be the link between yeah. the race director and also with the car itself. And so that conversations will be going on to see whether they can get that Ferrari back. And also the other thing is there's a potential risk of it dropping bits and pieces on its way back as well, because it's still a good three kilometers from the pit lane entry. Double yellow's removed, so he's got that car uh, running. This is the battle for second in uh, GTM. It's the class that's, that's been entertaining from the start. It's Paul De Lallana, uh, on a bit of a tear here. He's on the back of Ben Keating, who'd driven away from this field at the start of the race, Martin. And they are going to catch Roberto Lacourt. He is just leaving Ascari, and they're heading down there, so they may just catch him at the Parabolica. Toyota, meanwhile, in the pit lane. Number eight is in first. That's very interesting, because number seven has pace, and the eight has stopped first on fuel, and that's exactly the opposite of what we saw in Portimao, where number eight went into major fuel-saving mode. So Glickenhaus, uh, Richard Westbrook in as well, on the same lap as the Toyota, so that gives us an indication of how well they're both faring in terms of economy. Second, third and fourth, by the way, for the Aston Martins in GTM, because fourth in the order, and way further back, is the 777 car. 47 is on pit lane, we're hearing from Luis. Yeah, you just saw it there flash across the inset picture in front of the 709 Glickenhaus. This is their car that has not had a delay yet and not being released in front of fast-moving traffic. That's the 7 Toyota coming in. It's, come on, come on, baby, come on, fire. Oh, you little rotter. Meanwhile, in the main picture, Ben Keating hanging on to second from Paul Dallalana. Ben Keating so excited to claim pole position here last uh, afternoon, yesterday evening. And what a big lap it was from the Aston Martin driver in the Four Horsemen car. Yeah, just seeing that Glickenhaus, though, as we see the battle here in, LM in GT, Toyota going quite Trouble. slowly as well. Oh, that's the seven car just... That's eight. eight. That's the eight car. That's uh, Brendan, uh, Brendan, Brendan Hartley, Hartley on his way change. out. So driver change, no driver change in the seven car. Hold on. Yeah, he's active on the steering wheel. That's it. It's something from the pit stop doing 108, 107, 108 kilometres per hour. That's too constant. Yeah, it's on a limiter, isn't it? or stuck in gear, through goes the Alpine. Alpine up to second, number seven Toyota in, in the pits. I did. I'm there, and the car's not driving, right, put it back on. Selfie, selfie. No power. The car has stopped driving. Ooh, uh, that, well that's, well, it sounds like a carburetor diaphragm to me, but then, you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's a carburetor <laughs> diaphragm on this particular beast, but. Uh, looking at his problem there for the eight, at the same time, the Glickenhaus we saw going slowly out the pits, which I suspect could be heat soak after a pit stop. Yep. And then that stumps it. Here we go back to the Toyota, though. Fuel pump, fuel pump. 
Fuel pump, if they've gone too low and come into the pits, it wouldn't pick up, and, and therefore they'd have to effectively, like a kind of primer effectively, but they were one lap less than Mike Conway, their sister car, and this has given everything to that car, as now it's leading easily, and also for the championship, because remember, this car, the eight, has won both the races uh, so far, all the races so far, but at the flip side of it, you've got uh, the situation where the other car has actually had the pole positions. Absolutely, and the Glicken House goes through to third position now. And uh, still not managed to get the car back to the pits. Crawling back, this must seem like an interminable lap, but, Brendan, uh, Brendan Hartley. But salvation, because if it had stopped out on track, oh, yes. that would be a massive points deficit. Here, they've got four other cars in their class, so if they finish, the worst they can be is fifth. Chances are they've got so much pace that even if it's, uh, you know, a few minutes in the pits now and loses a couple of laps, they may well yet finish on the podium. So the points gain for their sister car is not so enormous. But Franck Mayer now in 7.09 in a podium spot. And no surprise to see number eight going into the garage, Graham. Another component tested on the Glicken House, and that's the position lights. They all work. It's third position for the number 709 car, whilst frantic activity in the Toyota Gazoo racing team. Not the quicker car, but you got, we said at the start of the race, didn't we? He, he looked, well, frustration on the face of Brendan Hartley. You've got to be perfect. You've got to be fault free. You cannot afford to put the car in the garage. And the Toyota has fallen down the field into the LMP2 field now. So up in the fourth position has come Team WRT ahead of Felipe Albuquerque. So it's been a driver change for United Autosports. That's what's made the difference. A minute and 18 seconds in the pits for WRT. Felipe Albuquerque is now seven seconds back. We'll have a listen to what's going on with the number eight. No, we're not going to hear that. This is the Richard Beale racing car. I think about to have a lap put on it by the 28. No, this is actually the Risi Competizione. Apologies, I've got misidentified yeah. now. So this is the battle, for, we, we talked about this a while ago, weren't we? It's now Ryan Cullen aboard the Risi car. Sean Galeo has taken over the Jota car. This is for position, and this is for, th uh, for fourth position, isn't it? And Galeo's just done it round the outside. A little bit hairy at the end when he started to get into the apex, but uh, he's managed to get themselves up in uh, to fourth position and so now it's Jota up into fourth and Da Costa is in the other Jota car that started last as we are now seeing well we hear it starting up running through the gears it's now dropped behind the second Lickenhouse that's uh, <laughs> exactly what Jim wanted to see yeah well listen everybody knows that the only way you're going to be to Toyota here is if it has a problem and that goes for the other Toyota as well. Completely correct. You know, and, and the, the crew of number eight there, they're the points leaders. As you say, they've won both races by smart racing, by fast lap times, but by good fuel economy. And they know their only chance to beat the number seven car is to have a perfect race. And they know now it's not going to be a perfect race. However, battle for the lead. Ferrari coming back to Porsche now. Luis said they had left sides only, so both cars on. Tires of the same vintage. But looks like the Ferrari has either made better use of them or better use of traffic and caught the 92 Porsche. Kevin Estra still trying to fight, fend off Alessandro Pierre Guidi. Two of the quickest guys in this field in GT cars, two of the quickest guys in the world in GT cars. Estra in a rich vein of form and Alessandro Pierre Guidi keen to show that he's on just as much form. Are you going to come home with consecutive race winning performances on consecutive race weekends in two different Ferraris at this fabulous Monza track. That's just possible. The United car closes up behind this pair. Blue flags shown to the GT cars. It's not going to make life easy for Felipe Albuquerque, who's going to be concentrating. He threads the needle and tries to get back on terms with the Team WRT car. Louise 
means that uh, the Toyota number eight is coming back onto pit lane. Ferrari fans here, it's great to have some fans back. In the stands only for the moment, away goes the number eight. And how long was that on pit road? Well, right until he clears the blend line. Yeah, it wasn't a long start, but it doesn't have to be sometimes to torpedo you below the waterline now. Four and a half minutes. They know that their teammates have to have an absolute nightmare not to take a big points advantage away. For Toyota now down to 21st place, just ahead of the AM class, they're going to have to do what the 708 Glickenhaus did, which is just basically grind it out and see who else has issues. Three laps as the Kevin Estra just dips the rear wheel of the Porsche to the gravel. That's given Alessandro Pierre Guidi another bit of a nibble here. Yeah, there are several things, I'm sure, apart from the proximity of the car in front, that really just sort of get a driver's blood going. The smell of overheating, the smell of transmission fuel fluid, you know, which is so clear, or the rattle of gravel as he makes a mistake under pressure. Here in Toyota, no mechanical work required. It was a power cycle and changed the settings. That was it. So Mod electro electronics. Modern race cars, is it in the barrier? No. Has it still got four wheels? Correct. Are there flames? No. Electronics. Yeah. Yep. WC chief strategist, Martin Haven here. Okay. It, it, <laughs> Available for any hypercar program. Yeah. <laughs> Does it move? Yes. Should it? No. Gaffer tape. Yeah. Does it move? No. Should it? Yes. WD-40. You know, it's, they're the basic um, rules of engineering life, aren't they? I've just checked outside the booth. There is not an orderly queue of factory, <laughs> uh, factory team principals looking no, for it's a disorderly. It's a, it's a mob. They're, they're beating each other up to try and get me to run their programmes for so them. So where, where are we now whilst we watch from on board Alessandro Pierre Guidi looking at the rear end of the uh, the Porsche? It is Toyota Kazoo Racing's number seven leading. Uh, just over an hour and a half gone of this six-hour race from the 36 Alpine and then the 7 oh. Oh, no. oh. Porsche's gone <laughs> deep into there. Sorry to interrupt you there, Graham, but the Porsche went really deep into it. That's allowed a little bit of a run. I'm not sure he's going to be able to get it done because I, I suspect that Estra is just going to go to the left and make sure the uh, Ferrari has to go the long way around. Two GT stories. Uh, in the pits, Jimmy Bruni back out from the pits, 47. I know this, not because I've seen him on track, because he's been warned about respecting blue flags. So that means he's not in the pit lane. So Chetela have turned that car around yep. and got it back out. And I have, by the way, while it while I was quiet, been doing some engineering. I've now turned the telly back on and found out why we lost all our timing screens. And uh, we now have both our timing screens back. So the Chetela, oh, I've come to the wrong page. So <laughs> yeah, I've, I've undone all that, haven't I? Yeah. Uh, the Chetela car is last running car. So he's still ahead of the number 60. Fault no. finding the TVs is another bid for that, uh, that team job. But uh, Rooney, there you see the stuff. Porsche on the uh, bottom left hand side. They're not looking to change the nose of that car. That was a damage after the Celeste LR car spun and just got tagged into second Lesmo. But uh, it certainly isn't going to be a performance enhancement tool, the damage on the, on the nose of the car. Ferrari, though, is right behind Puer Guidi, right behind Destra. Three minutes, by the way, on the pit lane for the Chetela car. That's what it took to repair that damage. Uh, they are now eight laps down on the overall leaders. I think something like three laps down on the class leaders. In come both the GT Pro leading cars. OK, so will we see driver changes? This is where what might have been a plan suddenly goes to becoming a different plan. Will you stick with plan A? Do you go for plan B? Do you consider sticking to your strategy or try and go for track position? And in as well, I think Christoph Ulrich is probably getting out of the 61 car. He's done a stint and a half. He's done an hour and 40 minutes, nearly. An hour and 35 minutes, so that's a very decent... That's half his minimum drive time requirement. What's the, what's the AM drive time requirement in a six-hour race? It's not 90 minutes, Checking. is it? It's, uh, I think he might not be far off that. However... AMs in a, in a six-hour race are one hour 45. But Ooh. For... And we're one hour 37 done, so he will need to do another 20 minutes, so he'll need to do another stint later in the race. Neil Yanni in for the Porsche. Remember the different positions on the pit lane as the Porsche goes past. Yep, both Ferraris in. Remember for the 61 car, their day here is about this race, but it's also about practice. They, it's an interesting one, isn't it? They're the first reserve car for the Le Mans 24 hours. Simon Mann 
with Christoph Ulrich. Now, it wasn't Ulrich in for the whole thing, though. Simon Mann was in that car when they came in just now, the 61. He, there was a driver change. There was a driver change. Um, so Tony Verlander still to come in the 61 car. Yeah, with the two pit stops so far, the Ferrari cumulatively is four seconds behind the Porsche. The Porsche is just sneaking a little bit out in the pits. So Simon Mann has just got in. Christoph Ulrich uh, no, started. I'm pretty certain they changed at the, at the first pit stop. I looked at the timing screen when the car came in. It said Christoph Ulrich still. Right. Um, there'd been something iffy there, in which case with the driver selector, because I thought it was Ulrich in the car, checked, and well, we'll see. Yeah. We'll have a look and see what, uh, what our system tells us. Seven car, still one light on the side of the Toyota, the untroubled Toyota hypercar at the moment. And goes through. What will be the end of the lap 56 now? 26 seconds to the good from the Alpine. It's been the most convincing performance so far for the Toyota Hypercar against the Alpine on pure speed. 42 seconds, by the way, between the Alpine and the first of the Glickenhaus. The second Glickenhaus, by the way, is just about to get back into the overall top 10. 708 car, that's... Uh, Spark problem we were hearing from Louise with Jim Blickenhouse a little while ago. 11th position, going to fight back. Still a brake car, it's now cleared the GTE Pro field, is up to 17th. A battle on the way there for Tota. The points battle in Hypercar. Points against the 708 will matter. 36, Alpine. Hoping maybe more than one issue for the Toyota this afternoon. Don't appear to have the legs on the Toyotas this uh, in this race. The 709. And Nick here, straight line speed relative to cornering performance. And that's one thing with uh, the Toyota. It struggled a little bit in the high speed, longer corners of Portimao. And there's significantly more of them. Uh, than there are here. Big lock up in the background as we saw somebody uh, blowing the chicane there at uh, the first corner. I don't know who it was, but somebody's definitely lost a little bit of time, got a bit of a flat spot. Could it, it's number eight Toyota's in trouble. Number eight Toyota's just been passed by a GTE AM car. Yeah, and right. this is on board with the number eight. Brendan Hartley is in trouble again, and he may well have blown the chicane because he was control alt deleting furiously. Not good news for really this car. Really not good news for Toyota. His last lap time was a 39.8, so it was back up to speed. Here we go on board. Yep. That's even much more than I thought when I mentioned it before. Holy moly, that was nearly enormously yeah. bad news for Brendan That's Harley. Throttle sort of brake issues as now he comes back towards the pits. Rob Loipens on the radio. you're looking at the pictures of the number eight Toyota this is not what we want to see what is going on uh, good question Louisa we're not sure ourselves at the moment what has happened uh, but uh, apparently there is some malfunction on the steering wheel uh, and that's uh, has caused the problems with uh, Brendan in his outlap and then uh, yeah, now he's pushing a bit maybe a bit too hard uh, to see that but uh, it seems that it's going so I don't hear him at the moment I cannot tell you exactly what's going on yeah, but uh, he's driving. So let's see, and uh, hopefully we continue and uh, try to come back up onto the grid. OK, we'll come back to you, thank you. OK, thank you. I'm not 100% sure that was just driver error coming down into the chicane there. There's a lot of electronic systems, brake balance systems that automatically shift the balance from the front to the rear while the hybrid system is recuperating. And that can have a tremendous effect on uh, the braking stability and efficiency. But let's go and let, hear from Brendan Hartley now. Yeah, nothing on the brakes, I think. Or front drive train. Okay. And the, and the it thing looked, here is... Sorry, it looked very visually as if it shifted everything to yeah, the rear, because yeah. the rear was dancing around behind them before he locked the front. And it can do that, because unlike your road car, predominantly, your road car, you push a pedal, and it's a fluid system, 
you pump fluid. Here, it's brake by wire. Computers can malfunction in that system and get it all wrong for you. Yeah, but uh, there's road cars that now have a lot of brake by wire no, on I them know. as well. I, but I, I in principle, you're exactly right. And that's where I was a little bit surprised with the, with, uh, the sort of comment suggestion because looking at it on board that was a bit too dramatic just yeah. for a driver yeah. lockup he's uh, yeah i'm gonna lock up one of these cars into the chicane like that he's a bit too experienced for that to be in driver error well to be honest on the onboard camera I just looked at the width of his eyes when he was looking at the back of that aston martin and that suggested that it was a bit closer than he expected or wanted but the car's going back in that really takes them out of any game unless the others oh. in the category of a technical problem look at the debris what has been machined off there that is that is not an electronics issue the electronics don't produce swarf that has the, the either the bell the actual disc itself has come loose or the caliper is loose something is machined lots and lots of metal and that's why the damn thing didn't stop it was busy falling apart Mathieu Vassivier for Alpine in second place trying to come by the uh, green and yellow into Europol competition car of Renga van der Zander. Graham, that's not going to be, we're just to hit the electronics or replace no. a, a box, is it? That was pretty serious drama, wasn't it? Fastest yeah. car on the track at the moment is the Glickenhaus in third place. In the 38s, compared to the 39s, the cars ahead. Wheel won't come off. This is Toyota. You saw it there, Martin, as it came in. And now the nose is off and they're working look, a lot look, on look that. Look at the wheel. Yeah. Oh, that's a lot of stuff. Now, the good news for the number seven car is, if it's not electronics, it's unlikely that it's going to happen to them as well. That's certainly not by design. No. Unlike, it's not impossible they'll both have new brake components or whatever fitted for the race from the same batch, but there is... Yeah, machined metal everywhere, and cars don't do that by habit. So, Pachito Lopez leaves from Mathieu Vazivier, and Franck Mayer lies in third for Glickenhaus. Top three in hypercar, three different manufacturers. And Graham, on pace, that is the first time we've had that this season. Uh, absolutely, and, you know, we again, we said at the top of the show, you have to be perfect here. You know, these, these cars are only going to get better as things come through. Yep. So at the moment, large-ish gaps, but what we've got are three healthy cars at the top of Tubbing and Scoring. We've got another car that's way down up to ninth now for the second Glickenhaus on this fight back from now Gustavo Menezes above, above the 708, but that yep. car is healthy in the 38s. And one, at the moment, very unhealthy Toyota indeed. That's not something we've been able to say for quite some time. <laughs> I know, I know. Racing Team Netherlands, Fritz van Aert, the gentleman driver in that car, the boss of Jumbo Supermarkets. Of course, you've seen his colours, not just here, but racing in Tour de France and all the big grand tours as well. And he is out in the car at the moment. Paul Le Chatin is uh, suiting up, the late replacement for Guy de Van der Gaard. Very fast Frenchman indeed. Is uh, by the look of things about to getting aboard the 29 racing team it's Netherlands. Quite car. premature, isn't it? I think we're a long way from their next it, it, scheduled. You might stops. have been a bit cold at the garage. Unlike you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, their aircon probably isn't what ours is. But uh, Team WRT leading Ferdy Habsburg is our leader in LMP2 ahead of Philippe Albuquerque and Sean Galeo. We saw him battling in third with Fritz van Aert. Antonio Felix de Costa, we didn't know, I think, took over 38, the Jota Sport car. And here's our lead battle in GTE Pro, the 92 Porsche, Neil Gianni. Let's hear from him. Okay, Neil, that's a good start to the stint. Like we said before, we've just got to look after these tyres. The right side from Kevin has quite a lot of wear, and we've got to try and double them. You're doing a good job. All good. Right side from Kevin has a lot of wear. Now, that's the right side that wrong from the start, as you see the uh, Am Porsche just uh, missing the chicane there. So that means that right side, if they're going to double them, will do four stints, or three and a half stints, because of the, of course, yellow at the beginning. And uh, the left sides will be fresh. Neil Yanni 
brought this up in uh, when I was speaking to him after Portimao because he said that it was one of the things that he learned that actually the car is significantly better balanced and more feedback than he ever expected. However, the management of the tyre was something you really had to get your, your head around, trying to understand how far you can push it, but also when you're pushing it a little bit too much because the recovery point of it is very, very difficult. But right now you've got Yanni, but Calado is catching in on behind. Is he going to race him, or is he going to play the long game? Well, I think, Alan, so much of this GTE class is things like tyre management, because drivers of this calibre actually finding the pace in the car, that's that's no problem for them whatsoever. It's maintaining it. That's the... All right, that was the Egidio Perfetti Am class car that was sort of moving around there in the Lesbo, so Egidio's not in it, but it's, it's, it's that car, the Mentos car. But uh, even so... Uh, Calado just losing a little bit of ground there to the 92 Porsche. Yeah, it's Ricardo Perra in that 56 car. We saw at the moment at the first chicane, another moment across the chicane as we got... Galeel and Van Aert indeed. in the background, Sean Galeel. Uh, in fact, it wasn't, that was Antonio Felix da Costa. Galeel's already gone by Fritz Van Aert. That was Antonio Felix da Costa in the second Jota car going by Fritz Van Aert for what is now fourth. And chasing down, chasing down the team car 28, which is five yep. seconds further up the road. It's really close because Salva Menez is involved there, and that is a position as well ahead yep. of uh, Fritz went ahead. So Menez is up to eighth position and now closing in rapidly on De Costa for seventh. Um, Perra, by the way, second place in, uh, in GTE AM with that instant the first chicane. Five seconds going to be added to the next pit stop for the ARC Bratislava car for a incident at the second chicane for Miro Konopka, who now board the Peugeot. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's called outside of the circuit, my boy. Yeah, that'll be uh, potentially track a warning limits. for track limits. Yes, this is one of the four corners they're examining. And there is grip out there. It's less than ideal, but... Right, slightly than, more ideal than hitting a Porsche that's drifted out wide on you. Yeah, but it was always going to drift out wide. Yep. That's the, the tricky area here that Da Costa, I think, will maybe have a little bit of a word in his ear for that one because there was no question the Porsche had the right to move out to the outside of it. Yep. Antonio was committed and he knew there was runoff area to spare, kept his foot in, he knew he hadn't got previous there, so he won't get a penalty for it. It'll be Looking a, at the other penalties that have just came in for Konopka for um, splitting the chicane and things like that, I, yeah. I would, I'll wait and see what uh, you, the race director. Comes you up. almost always get a final warning from warning from race control before you get a penalty. Eight more work going on on that left front corner. That's a long job, isn't it? There. Yeah. LMP2, by the way, Felipe Albuquerque has been just edging back into that lead from the WRT car, but Freddie Habsburg did a great job. In front of off. It's under 11 and a, seconds. And car's both. good, though. It's been really strong. They were struggling, I thought, in free practice three. Rear of the car didn't look very stable, Graham. But then come qualifying, boom, unless he stuck it on pole. And it was a blooming good lap. And they've been quick right from the beginning. Even though they dropped to second place at the start, but when Hansen jumped them, they were right on it with Robin Frintz all the way through. Felipe Albuquerque in second and in third place in LMP2, the Jota Sport driver, Sean Galel, both on best laps of the race so far for themselves. Indeed, it's uh, what they're looking to do here is put the WRT cards back on the table in this championship. It's not been the start of this season they would want, but, uh, well, the big points are still to come. Yep. But United and Jota taking this ball so far. They're currently sitting... Second, second third, third and, and fourth. And piling the pressure on, they're both going quicker. Both the second place United and the third place Jota Sport car going quicker than Ferdy Habsburg on that last lap. I think off. they've changed the corner if I look at it. Yeah. It looks like they've taken all the suspension, the whole thing off. This is the eight. Yeah, this was uh, This is when he pulled off to the side. This is out. He's already had the issue yeah. at the first chicane. This was him getting out the way of the second one. Yeah, you can, yeah. When you go for the oh. middle pedal and it does stuff like that, that was, that that's was, a different lock-up, isn't it? That's out of the pits. Yeah. No. First, that was the first one. This is the second one. <laughs> that's, that's not easy to watch, is it? No. Back in the day, Alan, you know, your uh, old team, Audi, used to test here without the, uh, the chicane in place. Yeah. No, I, I was never 
all that excited to go into Curva Grande at 340 <laughs> kilometers per hour, to I be honest with you. I think your heart rate would probably have told a different story. I always look to the right instead of the wall on the left, yeah. but there's still a lot of work going on there. In fact, it's off the front page of the time screen. For those of you at home, that means it's not in the top 28. But it's going to be little um, compensation to them, but this is an opportunity to go through those drills throughout this race, effectively, for the overall. Yeah go through those drills ahead of the next race to come. And that's absolutely right. Everything is a rehearsal for Le Mans. You know, all of life is a rehearsal for Le Mans, and, and they're absolutely going to learn their lessons from this. But you're very correct. It is of little compensation to them. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because you not have practised on the other car will be the only thought that the team of number eight have. And number seven will be going, I hope to goodness that our drive shaft hub break, whatever it was, didn't come from the same batch. Well, we see Sean Galeel there, the second of those cars, a Jota, the green Jota LMP2 car. He's in third place. And in fourth, Antonio Felix da Costa, the second of those uh, Jota LMP2 cars. However, he's under investigation for that overtaking round the outside off track at Parabolica. And so that's something that we'll see whether there is a warning or a penalty or whatever's to come. But the cost is on a charge, but ultimately he may actually have a little bit of a penalty to pay. Yeah, well, we saw that 98 Aston there was told to give places back that he refused to give, having shot the chicane. Um, and, and that was the only penalty. And, and it wasn't for position, it was just putting a lap on a, on a back marker on a slower GT car. So I think a drive through penalty would be pretty harsh there. So for, yeah, for, uh, for the Jota car, yeah. Yeah. Just 10 seconds stop at the next pit stop or something like that is uh, the opportunities available to the stewards. The board, the number 91 car. And uh, car now fourth position closing again on Daniel Serra here. Yeah, just 33 hundredths of a second behind him at the line. So this is a genuine battle for third. The high class car may not be the Ferrari fans' favourite in a moment because as he shoots down the inside and stands on the middle pedal, it's going to take a little bit of the focus away. This is Jan Magnussen. Gets by nice and closely, uh, nice and cleanly rather, but closing right up behind Richard Leitz on Daniel Serra. Looking strong at the moment, isn't it, that 91 Porsche? Fourth out of the four runners in GTE Pro. Jan for Jan ahead of the yellow and green car. That's a battle for position. The yellow and green into Europol car, currently in the hands of Renga van der Zander. And what was their last lap time? 41.3 and a 41.7. Both quicker than the three cars ahead of them at the moment, so progress being made by both those cars. Now, that was the Ferrari kicking up the dirt there. We saw moments or two ago in the other Ferrari-Porsche battle for the lead of the class, the Porsche kicking up the dirt ahead of the Ferrari. But uh, Neil Jarni just creeping away to a second and a half nearly ahead of James Collado. And teammate Daniel Serra in the red car in front of us with you know, not even a quarter of that advantage at the moment over Neil Jarni here. Let's see what the team have got to say. This is Richard Leeds, beg your pardon, in 91. Richie, if we stop fuel saving, do you have space to pass the Ferrari? Question. I got sorry. Okay, please try, we'll give it five laps. For those five laps, no fuel save, trying to get past the Ferrari. Yeah. Oh, you there. Yep, no fuel save, so they're saving behind, lift off and coast in, trying to, you know, just conserve the, well, two things, the little bit on the brakes, but also the other thing, the fuel, which will extend the, the stint lens potentially. But uh, now, give it full beans, get past the Ferrari, you're being held up too much. It's a warning flag for the 38 for that to overtake off to, uh, to track limits at uh, Parabolica. Just keeping an eye on the pace at the moment of Gustavo Menezes in ninth place in the Glickenhaus, the 708 car that had that delay early with the spark plug. 1.48 his lap two laps ago. He's not back yet to the kind of pace we've seen that car with 38s, 39s. So I wonder if that car might be traffic. More likely, maybe a little bit of a problem. I've been banging and misfiring a bit. Uh, uh, Antonio Felix Costa getting a warning from the stewards for passing around the outside. Uh, passing around the outside, not the issue. Passing around the outside by exceeding track limits, that was the issue there. So he's just being warned about that. Uh, Richard Lee, see, the, the team radio is a double-edged sword. You can have a conversation with your driver, but it's not secret, because if we can hear it and we broadcast it, as we just have done, then 
the Ferrari team, if they're not watching the, the TV or not hearing the radio broadcasts, will be only fools themselves. Number eight, back out and back on track. Do you reckon that Brendan's going to be a little bit gentle in the braking area at the first game? <laughs> Once or twice, definitely. Uh, in fact, it, th there are no small stops here, are there? So he'll be very cautious down to the Roger the first time. But now they've put a new left front corner on the car, and I'm sure it was, as you said, Alan, the full corner, drive shaft potentially and everything else. And uh, hopefully what ailed it should be cured. You don't expect a second major component failure like that. He pops out just uh, behind the battling Jota cars. We saw the battling, didn't we, last, uh, last time out at Portimao. It was great entertainment. It was through Cubs WRT car, leading the class still by uh, over 11 seconds. So Felipe Albuquerque is not making impact onto that, uh, that gap right now. It is Richard Leeds on the back of Daniel Senna. Oh. He's been given the, the OK to go for it, but he's not been able to go for it and get it done. He's had damage on that right front corner as well. That's the oh, it's that was, Bruni. Yeah, yeah, yes, the I, was, I was thinking that was 92, but it wasn't. It was that car, wasn't it? It's another unimpressive lap uh, from the Glickenhaus. It's 145 now. I'm pretty certain Gustavo Miller has got a problem here. I don't think it's traffic, so it is, and I don't think Gustavo's forgotten how to drive halfway through the stint either. So. The last three laps have been 148, 142, 145 against, well, laps in that traffic cluster at 141, 142, and uh, more often than not, it's been 138 to 140s when the car's been at full speed. And to put that into perspective, that's four or five seconds a lap slower than an LMP2 yep. car, so he has definitely got an issue, and he's going to struggle to, to pass most things in a straight line as a result. He's going to be the traffic for the yep. GTE cars at the moment at that pace. Confirmed it is a full front left corner change for the number eight Tota. Thank you yep. very much to... Well, how full is the front oh, left corner? Everything. Is that drive shaft as yep. well? That was uh, 88, I think, there, running off onto the grass on the exit of Ascari, kicking up the dirt. 77, I think. Sophia Flersch there is just the LMP2 car in behind that. Maybe show me a racing car. They're sitting, that particular car is... Uh, just lost it on the yeah, time. It's ninth. Apologies. Yeah, it's ninth. So it's behind Gustavo Menezes in the Glickenhaus on the timing screen. It's ninth in the LMP2 class. Seven Tota pushing. Uh, has been pushing for some little while now. Not, certainly not in any kind of conservation mode. I think it's on a risk assessment, certainly, because its main competitor in the championship is uh, several laps down being the sister car. However, at this moment in time in the Toyota pit, if it's not already done, it's understanding what the problem was and also what the risk is to the other car, the number seven, yeah. that's leading this race. And the, and the thinking there, if you're in the number 17 garage, is if we are going to be forced to stop, we want to be going as quick as is humanly possible so that we get back out in front of the other car because that is your championship rival rather than the drivers of the Alpine or the Glickenhaus, which are unlikely, probably, to beat you at the mark car battle here with uh, Fritz van Erd now under pressure from Ryan Cullen and Jan Magnussen. And more car battle with yeah, Renger van der Zander. Yeah, indeed. That is all for position. Fritz van Erd in the black and yellow racing team Nedlin car leads in Pro Am. He's fifth overall in LMP2 and gets the break in traffic. Nothing wrong with his driving abilities here. There's Sam van der Zander on the back oh. and it's going too wide. It's going to be oh. three. I think he's OK with that. Yeah, two wheels over the white line to make the pass. He's got an overlap, though. Here we go. He's coming down the inside of the high-class car of Jan Magnussen, and he's commanding the inside line, and Jan says, yeah, I've got the inside line for the second element. Doesn't make it through. Renga van der Zander picks up the spot. Yeah, Renga is quite strong in traffic, shall we say. <laughs> Drives very robustly. But and, uh, does a plumbing good job. And those two know each other well of old, of course, because Renga spent a lot of time racing in IMSA, where Jan has as well. And Renga was saying, this car, compared to the Cadillac DPI, he said it's like it's got aircon. The Cadillac is like a sauna inside. He said, this car is no problem at all in the temperature.
Should uh, point out as well, by the way, that uh, Fritz van Erd leading this group of four cars is leading the Pro-Am class. Yep. And his major con competition at the moment is the uh, high-class racing car. Jan Magnussen sitting second in the Pro-Am class. Yeah. Ben Hanley has taken over in the uh, Dragon Speed car from Henrik, Henrik Hedman at the last stop. Mira Konopka did take over from Oli Webb in ARC Bratislava. Norman Nato in at Real Team. That was the driver change. And problems Trouble. Trouble. for our GTE AM leader. Ben Keating is missing a guard and a tyre. Left front corner. That's, That's a puncture. Yeah. Yeah. The it's tires. also the inner edge of that tyre is actually the band has come yeah. off it. Yeah. So more than likely he's had a flat spot and it's then just peeled it back on the inner edge. While well, we're watching this as well, by the way, uh, the 709 definitely, the 708 rather, in trouble. It's a 4 at 147. Yeah. There's actually just lost a lap to its uh, sister car. Egidio Perfetti's in. That's the car that has all the trouble here. That's the tyre that has all the trouble. Left front, there. boom. Bang. That was it. That was the tyre shredding the front of the car happens at high speed these things because then the centrifugal force just peels it off so therefore if it is the bonding where the the whole construction of the tire joins together if it has just released a little bit then you get this Whoa. a lot of carbon debris on the track there at a high speed yep. part of the track and into a braking zone you can see there on the inner half of it how it's cleaned and in the other half it's flailing Oh, and, the, and the problem there is not just brake lines and suspension, but all the electronics and everything else inside. It's, you know, there's the exhaust running around the back of the wheel arch. Splitter. Yeah. Splitter's gone as well. That is a big job. Ben Keating is out. You can see the Texas Lone Star. In is our LMP2 leader. Safety car. Yeah. That will be for debris on all that debris that was running up towards the Ascari chicane and WRT's done their pit stop. But... Will there be a red light at the end of the pit lane? Will they be able to leave? They're going to get oh, caught oh. out. Big off for the 38 Jota car. Big off. Wow. That's full rally cross spec there. <sighs> that was Antonio Felix da Costa. Yeah. Kept his foot in it over the gravel. Three laps for pits closed on the safety car. Yep. Uh, 38 has come in. That That's will. a mistake as well. It'll be emergency service if anything. You need yep. a puncture. So this is where the debris field is going to be. WRT have left the pit lane, so they have been allowed out of the pit lane. And they have is... already started their pit stop yes. by the time that yeah. it wasn't as if they came in at the beginning of it. They had no, already exactly. started. Yeah. That would have been colossally unfair if they'd been caught at the end of the pit lane. GC Pro pass for third. Oh, well, that's a bit of top speed. Yeah, absolutely just. Oh, that's a bit of... Did he make the corner? Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. That's a great bit of Super Cup action there from Richard Leitz. There is our safety car ready to go because of this huge tyre failure. You know, and, that's, and that was that out-of-sequence extra stop. You imagine that they didn't do a... Did we see them sort of do a set of tyres? Uh, let's have a quick look. What was his pit stop time? I'll it, look at that. It's in entirely possible here because they've got old-fashioned-ish curves with edges that fall off into gravel traps. It's, it's entirely possible that running out wide has somehow cut the tyre a little bit. I think it's more likely coming from flat spots. Yeah. And then the vibrations and yep. everything that comes from that. We saw Dylan Pereira sitting in the seat, so he's not getting in the car now, but... That's a worrying moment for our race leader in GTE Pro, Neil Charney. Right. Debris field coming back at you at flat chat. It's a pretty worrying moment for what was then the leader in GTE Am, yeah. which was what actually happened. But yeah. uh, he obviously sensed something yeah. because he moved to the inside. It was I, probably yeah. starting to shake itself to pieces in his hands and then boom, because as that started, yeah, that's quick reactions though from Ben Keating. It's a really tough break for the team, for, for Ben and for TF Sports. Just got to show what the energy involved there can yeah. do, the damage there. And the tyres grow so much in their circumference as well at the speeds that they're doing here as well. That any, any weakness is going to be found out much more than at a, at a, a less, uh, less quick, less longer straights. Alan's saying they don't so much these days. Since, since they... 
since they've not been crossed by it well that's true but they still they still have the they still have the the, the, uh, the basic problem that you put the tread on top of the carcass and so they have to be joined together and anything that is joined can be unjoined which is what's happened unfortunately mm. for tf sports yeah this, on this, one. this has to come down as bad news again for toyota that's a hard earned almost lap lead on the Blickenhaus in third and uh, substantial li uh, lead over the 36 is going to come down to next to nothing. The man currently with the widest eyes in the pit lane is just squaring up with Louise Becker. This will be an eye to eye interview almost for Louise. Let's hear from Ben Keating. Ben Keating, I can see the disappointment on, on your face. We can see the team working hard. Uh, what happened from your point of view in the car? Uh. I, uh, I pushed a little bit too hard when I was trying to pass the 98 car going into Ascari, and I flat spotted the tire pretty bad. I was trying to nurse it for the last 20 minutes. <sighs> we just pushed it one lap too far. Uh, unfortunately, we should have pitted one lap earlier. We would have been okay, but uh, the tire exploded, blew out the inner tire liner, and uh, I guess according to the rules, we have to race with that inner tire liner. <laughs> So, uh, so now they're working to replace it all, but uh, shit, who knows how many, how far down we are now. Yeah, the, the damage that it causes is just incredible. Yeah, unfortunately. We were, uh, I don't know, maybe half a kilometer from, uh, from pitting. So it happened on the back straightaway right before coming to the pits, but once it exploded, boom, the damage is done. Okay, thanks, Ben. Thank you. A lot of damage done. Ben Keating taking this car to Le Mans next month. His seventh visit to Le Mans, Graham Goodwin. His seventh different car. Yeah. Not, not actual chassis, seven different type yeah. of car. Not because he's done that to all of them. <laughs> <laughs> now, Ben, you know, it, it's, again, the passion shows and the disappointment shows, doesn't it? But yeah. it's the adventure for him. Well, and this too is motor racing, Alan, isn't it? You know, for, for the few highs, there are far more lows, aren't there? Yeah, very true. Majority of the time you go home thinking what might have been. Uh, but the ones where you manage to be on top of that podium that the two cars coming into the pit lane are at now uh, is just a fantastic feeling and it makes up for all that disappointment in ARC. Bratislava is in the pits, also is Sean Galeel in the Jota in the LMP2 car and the Iron Lynx, Sierra Bovi, GT3 Am all in the pits. Well, there is the race order after just over two hours. Toyota, Alpine, Glickenhaus, your one, two, three. Those are the healthy hypercars. United Autosports, WRT ahead of the brace of Jota Sport cars as pit stops start behind the safety car. And in the GT Pro class, 92 Porsche ahead of the 51 Ferrari with Porsche Ferrari the remaining positions in the AM class, the, 90, uh, the <coughs> uh, Aston Martin that was leading Ben Keating's car is in the pit lane, and that means that 83 backs the top of the pile, Francois Perodo ahead of the 54 Air, of course, the car, and the 98 Aston is in third position, and the pit lane is now open. We are seeing pit stops, and the last car running, the car behind you, is a Toyota. That is the fate so far of the number eight car and they've got uh, just over three and three quarter hours to try and find their way back that's a picture that you don't expect to see isn't it as a racing driver a tractor coming the other way and graham good and we can vouch for how effective that blower is can't we after the track walk earlier on i didn't do the track oh you didn't come around no. so it was it was just uh, just me and Duncan, I thought that you were with. Uh, it was Dave, it was Dave, our producer. No, I was, I was too busy eating, drinking tea and eating biscuits, which is uh, my one. Uh, great knowledge, by the way, from you there, Martin, on uh, Ben Keating as we watch uh, repairs going on. Not just seven different cars, seven different makes yes, as well. Yes. So, you know, he's uh, been part of the Le Mans 24 hours since 2015. Not the best of luck. One uh, podium in class in GTE Am. Did win on yes. the road before disqualification of 4GT. Yep. But we've got a bit of time. Uh, 2015. The SRT Viper the GTM, Yorick at 03 Nissan with Murphy prototypes in 2016 and LMP2. The unique at Le Mans, Riley Mark 30 Gibson in 2017. 18 was the Ferrari 488 GTE with Keating Motorsports. In the following year, the fabulous wins liveried 4GT. 
uh, last year. Team Project One with the Porsche 911 RSR, and if things go to plan, it will be Team F Sport and the Aston Martin Vantage GTE in 2021 for one of the most enthusiastic people on the planet. Yeah, seven different cars <laughs> run by seven different teams. <laughs> you know, and he's always just looking for the next adventure. It's not that he didn't like the cars that he was racing or the teams he was racing with. He's just always looking for that next adventure. And yeah, Texan runs 13, 14 different car dealerships back home. So he's uh, a very busy man. And actually, Graham, you know, we've talked about it last season and this. Boy, he's quick. Oh, he's probably quick. I mean, he's, he's quick in GT cars. He's quick in LMP cars. Anybody who watched the Rolex 24 a couple of years ago would have seen him, frankly, destroy the field at the, the start of the Rolex 24 in an LMP2 car. Probably stretched the envelope a little bit in, in racing, both in GTD, in the GT3 car, and the P2. And I think he was tired by that. But the talent of Ben Keating as a driver, let alone as a gentleman driver, yep. absolutely undisputable. For me, right up there as one of the best, if not the best, non-professional driver yeah. in sports car racing. I, right I think now. in our field, he and Egidio Perfetti in the GTs are right there, hammer and tongs with each other, and, and as good as anybody else you care to put them uh, put against them. And by the way, don't challenge him on a bicycle either. Oh, that's just <laughs> that often the case. He has done multiple times more miles on a bicycle since the beginning of lockdown than he has done in any kind of wheeled vehicle. Uh, he is a very fit individual and, you know, he, as I said, runs a slew of car dealerships all the way across Texas uh, from his home in Victoria, Texas. And, uh, yeah, what an enthusiast. Is he back in the car? Uh, no, it's not. No, so... Is that Dylan Pereira? No, because Dylan was in the seats over there. Felipe Fraga? Yeah, it may well be. I thought Dylan was getting ready to go in, but it may well be Felipe Fraga. Well, while we whilst we're behind the safety car with pit still closed, of course, it is the seven Toyota Kazoo racing car. We just crossed the line behind the safety car. So the four laps now complete. Uh, behind the car, here it's uh, now Matteo Vazavier in second. The safety car train in the 36 copy of the car. Third, the 709 Lickenhouse. Frank Meyer uh, is third on the road there. Quick look at the Tota here, the seven car, the undelayed car. In LMP2, it is a change uh, with that pit stop we saw just as the safety car, uh, car was scrambled for the WRT car. Did not manage to burn most of that under safety car conditions though. So it's the 22 United Autosports car uh, of Felipe Albuquerque who leads the way from the 38 Jota, Antonio Felix da Costa, Fritz van Aert in the number 29 racing team Netherlands car. That car running very well for the Pro-Am. Uh, squad into Europol competition with Renga van der Zander runs fourth at the moment. WRT having made that stop, others still have to stop, uh, is out there running in fifth position in, uh, position in class. Still staying out despite the fact that I think we're pretty convinced it's carrying a problem. The 708 car, Clickenhouse Racing, I expect to see that car on pit lane when it can. Yeah. Um, and that car running in ninth position overall and amongst the LMP2 class, completing the top 10 is the 28 Jota car with Sean Galeal. Uh, and in second in uh, LMP2 Pro-Am, 11th overall, Jan Magnussen. GT Pro, 17th overall, it's Porsche, Ferrari, Porsche, Ferrari again. Neil Janney uh, in the number 92 for the 51 of James Gallardo. And the, of course, of Porsches, Richard, Richard, Richard Leitz, sorry, in the Porsche. And Daniel Serra, Hans Rapparodo now leads uh, the GT Am class in the 83 Ferrari. Uh, and of the second day, of course, at Ferrari, in the hands again of Francesco Castellacci. Paul Dallalana, third in the 98 AMR uh, Northwest uh, Aston Martin Vantage. Ben Barker in a good position at the moment in the 86 Golf Racing Car. And a good run here from Satoshi Hoshino. He's got the number seven, uh, 777 car from D Station Racing, the other car run by TF Sport, fifth in class. And race control telling drivers to close up gaps in the field, which means we are preparing, I think, to go back to green flag racing. Safety car remains out. Well, let's get down to Racing Team Netherlands. That car lying in third position with Fritz van Aert at the wheel. As we said earlier, Nick de here this weekend. He's with Louise Beckett. Of course, it's very, 
wait. Okay. Uh, of course, it's a shame for the team to miss out on on two permanent drivers, but um, yeah, luckily we could step in and uh, replace them for this weekend. Um, Fortunately, we have been very unfortunate by this safety car. Uh, we're obviously on the same kind of strategy as the leaders, but uh, our competition managed to uh, benefit massively from it because they were behind and they obviously pitted during the safety car while we had to do a splash and we still need to do uh, a full pit stop. Um, but it is the way it is. Um, I think we, we are strong and still a long race to go. Okay, thanks. I can see the team are getting ready behind you, so yeah. uh, we'll get going. Thank, Thank you. you. Cheers. Hello to a uh, friend of the show, Allard Kalf, who's been oh. enjoying at racing his Spice, uh, well, not his Spice, a Spice again all weekend uh, at Zandvoort, but he points out that this will be the first Le Mans for Ben Keating without... Jerome Blakemo. Correct, Amundo, yes, well spotted, haven't yep. thought of that. Jerome in this race. Uh, he is. And uh, been a long, long and productive uh, partnership between the two of them. Yep. So Jerome will be aboard a different car in GTM come the Mont time. So Hello. lights off. Start. Yeah, lights off on the safety car. And it's always a sign when uh, Eduardo wants the field to close up. There's the Glickenhaus closing up a little too much over the 61 Amp class Ferrari. We go green. Green flag is shown at the start line, and our race leader, who is Jose Maria Lopez now in the seven Toyota, leads the charge. But the D station. Aston, is that coming into the pits? It is, and that means that the, the cars behind can't pass. They can't pass until now as you get to the line. So that's why the queue is spreading out. And here comes the 709, third place, Franck Mayer, his first world endurance race in that Glickenhaus. And everybody else bottled up behind. There's the sister car. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Contact and didn't get by. That's. Uh, the 52 car, Daniel Serra, trying to go by Richard Leeds. The, the Alpine has pitted, looking how 709 up to second place right now. Uh, across the timing line, 15.9 seconds back. That didn't do the Glickenhaus any favours, backed it right up, didn't yeah. it? Well, now, in the pits, United first in LMP2, Chota second in LMP2, Racing Team Netherlands third in LMP2, Inter Europol fourth in LMP2. Nick de Vries was kind of right, that a lot of their rivals, like them, had to come in for an emergency stop to get a few litres of fuel on to survive the safety car. That's possibly almost as much of an issue. Now then, was that a safe release for the Jota car to come up alongside the 98 Aston Martin? That's dropped behind 777. There's a change there because they came in with the 98 of Paul Dallalana ahead. Now Andrew Watson in the D station car is ahead of uh, Marcos Gomez in that 98 Aston, the all Aston battle. And those are the top two healthy Astons. Somehow now, Dempsey Proton's Christian Reed, the 77 car, is up into the top five. This is the battle for the lead in GT Pro through traffic. It's the front. It's taken advantage here around the outside. Is he going to make that? No, Neil, uh, it is Neil Jarney who's going to make him use the runoff area. I have the inside. I'm drifting out wide. Sort yourself out, Sunbeam. Restart here in GT Pro. This is James Collado, world champion. There goes the real team racing LMP2 car. He goes by. He's going to try and get by the uh, Project One Porsche in front. Can't do it. And again, the Ferrari. Now he's got the internal apex. And he takes the inside line and rubs the Porsche off into the dirt. And through goes Richard Leitz. So big loss of ground there, I'm afraid, for Neil Gianni. Yeah, the defence didn't work, did it? Unfortunately, and Neil Gianni loses two places. Uh, on the exit of that corner. Reese's pit stop under investigation. They have just been in and out of the pits. It was a uh, uh, on the inside of the whole field, it looked like there. Yep. But also Miguel Molina, I think, is still aboard that. Uh, that's, no, it's Daniel Serra, isn't it? 52 yep. car. He's in the mix here as well. There's so, a lot of last of the late, late breakers going on here, isn't there? You know, Leader in GT Pro for the first time at this race is a Ferrari, and here's how it happened. James Collado. Denied the outside line in the Parabolica, goes outside, inside, and just goes, I'm having that, Neil Jarni. Tough, tough luck, son, suck it up in the gravel. That was a big move from Collado, Alan. Yeah, it was, and at this point then, to be honest, it wasn't a surprise that uh, 
but Yanni ended up with two wheels in the gravel and then ultimately dropped back into third place. And he's not far ahead of Daniel oh. Serra. Oh, and that was the Glickenhaus going straight on. Daniel Serra is there as well. So this is Collado, the red car, the white Porsche with the red stripe. That's Neil Jani. Then there is the Amclass Porsche, the third white Porsche. That is third place, and the Ferrari behind is fourth place. That's your GTE Pro field with an AM in the middle of it going, guys, please go by me right now, if you wouldn't mind. That was the 708 clicking house we saw on the run through. OK. And that's another uh, long lap, I'm afraid, from Gustavo Menezes. Is he back into trouble again immediately once we come out from the safety car? Yeah. Are they running with a problem? We can see the company blimp there up in the sky over Excellent. Oh, there it is indeed once more it's been well over a decade nearly 15 years I think since there's been a good year blimp resident in Europe 708 is in the pit lane so Gus Menez is clearly not happy with the way the car is working yeah but it was lap 45 when they were last into the pits and so therefore they're still early on the stop, but I presume after an issue at the first chicane, then there's maybe a little bit of bringing the stint length down and yep. making sure they get it sorted out. Well, you learn nothing if you have to park the car. You learn an awful lot more, even if it makes you slightly less competitive here. Of course, you're trying to learn for Le Mans, so make sure you get all the kilometers under the wheels as you can. It might just be that he was running out of tire. Ramos Galore continue, yeah. 92 car back up to pace and back with the Sister 91. 51 Ferrari leads for James Collado. Coming down the straight with the green splitter, the red Rinaldi racing Ferrari. We barely talked about that car, but that is a newcomer to World Endurance Championship racing. Christian Hook is at the wheel of that car at the moment. They are in the top 10 in the GTE Anfield. And again for them, it's a limbering up for Le Mans. Yeah, Dennis Olsen, by the way, now aboard the 46 car, so this will be his first introduction to the World Championship this year in the 46 Project One car, setting quick lap times immediately for a man that took the squad down to GT Challenge a couple of years ago. Renke van der Zander, third place in the Inter-Europol competition, fourth place, Jota Antonio Felix de Costa. So this is a battle for the podium position. Renke van der Zander certainly isn't going to be I would say too courteous towards Da Costa and shouldn't be in reality because uh, yeah. this is a battle that actually the Interpol, Inter-Europol competition car, remember it had a drive-through penalty earlier in the race for tagging Loic Duval into yep. a spin. They have an impressive start to the season, the Polish flag team. Big investment in their engineering staff this, this uh, season. A couple of fifth places. And Kuba Gamaziak, the third driver, his dad is into Europol. He's here in the truck. Oh, yeah. You will get him in 21. You will get him in 21. Be smart, mate. You can do it. It'll be a big break, <laughs> mate. I tell you, that's easy to say from the very luxurious pit box. Licking the stamp. This is going to be a long send. Okay, he he's says. gone for it. He's gone for it. Oh! No. Ah, nearly not. Rango goes, hey, have some gravel. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That was never <laughs> not going to happen. Antonio gave it what the team suggested. He gave it the full nine yards there. And Renga, perfectly within his rights, took the inside apex. Alan, great racing for both. It, it needs no words. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you said Renga wasn't going to make it easy uh, on him. Never got, he's no. never going to. And at the same Seven time, Antonio's not going to make it easy on the other side. Licking house in the pits, tear off, yeah. off. This is the second Seven place. Nine, nine, right? Yes, it yep. is. So with its Goodyear, uh, Goodyear Goodwood sticker, that's the first time it ran up the hill at Goodwood in the Festival of Speed last week. A lot of brake dust just behind the front wheels of that car. Mm -hmm. If you look at it on what we call the elephant foot, which is the area directly behind the front wheels. It's very, very dusty. Isn't it just hard work out there? Ford is a very new car. The two Toyotas running together on track, but uh, far apart Don't on the worry. driving screens. They've got the field surrounded. They've got them exactly where they need them. <laughs> <laughs> Number seven still leading this race. Toyota looking for a third straight win in hypercar. It's going to be an interesting three and a half hours that we'll see them somehow end up with a 1-2. I think that is 
less likely than many other possible outcomes of the race. Only update from Tota is two completely unrelated issues for the delayed car. Yeah, it was a settings issue that saw the car in trouble the first time, and they're still trying to diagnose the issue that uh, required them to change the corner. I can diagnose the car. issue. Machining itself to pieces. Yeah, yeah. The, the question is why. Yeah, well, that's not the issue. I know you that. do. But... <laughs> well, there's the Rinaldi racing Ferrari ahead of us. We're with the number seven Toyota, and you can see, Alan, what's going to be the issue coming out of some of the chicane. It's nice, the uh, iron links. That they struggle to get off the corners sometimes as quick as the GTs. Let's hear from Da Costa. Okay, you just got some race, please. You just got to be on the track. Oh, stay cool, mate. It's on TV. It's on TV. Everyone saw it. So it will be okay. Stay cool. You will lose one that I mean. You will get him. You will get him. Very nice crowd on the cucumber, but it's Yeah, I'd suggest next time don't suggest into turn one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was expecting Antonio to say, okay, that's turn one. Got any more good ideas? Yeah. Turn, <laughs> There's Ant Davidson any, watching. Any notes on turn two, I suppose, for the next question. <laughs> yeah, but that incident's being investigated now. Absolutely, but it was a racing incident. Renger van der Zander didn't change his line. He went from apex to apex to exit. That's the way he was on the racing line. And it, 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 it's the sort of racing we want to see close and no quarter given or asked. And Antonio would have done exactly the same. Let's hear now from Jimmy Bruni. Louise is with the Porsche team. Jimmy Bruni, you're watching on as the uh, Porsches battle it out, uh, and still that Ferrari-Porsche battle continues. Yeah, I mean, uh, this, is part, this is part of the history of endurance racing. Uh, yeah, it will continue, I think, until the end. At the moment, we are P2, P3. Uh, we are recovering. Uh, some time that we lost, uh, it's looking okay. Uh, still uh, more than half and a half of the race to go. Let's see. How's it for you uh, coming to Monza with Porsche? I mean, it's good, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I, it's, it's something special, always race in, uh, in, uh, in Italy, especially in this uh, historic uh, track like Monza. And uh, of course, not all the Diffosi uh, loves that, that uh, I'm, uh, I'm with Porsche, but I like it, so I'm happy to be here. Uh, we know that uh, when you've been coming in, you've been changing the left side of the tyres, so how is tyre wear out there? Uh, you know, tyres is always a big question mark. Uh, it can change uh, hour by hour because the track temp will uh, go high or lower. You have to react uh, always, but uh, at the moment, OK. Let's say uh, so far, uh, it's, it's OK. And you, you had a bit of contact with the settler. We knew that he was already in trouble when that happened. Yeah. Was there any... We saw a little bit of damage to the car, but did it affect you? Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, uh, the, the driver, I think he was the amateur driver, uh, if, I, if I'm not wrong. Uh, he was blocked me for four or five corners. I don't know why it was a blue flag, uh, so it was uh, advised from a car, different category coming. Uh, he was blocking me, and then he lost the car exit of seven, and it was no chance to avoid uh, the contact because I tried to brake and steer, but he was a little bit, you know, stayed there and coming back. Uh, but damage so far, it's more looking uh, the damage, but the car it seems to be okay. Good stuff. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, Porsche, it's had bits of Ferrari throw, thrown at it, bits of GTM car thrown at it twice. Now, uh, in and out of the pits, Alan, the number seven Toyota from the lead. Let's see how that affects uh, the running. Uh, currently, we've got the top three cars running with around 23 seconds of each other. Uh, also, great news as that uh, interview is progressing. We've got the 33 car back out and running, all bit heavily delayed after that uh, tyre explosion. Front left tyre from the 33. Let him go, and we're going to a scar. Yeah, the TF Sport uh, was driven by Ben Keating. There was a lot of damage there. It was leading GT, it, GT Am at the time. Uh, ultimately, he's been in the pits for quite a wee while, so it's out of contention, but it is good to see that the Blue Aston Martin's back onto the track. As we are now on board with Antonio Felix da Costa, who's hunting down again Renger van der Zanden in the Inter-Europol competition car. You know, if we just review back to what was it three or four laps ago, then uh, the engineer said send it at turn one. 
And uh, that's exactly what Da Costa did, but Van der Zander had slightly different ideas about where that particular discussion was going to end up at turn two. Well, you were perfectly right. A couple of, uh, a couple of laps before that in saying both these guys very kind of, uh, they know exactly how to race, shoulder to shoulder. That's what we saw. Be interested to see what race control's view of that uh, that incident was. Martin Haven making it very clear he saw that as a race incident. I have to say I agree with him. But uh, it, as you said, didn't require a great deal of explanation as to how that panned out. No, it certainly didn't. And uh, Da Costa has now got back up to speed again and is catching back in. Remember, this is for uh, third place in category. Nine seconds ahead of uh, the inter Europol car, we have got second place, Paul Luc Chata in the racing team Netherlands it's leading the Pro-Am category because uh, look, Paul Luchata normally wouldn't be in that car but he was a great late replacement due to a positive Covid test and uh, ultimately he's jumped in to replace uh, Van de Garde who normally is in that racing team Netherlands car. So is this a question for me? Is Chata the first non-Dutch driver to be driving in that car? Uh, he's probably an honorary Dutchman for this weekend, I'm sure. He's full clock at the moment, uh, so Paul Luc Chatin, regular driver of course, Redex Sport of the European uh, Le Mans Series. There is the Goodyear airship. And uh, I think you're probably right, he probably is the very first. Philippe Albuquerque, 8.8 .8 seconds ahead of the racing team Netherlands car. So it looks at the moment in the way that things are going as we've got this battle fully on the way. What's, uh, what's at stake here in this uh, part of the race, Alan, for this? Jota Sports leading the championship at the moment and into Europol. We're going to hear from the 34 car now. Three bottles still empty. Okay, copy that, Greg. Yeah, looks like you're drinking too much because we put four bottles in the car. Anyway, for now, you have to push it without a drink bottle. It's the deal done this time. Da Costa was a little bit closer, sent it down the inside, got the job done. Van der Zander had no response. Uh, that particular radio message was probably about 20 seconds ago. Yeah. Where he'd been saying that he's run out of drinks bottle. The engineer said, well, don't drink so much, but that's not <laughs> always the case. There's a lot of little valves and they can leak yeah. between them, especially when it links in towards the driver's helmet and things. Which finally throws back to a conversation he and I had in the garage just before the start of the race, about an hour beforehand. He was saying the real problem with the, with the Cadillac DPI also was that at the end of a triple stint in Daytona, his vision was whiting out. He only had a tiny cone of tunnel vision because his drinks bottle wasn't full when he got in for the second, where, when he was in for the second stint, and he had no, nothing to bring, the, no fluid to bring his, uh, his hydration back up. So he was really, really struggling, struggling. and in fact, um, Scott Dixon, his teammate, had to get out after, you know, halfway through a stint because exactly the same reason he was completely dead. So the thing is, the furnace, but you do need that fluid, you need that hydration to keep your focus, otherwise the brain starts to shut down. That's not ideal at these speeds. No, it's not. Here, it's not too bad, being very frank with you. It's, it's certainly warm and it's warm outside, but uh, in terms of cockpit temperatures, it's not extreme and it's not the humidity that you get in Florida or you get uh, when you go up into, say, Watkins Glen or something, New York State. That's when it's extreme humidity, and unless you've got airflow in the cockpit, then it's very difficult. I certainly know in my previous life, we used to put a lot of effort into making sure there was airflow in the cockpit to the point where we could reduce the drinks bottle size because, as one engineer put it, we were the fastest taxi for drinks bottle in the world. <laughs> 36 car, well, it's like second chicane, obeys the rule to rejoin uh, with limited drama. Just six seconds ahead, by the way, of the Glickenhaus currently running third. Seven from 36, that gap 16 seconds. Battle for position in GTE Am as well here. You can see Simon Mann in the 61 car, closing in on Egidio Perfetti. Not Simon Mann, the cricket commentator. Fear not, TMS fans. But uh, Egidio Perfetti, in fact, Simon Mann has pushed Egidio right up behind the Rinaldi Racing Ferrari. A and trouble. another slow, it's that's got to be eight again. Eight. Hasn't it? it is eight. Whatever ailed Toyota, unrelated issues are not going away. Let's try and listen. 140. Nah, he's on throttle here. Remember the first time, he actually was stuck at about 108 kilometers per hour. 
this time he's actually able to slow and throttle, so this is something... But can he get a gear? Is that the issue? Is he stuck here? He was in third, he wasn't yeah. changing up or down. Or has he got no brakes again? Uh-oh, here we go. He's been told to drive slow to the pits. Yeah, that was lift off as he was coming down uh, towards Ascari. Now, everybody else in hypercar is going, enough with the eight. Can you please start putting some bad luck on the seven car? But the seven team, you know, it's, it's clearly not just that left front corner issue. They've still got an ongoing electronics issue of some, some kind because everything is controlled by electronics on these cars. And if it can go wrong on theirs, it can definitely go wrong on the number seven car. So this is where all of your sort of spidey senses start twitching. Fuel pressure is what we're being told from Toyota. Yep. Uh, so fuel pressure is the issue. I'll add, uh, by the way, one bit of detail. Um, Racing Team Netherlands did actually put a young non-Dutch non, uh, talent in the car at the moment their very first year. It was a Brazilian by the name of, I think his name is Rubens Barrichello. Well, that's an interesting one. Sorry to stop you there. That's an interesting one in fuel pressure because they talked about fuel pressure on the first instance. However, that car's only done 20 laps. Uh, and uh, Sebastian Buemi, who did the start of the race, did 30 laps in a stint. Yeah. So therefore, it's something definitely major. It's not just that it's on low fuel, no. because uh, they're clearly it's not struggling fuel, with it. It's not a fuel pickup issue. No. Something in the electronics is going haywire. Good luck with that. That might then. be the pump itself. Yep. But usually you do have backup pumps. It stops so much a part of endurance racing. You work so hard for every hundredth of a second out on track. You can give away so much in the pit lane just by not being well rehearsed. One car, count them, one single car on the pit lane <laughs> while that was playing. Roberto Lacorte has been in and out for Chetilar, a car that promised much at the start of the race, but has had very little luck since then. And the other stopper we just saw was Ben Hanley at Dragon Speed. He pulled in behind the number eight Toyota, number eight car. Not likely to recover for the rest of the afternoon. You say about how important pit stop routine uh, is for these teams, an indication of just what they will put in to learn. I spent all last weekend uh, with the European World Series and through two full free practice sessions, and I think for most of the weekend, I won't tell you which team it was, had a team member on you know, the, the other end of the pit lane on the pit wall observing their major WC opposition. Has there a change there? Yeah, Neil Charney. Doesn't get by Richard Leeds because Richard Leeds makes it neatly into the Roger. Ooh, that was a bit late by Neil. Wasn't it? Yeah. Late send and yeah. Go on, tell us which team it was, Greg. Uh, you can't well, say that. Not I, I, I can only tell you it began with Jay, didn't it? Okay. J G Drive A. No. Yeah. Well, you know, when we talked about this in free practice, the driver is always the weakest link, much as Alan would would, would uh, decry it, because the team spends, you know, they probably spend two or three lunch times a week doing their pit stop rehearsals and getting their two-man ballet correct, and then the drivers get in the way. Warning flag for Richard Leeds for abusing track limits. The other thing to, to, to say here as well, remember, very different pit stops. Uh, Richard Leeds? Didn't Neil Jarney just jump the chicane there, getting it wrong? I think they might be confusing the two portions. Unless it's a different... It might be a different place. It might be entirely unrelated. I don't believe in coincidence. And John's racing clearly attracting attention from all around motorsport. So to explain as well, no, these pit stops are not as quick as you'll see in other forms of motorsport. But look at the number of <laughs> mechanics that are actually being uh, employed here to do those, uh, those pit stops. Whereas in other forms of motorsport, you have 23, 24 people thrown at a car. Here, it's not like that. It's a very limited number of people. That there is a sequence you have to follow to do that. It's all about reducing cost and risk because, of yep. course, the refueling of the car. Yep. It's a very different strategic game that's being played here. Absolutely. And some are better than others.
Nambre has returned to the track. That that's the moment where Hugh Chamberlain in days of yore would have gone, right, either we're all going to the pub and having an early night, or it's going to behave itself. Final chance. And if it's back in the pits beyond when it needs fuel, that's it. We're going to shut the door and go home. Renga van der Zander, by the way, has dropped way back from Antonio Felix da Costa, is now under attack from Ferdinand Habsburg, remember the previous leader um, in LMP2. Now, of course, are they on a slightly different fuel schedule, WRT, because they were the leader, they came into the pits, then the safety car came right. out, everybody else sort of had a little dip in and out, had to come back in again, so it seems to me that they could be out of sync with everybody else, very potentially. Uh, so yeah. the, the cars ahead of them all went for emergency service, I think, uh, of that safety car. They, they did a full... He's due to... He's got five laps, six laps to go, but uh, he's right behind Van der Zandt. And you have half full is coming for position behind you. He's coming for position behind you. So, yeah, he's, there are definitely... Uh, Van der Zander has done 13 laps, so that's half stint, whereas... Uh, Habsburg, he's a lot closer to the end of this yeah. particular stint. Yeah. The incident, by the way, between Antonio Felix da Costa and Renga van der Zander, they've come to a conclusion, and it's no further action. Yep. I think anything else would have been a travesty. Real team back in the pits with Norman Nato. That's not scheduled, is it? Meanwhile, uh, Ferdy Habsburg goes by Renga van der Zander. No mistakes there. That is more or less on schedule. Oh, is it? OK, so they are definitely a bit out of kilter with everybody else. I imagine Nato will stay in. He has. He's, in fact, he's gone. Even as I noticed, he was in a 60-second stop. So that will be fuel only, you would think. Good luck times towards the end of that stint from Norman Nato. But yep. they're lagging back a little. They are, at the moment, third of the program class, albeit uh, ninth overall in this stacked on a B2 class. Ah, Four, well, we just seen two. somebody dive into the pits. We have, it is Richard Leitz in the Porsche and Francesco Castellacci, our AM class leader. Yeah, Richard Leitz, 35 laps in here. So uh, he pops himself in. So he's uh, currently in, well, he's dropped to fourth in this particular battle, but that'll sort of rebalance itself out as uh, we continue on and the others pit around and about. Fastest race lap, by the way, for another Porsche, the GR Porsche of Tom Gamble, yep. 148.1. Fastest lap that car has done. There is the Goodyear blimp. We told the story of Goodyear's more than century, almost century-long deal with Zeppelin from Friedrichshaf, and they have been... Because Goodyear made rubber, and Zeppelin needed bladders for hydrogen. Yep. It was a natural combination. That's why Goodyear's history with the, with the blimp isn't just sort of 1970s, 1960s. It goes back the better part of the century. A very, Goodyear, a Zeppelin, very, very impressive machine. Yeah. It really, really is an astonishing experience last yeah. year at Mom. Goody Bags had a flight in it last yeah. year, didn't you? I should... Definitely be pushing half one. I'd never been up in a blimp, and I would absolutely love to. We should make it clear. Whilst it's Brandon's blimp, it's not a blimp. No, Richard is a but a good year blimp is a legendary thing. It's a blimp. Meanwhile, Mathieu Vazivier in second place, Franck Mayer in third, battle of the French drivers, and battle between La Gloire de la France, uh, Alpine in gorgeous Alpine French blue, metallic blue, made so famous. Jean Redelais racing at rally cars through the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Being caught by Mayer he is in most the certain, house. He is most certainly being caught by Mayer. Yep. The gapper is three seconds now and took a further six tenths out of this advantage last time around, Frank Mayer. Thanks. Which is, I mean, hugely encouraging. This is the car that hasn't raced before for Wickham House. So this is its shakedown race, if you like. And it's got good pace. And so far, I'm now even regretting starting a sentence, it has been the more reliable of the pair. So it's given the drivers a great shake at having a good race. Great news for commentary team from Goodyear. We've got Mike McGregor, their event manager, uh, telling me I can go back at the blimp again this year. That's very good news. 
If only you weren't going to fall down the stairs the day before. <laughs> <laughs> no, in fairness, Mike says you are very welcome and uh, a golden ticket will be heading your way. Oh, fabulous. Oh, oh, that was that was the 60 car. Uh, no, it can't, can't have be. been. That's just blowing around the outside of it. I think it's the 60 car. It's the 60 car. Really? But they did, they'd ignored it. The problem child was just being frozen out. It's the funny. 60 car is not in the garage. That's Andrea Piccini. Wow. It's made three stops. It's a mere 58 laps behind the leaders. Um, Can it get classified at the end if it's 58 laps back? Uh, struggle. Yeah, struggle. Not a struggle. Yeah. They're looking for a position over the hypercar number eight. That's what they're looking for. I think the Toyota's going up. Well, that's going to be an easy gimme, isn't it? They're only 54 laps behind it. Putting miles on the 60 car. Andrea Puccini, it is the team director of Iron Weights. And a P2 cars. My goodness. This is for position as well. This is the Ben Dragon Hanley Speed and 70 car for position, isn't it? Yeah, Ben Hanley took over the Dragon Speed car from Henrik Hedman, their bronze rated driver. He's pulling it back up the order, and that was over Norman Nato for ninth and third in Pro Am. Fuel and two or four. I think it'll be two tyres. Remember, they're going to yep. try to triple or quadruple stint the right hand side on Neil Yanni's car. Uh, this is first and second in GT Pro. And you see top left, the time clicking up, which is the pit stop time. And it'll be a race out of the pits at the end. And of course, because they did and they didn't arrive the at the same time, the clocks didn't start at the same time. Ooh, a little bit slow there on the Ferrari. The Ferrari got jumped in the pits. Slow in dropping the car. They didn't release the car in time. They had the fuel, they had the tyres done, but they hadn't dropped in the ground. We said about that ballet, didn't we, with the pit stops. Some pit stops, they were caught a little bit cold there. And also, that's the advantage of being close to pit in, because if you're rolling, then you block the car that is further down the pit lane potentially from being released because it might be just too close. So if you gain even maybe one or two seconds in the pit lane, you can also gain more by them not being able to get their car out when it's ready to go. So that is a lead change in the pits. And we say time and time again, this genuinely is a team sport. We are looking at a slow Glickenhaus, which won? 708. 708. The one that's had all of the problems since the start of this race, Mark. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, as a team, although you don't want to have problems, if you're going to have a problem child, you don't want the problem spirit spread around. Keep them to yourself. That's Gus Menezes again. And I think he will be heading in towards Ooh. the pits, going very slowly here. He's trying to stay out of the way. Now he picks up the speed a little bit. And there's the uh, four horsemen, that Aston Martin, 33 car back out after it uh, tore itself apart or after a shredded tyre tore itself apart. And we heard from Ben Keating, Alan was absolutely right, it was flat spots that led to it. Yeah, four seconds was the delta in the pit lane between Neil Yanni and the Porsche and the wow. eight Porsche Ferrari, James Collado. Four seconds was given away towards Porsche by Ferrari on that last pit stop. Well, possibly two of them in the actual stop and the other two by not being able to release the car because the Porsche was in the way, but yeah, a few more issues. Oh, and that was Glickenhaus, Glickenhaus. Yeah, I think that was the start of the problem that yeah. Gustavo Menezes is the, uh, and then going slowly back towards the pits. The sister car was in right now. behind him as he hit yep. the brakes there, so just, well, it was nothing major. His last lap was a 1 minute 56, which is about 17 seconds off the pace. Mayo is right with the Alpine now. Yep. Under two seconds. Neil Jarni leading for Porsche. James Collado for Ferrari. Richard Leach third for Porsche, 91. 52 in fourth place, and that's still Daniel Serra. So they've cycled through. The, the, the driver that started did a stint and a, and a widgy bit. And then they've done double stints, 7.08 going back into the garage at Glickenhaus. And a P2, by the way, as we see the 7.08 being uh, pushed back into the garage. Uh, Felipe Albuquerque holding that lead just under 11 seconds. But now Habsburg though, is making up progress on the cars ahead. Yep. He's now back up into fourth position on the P2 as the team in the Glickenhaus garage go to work. 
Yeah, go to work. The engine cover's going to come off, so they'll take the tail off and then the engine cover from there. And that is literally the only car in the garage. We sort of said that, assuming that number 60 was still in there, but somehow Iron Lynx have decided, oh, all right, we'll fix it and send it back out. Because when we saw the, the last shot we had of the Iron Lynx number 60 car, there was nobody even looking at it. But uh, there's a lot of people looking at the Glickenhaus car. And this is why, Alan, if it's not just fuel and tyres, anything else apart from the windscreen clean goes back into the garage because you're not limited in the number of people that can work on the car or the things you can leave lying around while you're doing it. Yeah, the first thing you do is you refuel the car and then they pop it back into the garage and then it's all hands on deck, whichever hands you need and whichever hands you have. And uh, then they get to work when you're actually in the pit apron like uh, the Rinaldi Ferrari is at the moment. We're looking as if it's doing a brake change of it's some sort. Change. It's then, a GT3 uh, car. Then you're limited with the number of mechanics available. Now, bear in mind, these brakes work at somewhere around 800, 900, maybe even 1,000 degrees Celsius, and they do a lot of work here. Yeah, but it's a bit strange. That's a, that's a rear brake. Yeah. Normally, the front brakes would take the pounding right here. Looks like they were just trying to get the pads back in. One slight correction in terms of what you're allowed to do in that carriage. There's a limited number of people you're allowed right. in their whole crew for the car. Yes. In the case of a two-car uh, team, but of course, potentially, you've got the guys... The Everybody else. Are you limited yeah. in terms of uh, crew GTE? Members. No, I mean, the, the, the clicking house. The, in LMP, you're limited to 43 in total. Yeah. yeah. Per car. Or hyper car. Yeah. You're, yeah. Uh, per team. Per team. Yeah. It's almost like it's really nice. Almost. 86 per team is a lot if it was 43 per car. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's a fair amount of people. Well, that's Porsche levels of staff. It's a driver <laughs> change. It's a big lunch and budget. Absolutely. That's uh, Sophia Flush getting out. Yes. It is going to be Tatiana Calderon back aboard the car yeah. for her second crack at this as we're just six minutes from halfway in this six hours of Monza, the first six hours of Monza in FIWC history. Yes. Strange to say it, doesn't it? really it? does. It's a, it's a weird thing. Yeah. We've raced here in another series, but we've not raced here um, for the FI World Jewels Championship. So coming into halfway, uh, here's a fight here for second place. This is the fight. Seven yeah. and nine in the hands of Frank Mayer. Gap's opened up. It's gone from one point something out to three and a half seconds, three and a little bit. Great view down there of the Monta Paddock, the privet hedge that separates the paddock from the racetrack. Where else, I ask you, on the planet? can you find a nicely trimmed privet hedge lining one of the fastest straights in the place? Franck Mayer creeping away, I uh, beg your pardon, Mathieu Vazivier creeping away very slowly from Franck Mayer. And just maybe had a couple of good breaks in traffic and sometimes, Alan, that's all it takes to gain you a second around this place. Yeah, very true, but on the last lap, Mayer uh, equaled exactly within the... In fact, sorry, apologies, he didn't. He was a second slower than Mathieu Vaxivier. So Mathieu Vaxivier delivered a 38.6. He was the fastest car on circuit on that last lap, quicker than the Toyota that's leading a Jose Maria Lopez, which we should remember is only 22 seconds up the road. It's not as if they've got the huge lead they had at the beginning. That safety car brought everything back into line again. And so one trip up, very, very slight trip up by the Toyota, and they're in the clutches, not only of the Alpine, but also of the Glickenhaus. Uh, just a message to the Smith family close to Huntingdon. Uh, Mrs. Smith ought to make sure that her husband Sam is nowhere near uh, her wardrobe. Sam said at the beginning of the race that if there aren't at least three safety cars, you can call me Sylvia. Hello, Sylvia Smith. We're nearly halfway through the race and we've only had one so far. You could be in trouble. We will require photographic evidence. Sites together, <laughs> and most of the unpopular ones too. So the Glickenhaus Alpine battle continues, and as you say, it looks as though Glickenhaus. I wonder if Meyer has just pushed it sort of over the edge of its tyre, and and now the Alpine is having a little bit of an advantage. They're closing up behind the number one Richard Mill Racing LMP2 car of Tatiana Calderon, fresh out from the pits. Jan Magnus Magnussen, rather a long stop for high class. He's still in the pit lane. And looking at the lap time evolution between the two cars, I wouldn't say necessarily. Mayo had a couple of laps. He had a, a slow one, yeah, which was a 42-second lap, which is about three and a half seconds, which was definitely traffic, but then got back down into the realms of where it should be. So I think that traffic lap sort of broke the back of the holding on to uh, Mathieu Vaxivier. 
But if traffic can take us away, traffic can give us back at some point. Was my thing when I was racing was just hanging on to that thought when it was going against you because, you know, it's tough to just keep digging in and fighting in and knowing that uh, there's things that you can control and things you can't. Some of the areas of traffic you definitely can control. There is no question about it. But one thing that is also control about is speed in the pit lane. And unfortunately, Racing Team Netherlands, second place over all in LMP2 and leader of the Pro-Am, reported to the stewards for speeding in the pit lane. Oh dear, oh dear. That'll be a drive-through if it is actually that in. won't. Yep. If that was in, that's not Nick de Vries' first pit lane speeding penalty this season, I don't think. Oh dear, two minutes from the halfway mark. Um, Maybe wrong, but yes, yeah. and that will throw a cat about the pigeons. High class have sent Dennis Anderson out. Their pit stop was a 1 minute 38. That was a lot longer than you would expect, even with a driver change. It may just have been a slow driver change. Coming back to the racing team Netherlands, it's at 14.05, which was roughly the pit stop that Paul Lukšata had because he jumped in the car, they did a four lap splash. Remember, we spoke to De Vries, ah. and uh, then I think it was his first stop uh, under green that caused the problem. Great stuff at the moment in GTM, by the way, from Andrew Watson. He's putting in quicker laps than we've seen from that car uh, so far. The car third position, so it's Porsche, Ferrari, Aston Martin, Aston Martin, Porsche. Yeah, um, the top five in GTM. It is very even, Stevens. Have D Station had a podium in them yet? Uh, that's a change for WRT. Yeah, WRT, they're a 28 lap stint by Fernie Habsburg. Yeah. Now, everybody else is doing 26, and when I spoke to Phil Hansen this morning, he said 27 is a real stretch, yeah. but uh, 28. Now, there was an element of that full course yellow period yep. in there, so we need to see exactly how it extrapolates with everybody else, but. You know, when I said before the race, and you said, that's a stretch, the man who said 27 might be possible, yeah, 27 was tall, possible. Tall, but, gangly Austrian Royal. But the thing was that you had to slow down so much, your lap time yeah. loss was actually bigger than your strategy gain. Now, of course, they also came in just as the safety car was starting, so not only full course yellow, that, that fuel stop yeah. had a little safety car advantage. And there's the Racing Team Netherlands car trying to make up for time that will be lost with that penalty. Not only has he stretched that fuel stint, it's been with very, very good times indeed. Yeah. Better in that uh, top group only by the race leader in LMP2, Felipe Albuquerque, and the, the stint average is only within about a tenth. Also, you can start to crank up anarchy in the UK because uh, pole setter Charmy Lacey has just taken over that car, the Johnny Rotten look-alike of the paddock. Yeah. Oh, 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 28. Yeah. 28, 28. sorry. 38. Yeah, that's uh, Antonio Felix de Costa, slow coming through Curva Grande. Third place. Should he have heard Bot? Yes. He should have heard Box, Box, Box. Uh, 23 laps in. That was a 23. He's been on this stint for 23 laps now. They've done okay. 25 and 26 before. So I don't think it's related to that, unless they had a problem getting fuel in, but I would suggest unlikely. He's just learned that she kind of just gone straight through yeah. to stay out of everybody's way. He looks as if he's back up to speed again. He does. Ish. Ish. Yeah, he's on the racing line again. Yeah. Uh, no. Well, he's yeah, but he's speed. not a hypercar, so... This is the battle for second yep. position. This is the battle for second. And that's not going to help as of yet. He comes around. Now, now, actually, Antonio is back up to speed, so maybe he's... Control all deleting his way through the Roger. But again, you know, when the car goes blur, that's always a worry. Is this a script anybody would have written before the six hours of Monza started? Oh, Antonio's staying out of the way there. Franck Mayer, maybe the team on the radio going, let him go, let him go. No, there's something going on and off here because yeah. he's got speed at different points. Yeah. And there it stopped in the middle of the corner. Yeah. Yeah. This is the script we'd have seen uh, before this race with. Frank Meyer, a man who has not raced in a non Le Mans WC race since 2012, the very first year, battling for second position overall against, well, it has to be said, the most mature, the most developed uh, car in the prototype field. Yep, absolutely right. This is closing right up again. Traffic didn't hold him up there either. Ooh, and somebody's been bouncing across the gravel. Who is right in front of them? 
92 Porsche going slowly. Uh, well, compared to them, that's they've blown by him. How much of a lead did 92 have over James Collado? Nine tenths at the line, right behind them. There's the Porsche, there's the Ferrari, top left of your screen in his 28. They'll push it straight back in the garage. And Louis Beckett, oh, possibly it. not the best time to stop for a cup of tea. Not while the fuel's going in. The man in control of the pit stops knows exactly what the rules are. The dolly went under the other side. Yeah, saw that. Second place, 36 Alpine. Third place, the 709. Glickenhaus Racing, SCG 007. This is what Jim Glickenhaus was dreaming of, battling yep. for real positions yep. in World Championship races. Absolutely right. Leader is in from, no, you know, Race Team Netherlands in from second place in LMP2. So two of our top four in LMP2 in the garage for different reasons. 28 with an unspecified, you've got to sense, electronics issue. And 29, uh, 38 rather in, and 29 in for a drive-through penalty for speeding in the pit lane. They have come and should have gone by now. And I think that's a stop for them. I think the, it might well be. Penalty. Into Europol in with Renga van der Zander. Sean Galeel in at Jota as well for regular service. I think there's a driver change at into Europol. So that may be, may well be Kubish Makovsky, not Gamaziak, getting into the car. Traffic here for the Alpine. Is this the chance that Frank Mayer is looking for? It's the 56 car. Oh, it is, but he's going to have to thread the eye of the needle. He gains there on the 36 of Mathieu Vazivier. Vazivier is going to defend this like his life depended on it, and he blocks. The uh, Glickenhaus in behind are GTE AM leader, Alessia Rivera. This is cracking stuff now. Oh, fantastic stuff. I'll tell you what, that Glickenhaus has got some serious straight line speed in comparison to the Alpine ahead of it. Twin turbo V8, essentially two 600 horsepower rally cross engines on a common crankshaft and restricted to barely the output of one rally cross engine. This Pipo Motor engine. Jim Glickenhaus says he's comfortably capable of producing a thousand great horsepower in race trip and surviving. Great to see an effort like this producing real performance. Mm. And exactly what, if you like, the other side of the hypercar debate needs. It's not just about the big factories. You can come and compete. Here's a question for you, Graham. When was the last time a US team finished on a world endurance podium? Overall. Alan McNish puts his hands right back down after going, yeah! Oh, no, hang on. Uh, Alpine's endurance. in the pits. Alpine's in the pits. Click up now. to second, second house. Nico Lapierre will take over the wheel, says Louise Beckett. Fritz van Aert is out on the track in the racing team Netherlands car as well. Yep. So that was a pit stop, so they still need to do their drive-through then. If they get it, they haven't. Uh, I don't think it's been adjudicated yet. Or thought it ah, being investigated, yeah. was it? Yeah, okay. Normally, yeah. A, normally you're back to right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a exactly. pure number. Tom Blanco is taking over 28, 38 still in the garage. Risi Competizione, Felipe Massa has left the pit lane in that red car. And Miro Konopka stops in the ARC Bratislava car. Now, whether he's going to double stint now or hand over to his son Matei. We will find out in a moment. United are in, uh, or have been and gone. Fabio Scherer rejoins in the lead of LMP2 for United Autosports, ahead of Fritz van Aert and Charles Milesi, the man who put Team WRT on pole for this race, as the Glickenhaus runs second. Red and white cars are at the front of the field. They are not both from Cologne. No, red and white, second to white and red. And here comes the Alpine Blue. Out Nico Lapierre at the wheel of the 36 as Mathieu Vazivier explains this is what I was doing, this is what he was doing. I was disappointed with myself. And so that was a battle. That was a battle. I that was great to see. Don't think there's anything to be disappointed about no. at all. <laughs> it gave it everything. It's, it's great stuff. And yes, the safety car helped this. No doubt about that whatsoever. Don't care, it's racing. It's racing. That's what happens in racing. The... There's your race leader, Pachito towards the end of his second stint. Great view there when you see the car from a lower angle of how far through this Toyota you can see. It's essentially 
had, it kind of looks a little bit like an inter car where you've got a Formula One tub in the middle, some wheels on the outside and bodywork, and this enormous channel right through the middle. But it is Toyota that lead at the midway point here in the first ever World Endurance Race in Monza. Monza, what a place to come and what a place to finally bring fans back as we started the six hours. Round three of the FIA World Endurance Championship under bright blue skies in gorgeous summer temperatures here in the shadow of the Alps, close to the Italian lakes, just outside the metropolis of Milan. In the Royal Park, Toyota leading the field away, one, two after qualifying ahead of Alpine and the two Glickenhaus cars and the Alpine inserting itself between the Toyotas right at the very start as the LMP2 cars jockeyed for position. The blue of Alpine came through between the two Toyotas. Seven started on pole and led the race. Number eight, once he got up to speed and could deploy the hybrid drive, moving back into second position. Alpine would perhaps be left to battle for the final spot on the podium. In the GT classes, Honours even between a Porsche and Ferrari in GTE Pro. Nothing gained, nothing lost. But in the AM class, although Paul Sitter Ben Keating had the lead, he was under threat. Cheslar Racing with Ferrari being eased out of the way as the Project One Porsche moved up to second. Drama, though, for the leader in the second stint. Close to the end of it, Ben Keating would end up with a big puncher. First, uh, contact of the race between Alex Brundle and uh, Loic Duval, Brundle turning Loic around, and then the first full course yellow as Andrew Harianto backed the 88 Dempsey Proton Porsche into the gravel. Change in the battle for third place in GT Pro, the 91 Porsche moving up ahead of the Ferrari. And lots of battles, was always through the LMP2 field. Number 38, Jota Sport car coming up through the ranks. Cheslar losing their control and just about getting away with it. The 92 Porsche that led. Then drama for Toyota number eight. Fresh out of the pits, Brendan Hartley smoking through the first chicane with a drive problem, a braking problem. Turned out the left front corner was basically disintegrating and literally disintegrating the left front corner on Ben Keating's GT Pro leading car as he was on his way to the pits being ripped apart by the tyre, they have dropped well down the order. That brought out a safety car for Debris at the restart. Ferrari taking the lead in GTE Pro and elbowing the 92 Porsche off into the gravel. Recurring problems for 708, leaving that Glickenhaus dropping down the order. Leading in LMP2, United Autosports leading outright. Toyota Gazoo Racing number seven. Martin Haven, Graham Goodwill, Wynn and Alan McNish watching the action. Halfway through, Toyota have one dog left in the hunt, the other one completing mileage after numerous pit stops. Glickenhaus up to second, Alpine in third, United, Racing Team Netherlands and WRT, the top three in LMP2, with Racing Team Netherlands still leading the Pro-Am class. Then Porsche, Ferrari, Porsche, Ferrari in GTE Pro and AF Corsa's 83 car that started from the back of the field, leads in GTE and from Team Project One, with the D-Station and 98 Aston Martins about to take a position away from the Project One car, because that has pitted and they have yet to do so. Dramas for the 38 Jota Sport car that started at the back of the prototype field and worked its way right back into contention. That car in the garage with as yet unspecified issues and is dropping like a stone. I believe the uh, click in the house has now been passed by the number eight car. Let's catch up with Mathieu Vaxivier. He's been in a fantastic battle for second place with the Glickenhaus of Franck Bayer. He's now in the pits. Let's hear from him. He's with Louise Beckett. Mathieu Vaxivier bringing in the 36 Alpine and handing over to Nico Lapierre. Uh, it was great to see some battles out there, but it unfortunately didn't go your way. Yeah, I mean, uh, 
was okay for us. I mean, uh, we just uh, deliver our best. We try to to prove that uh, that we are here. And uh, but yeah, it was we struggled a bit compared to the Toyota for sure. We are a bit slower, and the temperature didn't help us as well. So I mean, we will do to do no mistake until the end of the race. This is our main target, and every time the same goal. And so for the moment, it's looking good. I think the team did, uh, did well during the strategy, during the pit stop when I was in the car. So I understood a little bit, I was following the race. <laughs> but uh, now it's good, so yeah, really looking forward to uh, where we can bring the, the car home. Uh, coming back to the team debriefing, what did you have to report back to them? Anything you can hand on to Nico? Ah, yeah, about tire degradation, um, how to manage the tire during this two stint. So yeah, this is the key. I will not tell you what, uh, which, which we are so far, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, I know that Nico have a lot of experience, you know what to do for sure, but uh, yeah, we try to help each other and also like some, for some advice. Andre uh, helped me on T1, like just to say, maybe try to, more in, uh, in the inside, it's, uh, it's better. So yeah, we try to help each other and uh, to be the best team together. Great, thank you. Thank you. So, Massio Vazavier there. Uh, hearing from Toto, by the way, the delayed number eight car will be running shorter stints now. That fuel pickup problem, um, not something that can be fixed here. So, probably that uh, would normally draw some of its advantage over this uh, 36 car. Uh, Alan will not have that advantage here, not alone, let alone the fact it's laps and laps behind with those three different problems. I think it's just an additional problem and headache for them. I don't think it'll have any impact on any result at this moment in time. The impact is going to what's happened and when the Glickenhaus that uh, currently on board with Nicolas Lapierre, he's chasing. Uh, Lapierre is currently coming out of Lesmo 2, whereas the Glickenhaus is coming into the second chicane. However, the Glickenhaus owes us one pit stop. Most certainly does. 141.0 for the lead car, the number seven uh, Toyota right now. 29 seconds to the good ahead of Frank Meyer in the 709 Glickenhaus SCG 007. Yes, the SCG 007 running second overall, a 139.403 last time around from the Frenchman. Nico Lapierre on 38.9 catching, uh, but a minute and 14 back, but as, uh, as Alan says, with that pit stop to come from the Glickenhaus. But this is looking very close between the second and third place cars. In uh, LMP2, United Autosports, Increasingly healthy lead now. Fabio Scherer, 32 seconds for the good now. Charles Malesi, though, is catching and will soon catch Fritz van Erd for second overall in LMP2. The racing team Netherlands come out, though, with a comfortable lead in the pro round class. Kubic Moski, 14 seconds back from Malesi in the Inter Europol competition car that's having a very good run indeed. And running fifth at the moment, the Richard Mill racing team, Tatiana Calderon. Big gap back from the Polish entered 34 car, but a very strong run indeed. 38 Jota, as I speak, is on its way out of pit lane with Ant Davidson after a near 13 minute stop for as yet a problem for that car. GT Pro continues to down out the entertainment. It is Neil Gianni, head of James Collado. That gap under a second still, as it seems to have been through the entire race. Yanni, he's got to grips with this round here. He sort of a bit of a fight at the beginning of this stint, managed to jump into the lead due to them being a little bit quicker, four seconds quicker than the Ferrari in the pit stop. However, he's been able to control it significantly more in line with what we know of Neil Yanni from the past when he was racing in LMP1 for Porsche. And uh, he's now, I think, got his head completely around this GTE Pro car. Now, they've, they've split the strategies for the, the two Porsches, but we shouldn't forget that after that safety car, they were nose to tail all four. And this lead pair, the number 92 Porsche, the 51 Ferrari, now, what, 11 seconds up the road from Ricard Leitz in the 91 Porsche. About two and a half seconds to the good from Daniel Serra. Martin Haven's Le Mans Joyride continues to circle. It's the 709 car now coming out from the pits. Roman Dumas comes to the race for the first time. Three lights now on the side of the 709 car. As Roman gets back up to speed. It's about late 10 seconds behind Lapierre at the moment. There's Lapierre coming through the second chicane. 
And Lapierre's been in quite a decent bit of traffic as well, but he's nearly through the majority of it. But uh, this traffic is what uh, we're going to see Roman Dumas coming up to. And then he'll have to fight his way through. So I think it's going to be probably more out towards the 15 seconds, the 12 seconds, 15 seconds by the time they do a couple of laps. Yeah, he was like struggling to get up to speed through the chicane that seemed to be now in the wake from the Jota car behind him. This will be a huge boost to get uh, the Scuderia Cameron Lake and House team. Uh, this car has run now for well over three hours with no problems. WRT, meanwhile, pushing. We're going to go down with Louise, who's got Ferdinand Habsburg with it in pit lane after a fantastic stint uh, from the 31 driver. Ferdinand Habsburg putting in a great performance, uh, bringing the car back in for WRT. How was your stint? Yeah, it was really good, I think. Um, got in the car, uh, went from second to first in the undercut, so I pushed a lot on the first couple laps which gave us the lead um, straight after the first pit stop. So that's really cool. Uh, then, unfortunately, in the safety car, we missed uh, a great opportunity to be far in the lead, which put us back down to P5, which is really disappointing. But uh, we're trying to can't get back up there now. Yeah, Charles Manessi's putting in a good performance as well now to get you back up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, hopefully I gave him a, a good feeling for the car on the radio and uh, mm. just to make sure he's confident, he's fast as he showed yesterday. So I'm sure we'll be able to get maybe up into the podium position again. How frustrating are those situations for you? Hey, missed opportunities are the worst. Uh, I'd rather make a big mistake than have that. But uh, I just got to keep it focused. We've, we've had a few errors here and there, but we're still so young and learning a lot. And, the most important thing is that we're super fast and that we're, we keep our chin high and the going gets hard. Thank you. Cheers. Well, their last pit stop, a minute 31, that had a driver change, yep. but uh, there was a driver change at United in a minute and 17 seconds. You can't be giving away 15, 16 seconds on the pit stop. Well, well that was, uh, that's not been a very good pit stop without question. Yep. So Charles Malaisi, it'll be interesting to see now just exactly what the pole setter can do. And uh, now through a little bunch of traffic, he's got a clear lap ahead of him now in the 31 car. And traffic makes a big difference. His last lap, a 42.4. Last lap for Fabio Scherer, who he's chasing, a 40.2. Yeah, 39 seconds is the gap. Remember that number? Hit lane. It's, yep, race leader. A minute and 39 seconds ahead of Nico Lapierre in the Alpine, the former Toyota driver. Driver change, yep. so Pachito is out. This is Kamui Kobayashi yep. getting aboard the car. It is indeed. And they've effectively got one bullet left in this car. Do you think they need it? Well, as we've seen so many times, you only actually need one car to win Le Mans. No matter how many you start with, one is the only number that you can win it with. But, well, you know, if the electronics are going squiffy on one car and bits are falling off it, they're made by the same people in the same place. Yeah. It's not like they're, they bought them and they're being run by different teams. So there's always that question mark, you know. Remember, we had uh, the brand new Toyota of the pair one that hadn't got the miles on it. All sorts of troubles. The only race of the season. 20 seconds added to the next pit stop, car 82. Ooh. That is not respecting the emergency pit stop under safety car. That means that presumably they've taken the... They that's a risky competency only car. They, they did a full a, stop. A full fuel, yeah. Now, there's, there's a very similar set of regulations in uh, IMSA racing in North America that they will be familiar with, that if the pit lane is closed, you can come in and you can take on a specified minimum, maximum amount of fuel. Um, now, they're not the only ones. Mira Konopka had five seconds added to his pit stop when he had it over San Mate for continually getting the Roger wrong and getting coming back off getting the Roger wrong wrong as well. Right through penalty for Racing Team Netherland. Ah, third place in LMP2 overall, and the leaders in the LMP2 Pro Am, Ritz van Aert, will have to serve a drive through penalty for speeding in the pit lane from that car. That won't, as of yet, cost them the lead in Pro Am. It's not going to help, though, is it? It's not going to help. 
Charles Malaisi, meanwhile, is now matching Fabio Scherer's times in the 40s. Nico Lapierre may well gesture there at uh, the racing dame's Ferrari, but what on earth was she supposed to do? She had to take the racing line. The fact that he was trying to squeeze up the inside, neither here nor there. There is the racing team Netherlands car. Kamu Kobayashi has left the pit lane. You saw Ben Hanley handing over to Juan Pablo Montoya. You didn't see the handover. You saw Juan Pablo in the car at dragon speed. Sorted himself out in the seat. Jackson Evans, former Porsche junior driver. And Porsche Mobile One Super Cup competitor. He is out in the 77 Dempsey Proton car. Just to uh, mark the moment that uh, Tom Gamble in the GR Racing, the Golf Racing car, uh, leads the LMP, sorry, the GT AE AM class at the moment. Uh, fast laps coming, that uh, will be towards the end of his stint. I'm sure we're going to see him down pit lane. He heads a train of three AF Corsa Ferraris. Alessio Rivera, Tony Valanda, welcome back to the World Endurance Championship, Tony, and Thomas Fleur in the 83, 61, and 54 cars, respectively. Well, as everybody goes noisily past the pits, catch up with Louise Beckett. Louise, you were saying, as we watch the 28 Jota Sport car battling for positions, 38 has got a slightly longer problem than he might have thought. Yeah, we saw Antonio de Costa bring it back in. Uh, there's a misfire issue. The team sent it back out, thought they had it sorted, and right now it's just pulled up in front of me. They've got the dollies ready, so they expected they had to bring it back in, and that looks like what's happening. Thank you, Lou. Well, what was looking like a very good race for both of the Jota Sport cars as 29 takes a drive through. That's racing team Netherlands, Fritz van Aert. Uh, the lead Jota car, 28, the healthy car, Tom Blomquist at the wheel has just stopped. That car is in seventh. And the 38 car dropping back into the pit lane and Davidson at the wheel. Their last stop was nearly 13 minutes. And that has not apparently cured all the issues with that 38 car. Race leader is still the number seven, Toyota Gazoo Racing, 0-10. Don't call it, call it an Olo. Kimu Kobayashi has just taken that car over as they cycled through their drivers from Pachito Lopez. And the gap came down from a minute and 39 to 16 seconds over Nico Lapierre. Of course, that's the factor of being stationary in the pit lane, going in and out through the pit lane. In GTE Pro, Neil Jani, currently leading for Porsche ahead of James Collado and Richard Leitz. And the battle hasn't exactly died down much. It's only 1.4 seconds between them. Tom Gamble for GR at the top in GTE AM. Now, it's the first time in a long while we've been able to say that, ahead of Alessio Rivera, Tony Vlander, and Thomas Flores. as uh, you documented just a moment or two ago, Graham. And does that mean the GR car is completely out of kilter. There's only one of our cars behind it that has had four pit stops, and that was the AF Corsa 83 car. Uh, 86 is coming towards the end of its stints. Uh, Leslie Rivera is just three laps into a stint. Ah, they... uh, Tony Valanda's got another 10 laps or so to go, and the 54 car, another 10 laps to go. So yeah. this is, this is going to see the 86 car drop back into that pack. And which was the other car with them then? D-Station, wasn't it? That didn't do that first full course yellow pit stop. I think there was only two AM cars that didn't. What you effectively got is a group there of about five cars that are yeah. battling away within about 30 seconds. Yeah. Louis says it was the 85 Iron Lynx car. I may well be right. And there is the 85 Iron Lynx car, the Iron Dames. The racing to Netherlands pit stop underway. So Fritz served the drive through, then came back in on the next lap to do the driver change. That may be a short stint, but that might be the end of his drive time. 11 laps. Toyota number eight, which is not on page one of the timing screen, and you're not going to hear me say that very often Indeed. in this or any other planet is back in the pit lane. That could be a standard race. They've gone ahead of Gustavo Menezes in the 708 Lickenhouse. And the 60 Iron Lynx car is back in as well. It is going to be a standard, if shorter, stint, as we were hearing from Toyota, for the number eight car. Send the 
the pits there, though. But at the same time, you were saying about Fritz van Aert, the minimum driver time in LMP2 is 1 hour 15 minutes. He's now done 1 hour 18 minutes. There you go. And so, therefore, he's uh, completed his minimum driving time. This will not be a routine stop for the number eight. They are going to replace some parts on the fuel system of the eight. It will be what is described by mm -hmm. Toyota as a long stop. Yeah. So, so may not see that for uh, time for Luis to pop down, have a cup of tea on the way at Jota and continue to Toyota. <laughs> what, what then we... Uh, I completely lost my train of thought. Uh, uh, while, you, while you're regaining that, just, oh, uh, just, just mark the fact that it's about 13 seconds apart for that second place battle between the Alpine of Nico Lapierre and Romain Dumas in the 709 uh, Glickenhaus. Uh, Lapierre just 15 seconds back from the leading Toyota. But Nicolas Lapierre and Roman Dumas battling for a place. Yep. Uh, Roman Dumas, last time he was on a podium in the WC was when he won at Le Mans in 2016. Yep. Roman. Roman. Overall podium. Yep. Uh, I was having a the last healthy running car thought, which is Felipe Fraga in the 33 Four Horsemen TF Sport Aston, of course. It's healthy now, but it was yes. very unhealthy when it lost all the time when it was in the battle for the lead. Ben Barker now at the wheel of the GR Racing Porsche. That has stopped and started off again. Driver change there, but that has dropped them back down to sixth in GTEM. They are on a very different fuel schedule, so they'll now be trying to work out whether that works, doesn't work when they have the short fuel, whether they have to go splash and dash at the end. Alessio Rivera is back in the lead of GTE Am in the Chrome AF Corsa Racing Ferrari that started last on the grid. with the 92 and the 51 still battling away. This is the, well, race-long battle for supremacy in the GTE Pro class. And it's a great display at the moment from Neil Janney. He's seeing off at the moment the challenge of James Gallardo. That, back, uh, that gap still under a single second. They're 13 and a half seconds ahead now of Ricard Leitz. Yeah, GTE Pro battle really giving here where it kind of withered on the vine very quickly in the heat on Portimao. Let's catch up at United Autosports with Felipe Albuquerque. Felipe Albuquerque, another strong performance from the 22 United. Yeah, uh, things so far are really, really well. I was uh, panicking with that safety car, uh, came right on the point that was not suiting us. So luckily, it seems like uh, Team WRT did manage really well the, what's going on. So I was really surprised that we are leading now. Uh, and it, it, it's it's a nice race going on for our side, but uh, as we can see, anything can change any second. But I'm super happy with the car. The car is good. So let's just now flow. And another thing that I was understanding is just like you need to be lucky to not get cars that they are scary because you can put a bunch of good lap times and then you get like a slow GTM. In Ascari, you lose straight away two, three seconds, and there is nothing you can do. We are a little bit, you know, luck or unlucky about those corners, but it's what it is. So I just hope that I get the two good stints in the end. Okay, thank you. We won't see you at the end. Thank you very much. We often think, Leon, you know, but you know, the, the, the three chicanes here. Retfilio, the Roger, but it is Ascari that is the longest and, and potentially the most damaging when you catch slower cars. Absolutely, it's clear there, and this is, this is that change with these regulations this year. Traffic is a bigger challenge, but you've got to manage it. That's now part of the game. This, by the way, Martin, is a bit of a battle. Ninth overall, sixth in LMP2. Dennis Anderson, bronze driver in the number 20 high-class racing team, 
uh, trying to fend off the close attentions of the less delayed of the two Jota Sport cars. Tom Blomqvist it is, but he's struggling there as we've got the uh, WRT car of Charles Malaisi catching them to put a lap on this battle. Yeah. Um, hoving up behind at a fair old rate. That's sort of almost a scandy battle, isn't it? Dennis Anderson is a Dane. Tom Blomqvist's dad, Stig, was, uh, is a Swede. Tom is a, is a, a British licence holder. Good stuff in LMP2 through this, but yep. uh, with some misfortune for them, some of these teams, the strategy has thrown, I think, a couple of these teams off kilter a little. And is this going to delay Sharma Lazy? Because this is something of a spirited battle. He needs to find clear air to try to close the gap on Fabio Scherer, who, by the way, is driving very well indeed. Laps in the 140s. Hang on a minute, where's Roman Duma in 709? This is very interesting. Roman Duma lighting up the timing screen life. It's hyperpole, purple sector one, purple sector two, which means for the uninitiated, the fastest sectors of the entire race for anybody in any car. Fastest lap of the race at the moment goes to Mike Conway uh, in the number seven car, 137.158. That came on lap six. We're now on lap 119. How hey. close on either side of that mark is Roman Dumas going to be? Formula One with your sprint race. Hold my beer. Absolutely. Since World Endurance. Here we go. R Roman Dumas, by the way, who will start his 21st consecutive Le Mans 24 hours this year, he has not missed Le Mans in this century. Got held up in the final sector. It wasn't the best. 137.265, the quickest lap for that car. But here comes Charles Milesi putting a lap on this battle. Has he got the overlap on Dennis Anderson on the inside? He does. Can he get by? He nope. can't, but he jumps Tom Blomqvist. And that's a momentary respite for Dennis Anderson in the number 20 high-class car. But Milesi goes the long way around the outside in Curva Grande, Biasone. I'll add into this, by the way, uh, as we're watching this spirited LMP2 battle, second and third place cars are catching the leader. Without a doubt, they are catching the leader. It's 14 seconds the leader now. They're taking about a second out of that. It is under tw it's 27 seconds for the top three now. This is not done. There is no rest here whatsoever <laughs> for Toyota. They're going to have to push. They really are, aren't they? And, uh, that, I mean, that's the case in all of these classes. GT Pro, if you blink, you've given away victory. And they're, they're, it's as simple as that. And here we go. There is the pass that Tom Blomqvist wanted. He worked hard enough. It's the persistence that gets it. That and the speed of the driver. He goes by the high-class racing entry. Good stuff from Dennis Anderson, though. This yep. is big progress for the Dennis Gentleman driver. Um, it's been a part of the high-class racing efforts since before their time in LMP2, back yep. into the Renault Sport Trophy yep. uh, years. And in uh, European Le Mans Series racing, there's Anne Davidson out of the Jota Sport car. That's degloving. That looks like that's the end of the riot road for 38. And you have to wonder if they've got ongoing issues. Did they help cause Antonio Felix da Costa's rally crossing, or what might it perhaps be the other way maybe. around, or were they totally unrelated? Here's our second, third place car now, Roma Duma in the Glickenhaus. And he's now in a big bunch of traffic. He's got the 21 LMP2 car not too far ahead of him. So that is being driven by Juan Pablo Montoya. Yep, and the 709 pushing on. We see the potential here of this situation, don't we? Well, there's no potential to beat anybody if you are sitting back and waiting. There's the top three on the map. Seven coming out of the Parabolica, 36 halfway down past the Privet Hedge, and exiting Ascari is the 709. That's third place fastest race lap for that car the second fastest lap of anybody in the race so far i think yes for roma duma 137 two uh against a 137 one for mike conway well over 100 laps ago not bad for an old boy <laughs> not bad for a rally driver part-time rally driver and occasional racer roma duma roma duma's history is extraordinary and it becomes more extraordinary when you see the variety of things he's doing in the later years of his career. And in between times, yes. Absolutely. Freed from the shackles of having to win races for major manufacturers, he can go out and win rallies for major manufacturers. Absolutely. That's it, end the road for 38. I mean, they're still working on the car, but uh, end of any hope of competition. 
But of course, if you don't find out what ails it, the next time you wheel it out of a truck in competition, it will be at the bomb. So you want to find out now. Oh dear, they have unplugged aircraft oh dear. Yeah. adapters. Uh, by the way, this is the fourth different class that uh, Roman Dumas competed in a WC race in. All right. LMP1, uh, LMP2, uh, GT Pro, and now Hypercar. Adding all the other things he's done in this astonishing career, and it would take us longer than the two hours and 22 minutes we've got left. <laughs> this is Nicola Lapierre, frankly, barely less accomplished. Yep. I think it will be his 13th consecutive Le Mans this year. 14 overall, I think that's correct. How many Philips he knows been to? A lot. Yeah. And remember, yeah. until last year, um, he was Mr. 100% in LMP2, but in multiple races at the Mon. Didn't yeah. manage to complete that sequence with Cool Racing last year. Now manages that team, but uh, does his professional driving at the top end in this single tech Alpine. Motion shot there of the rear tyre being dragged around as it goes over the kerb. And he's closing the door every yeah. time. Antonio, to Felix De Costa, yeah. and Davidson. That's the face and, uh, of disappointment. And, uh, yeah. and I expect more yeah. from this guy. Yeah. That's okay when I just push him off the track. And uh, yeah. Is he saying that being eased off the road by the yeah. WRT yeah. car yeah. was uh, yeah. the start of all the problems, or is he still just grimbling? Car, entirely sure. In the other garage of doom is yeah. the number eight Toyota. It's not been a very comfortable race for them either, 38 and the number eight. Listen, if you're going to have a bucket full of problems, take them at Monza and hope that they don't come back at, at Le Mans. And don't forget, this is a new car this season for Toyota and what they've carried over from the previous uh, LMP1 car is not the same this year. It's a very different hybrid system, very different set of mechanical and electronic demands, and so it is, you know, you say, well, they, they know an awful lot about what they were using. Yes, they do, but they obviously also have tried to advance things, and it hasn't necessarily been entirely straightforward for them. That yeah. was uh, Tatiana Calderon, you were just watching from the blimp coming out of with your airship coming out of the pit lane. After what felt like quite a long pit stop, but wasn't. It was a, it was a standard pit stop for the number one car. Yet the... Um, Not slow, just far away. Just far away. Um, the uh, hybrid tech for the Toyota this year, far closer to kind of road car yes. specification yep. than the space age amazingness of LMP1. Very, very, very much more so, and that's, that's to a very great degree, actually, what the road relevance is for Toyota of the Zero 10. And with road car componentry, possibly, also comes road car electronics, and to a degree, maybe a little bit of road car frailty, because road cars don't do this. They just don't take this pounding in such concerted time. Before Ferrari decides, I'll go to the racing line early, but not possibly quite as early. Francesco Castellacci, as Camille Kobayashi was hoping for there. Gap first to third continues to come down, and the gap from Roman Dumas uh, to Nicolas Lapierre under nine seconds now. He is catching the Alpine again. Yeah, 137.6, 137.8 last time round for Dumas. 137.8 for Duma, 138.2 for the leader, Kobayashi, 139.5 for second place, Nico Lapierre. So Duma is pushing the train from the back. He most certainly is. This could get very, very interesting as we get deeper and deeper into these stints. Uh, Neil Janney, meanwhile, is pulling away from James Gallardo a little. Over three seconds for good now. Dennis Anderson takes the number 20 high-class racing car to the pits from second in the Pro-Am class in LMP2. Juan Pablo Montoya is the next man behind in the Pro-Am entered cars. That coming not because uh, Juan Pablo is anything other than a professional, it becomes because Henrik Edman is a bronze-rated driver. Yep, one is part of the Pro part of the Pro-Am. You have to have a Pro and an Am to have a Pro-Am, at least. Number seven, our race leader, Kamui Kobayashi. Watching Kamui Kobayashi on the rear of the 83 car. That is the leader in GTM, Alessio Rivera, uh, ahead of uh, Tony Valandi. It's got 22 seconds.
get there. Further six seconds back to Ricardo Perra, who's got his mirrors full of the triple seven Aston Martin. Andrew Watson again putting in good times here. Yeah, Pressurising that car for a podium position. It's Andrew's second stint in that car, isn't it? He was looking very relaxed before the race got underway, so he, in fact, has just put in the fastest lap of the race for that car, 147.5, 148.3 for the third-place car for Ricardo Perra in front of him, uh, 149.5 for Tony Wielander, and 147.7 for the leader, Alessia Rivera. So, again, Andrew Watson is compressing the top four in AM from behind. If you can't get a ticket. Yeah, but, uh, well, you know, I, I prefer to let professionals drive. I'm not putting myself in an enormous great fan blade behind me and, and you know, a bed sheet above. God bless those who do. I swear that's for Aaron Miller. Just checking up on this. I was just checking, by the way, that D-Station racing car, Andrew Watson, doing great guns at the moment. Toshi Ishino has completed his bronze time in that car. I thought he had. So we've got, we've got Andrew Watson and uh, Tomo Fuji to the end here. That could be a car to watch. Yeah, that's got real podium potential for D-Station. And that will, of course, also run under the uh, TF Sport banner, just like the Four Horsemen car. I think the turquoise car you can see at the back of the group there. Indeed. The D-Station car is the black car with the green highlights as the tea bags arrive. Thank the heavens. No, I have to say, in, in, again, the second TMS um, test match, special me me mention of the entire race, that uh, nobody comes in with cake or... Well, cake we do get, no pork pie, though. Yep. So if you're thinking of sending cake, uh, you can send it courtesy of me, Graham Goodwin, at my home. I'll make sure it gets the rest of them. <laughs> you carry it around safely in your pouch. Yes. Indeed. There's the 61 Air of course, of Ferrari, started by Christoph Ulrich. Simon Mann uh, drove it in the second. Uh, he, well, he's had. Have a look. I think maybe a double, because Tony Vland has not been in overly long. So, Simon Mann has done 67 minutes at the moment at the wheel of the car. So, but do we think Simon's bronze rated, isn't he? I'm going, have to, I'm going to have to have a look at my list. Talk amongst yourselves as we watch the 83 car that leaves. Have you, you found it already, haven't you? Uh, no, I've not. It's silver. Just... Tony Wielander is platinum. It's Christoph Ulrich that's the bronze driver. Okay. I thought he probably was. Um, news directly, and um, thank you for this, Jim, uh, from Jim Glickenhaus. Uh, the oh, 708 car is retired. Ah. Uh, it's a gearbox failure on that car. Um, so... That oh. is our first retirement of the race. First confirmed retirement. Yeah. But uh, a... a fine fight from the two-car effort, but uh, that shouldn't get away from the fact there's still one car in the fight, and fighting it is. It is yep. still the quickest car on the circuit. 137.813 plays 137.889. 9.1 seconds back from Nicolas Lapierre, and still the gap to the Toyota from the third-place car is coming down. It's 24 and a half seconds now. Francois, Francois Perodo. Yeah, crossing his things. I don't think he's finished his driving, actually. I think Francois might have another stint to do. I may be wrong. wrong. On board with uh, Inter Europol competition, what happens here? He makes it safely through. Francois's done for the day. Oh, is he? Okay. Yes, he is. That's why he's looking so relaxed. Uh, there was a up. change of position, by the way, in GTEM. The moment we cut away from him, D Station moved up to third because the Air of Corsa car 61 of Tony Vlander came in for a routine pit stop. Charles Malaisi has stopped for WRT as well. Remains third, yep. has been, in, been through the pits. Of course, they're on a very different fuel schedule to everybody else because they were in the pit lane when the safety car came out. Lots of fun and games going on here in uh, GTM. Oh, there's that, that was the Porsche blowing yep. the chicane. That's GT Pro lead battle. Uh, a third place battle, I beg your pardon. That's 91 still, isn't it, with the damage on the front? Uh, no, 92 sort of damage on the front. 91 with the clean front. No, it's right, 91, 91 that has the damage yep. on the front. I was right the first time on the head. Um, looking at the pace of Ben Barker in the GR Racing car. Remember that car led yep. on the pit stop cycle. He's beginning to make inroads into the cars ahead. That car running in fifth and looking set for a good finishing position. And that's very out of kilter with everybody else. That's only going to unwind or not towards the end of the race because in an early full course yellow that was caused by 
Andrew Harrianto spinning the Dempsey Proton 88 car. They were one of two teams in AM that did not stop for a top up with fuel. Now, everybody in the GT class believed that you would not get an entire race in complete stints. There would be a splash and dash at the end. We've had two full course yellows and a safety car. It's going to be closer. I will say about the GR racing car, Mike Wayne, Mike, their bronze driver does have to get in and do about another 20 minutes. Yeah. Standing by for driver change. Jimmy Bruni of this parish, close approximation to. Instantly gives up that third position, of course. Yep. Again, as we said in pro, if you blink, you lose. Takes the joke on that. <laughs> Felipe Nazza in the pits uh, for Risa Competizione. That car now in 10th place in LMP2. And that's uh, at the end of a double stint. I think that'll be a driver change. Driver change going on. You see Richard Leitz with the Austrian colours. Jimmy Bruni with a slightly less evident tricolour of Italy on his helmet. It's been an intriguing battle, hasn't it, in GT Pro? Yeah. I think we've got every potential for a grandstand finish of the overall here. Well, you could have a Ferrari 1-2, you could have a Porsche 1-2, and when we're in Portimao, and even really in Spa, Porsche didn't come to the races. They came to qualifying in free practice, but they didn't have what it took over a long distance, and whatever changed about the car between last year and this, they seem whether it's a factor of the track or the temperature or, or their work behind the scenes between the races, they seem to have got on, tire, on top of their tyre wear issues. GT Pro, GTM, Andrew Watson is on the rear end of the second place car now. Team Project 1's 56 car, it is less than a second the gap there, so it's been a stellar spell from the triple seven car as Roman Dumas decides Go time. Okay, purple again, and uh, talking of Porsche drivers, here is Neil Charney in the pit lane. Dumas currently not racing a Porsche. He's in the uh, out in the Glicken house, but a former Porsche driver and current Porsche rally driver, Ken e Kevin Est, gets back in. Didn't have the crushing dominance in qualifying that we saw in Portimao and in Spa, but he was the quickest man in qualifying to take pole for the 92 Porsche. And in from third comes Daniel Serra, and that's the end of a double as well. Driver change there too. Don't tune away from this. Only two hours to go. And many of the same battles, as close as they were, as we were talking about at this point an hour ago. Talking to a camera crew from Goodyear earlier on, before the race got underway, and they're saying, who's your money on for LMP? Just, you are joking, right? Who's going to win this? I said, I couldn't even tell you who's going to win outright. I know who I think is probably safe money, yep. but I'm afraid to say I would possibly put it on the number eight, because if seven and eight were together, there's a very good chance that eight might have come out on top. However, fate has not smiled on me. 52, tyre changes there as well. 28 car comes out right in front of the WRT car. 22, United Autosports, Fabio Scherer, after a great stint. The Swiss driver comes in from the lead of LMP2 with, well, it's a comfortable gap less this stop. Just about to say, James Collado, the leader in GG Pro, yet to stop, here he comes. So he comes in after the others have stopped. So they've all stopped before him because he was the leader on the road. And he will hand over to, yes, this is all the preparation of getting out of the car, isn't it? To hand over to Alessandro Pierre Guidi. Things are going to be should be safe on camera. Tom Blomqvist back in the pits and got through for Jota, so that was fuel only for Blomqvist. Fabio Scherer stays in at United, so is that him? Uh, that's well, a double, isn't that's it? That's going on yep, to a double. double. Yeah. Uh, yes, WRT Charmelacy is in second. Paul Chatin third for Racing Team Netherlands in LMP2. And the final of our GT Pro pit stops. I think that means that Collado and Pierre Guidi have got a lap on the field. Whether that actually matters at the end or not, in terms of fuel, they've come in a lap later. But, uh, they all still have track position, and that's the key. Also in, the 36 from second place. That puts Roman Dumas instantly up into second place. The gap to the lead now, 24.3 seconds. And again, last time around, he was quicker than Kamui Kobayashi. Not a lot quicker, but quicker. Uh, yes. OK, 
could be very entertaining. Couldn't it just? Could be very entertaining. Two hours time, we might very possibly. Who knows? I, I don't even want to think. I about... know. from Louise Beckett that we have a second, possibly a third retirement. Uh, 708 we know has been retired. The 60 um, Iron Lynx Ferrari, they have parked again and 38 from Jota we're probably not going to see again uh, until the end of the race. That comes the number 36 car, still in the hands of Nicolas Lapierre. There is the second place to Glickenhaus. And that car uh, just 21 laps into what's been around a 30 lap stint for this car, so plenty of time before we see the Glickenhaus back on pit road again. 23 seconds took. What was that? A full a second and a half out of the lead last time around, Romain Dumas. That's the uh, real team racing car of Loic Duval dive bombing the Ferrari and not finding the room he needed to get through on the inside. So he uh, runs across the kerbs. Actually, that is gaining advantage by exceeding track limits, so hopefully he gave that back after the corner, otherwise somebody will force him to later. Here's our overall lineup with two hours and seven minutes remaining. Toyota lead from Glickenhaus and Alpine. In, double, in LMP2, United from Team WRT and Team Netherlands. In GTE Pro, 92 Porsche lead a pair of Ferraris. And in GTE Am, AF Corsa's 83 Ferrari leads from the fast closing Andrew Watson for D Station. The team project one making it three different brands in the top three. It's been a pretty blinding stint here by Roman Duma actually, because he's averaged over the 22 laps so far a 1 minute 38.3. And Mike Conway's first stint from the green, and remember there was no traffic at the beginning of that stint because, well, basically he was leading. And it was a 138.044. So it's been a very, very good stint by Dumas. Since he got in, OK, he got in, it's slightly cooler now and tire, everything else. But uh, they've still been able to consistently de deliver lap time through traffic. And at the moment, he's got a bit of a clear run for probably the next two laps as well. And that's hugely encouraging, isn't it? Because this car has effectively done a bit of testing. It's run in competition up the hill at Goodwood at the Festival of Speed last weekend. This is its first race. Portimao. I thought I was 708. I thought yeah, this chassis didn't do it. Okay. <coughs> I'm talking about the, the No, team I know, but it's a, it's a new it's a newer build, so this is its first proper test of, of fire. So, you know, the reliability is the key issue here. Clearly the car has got pace. It's not very far away from Toyota in quote Le Mans trim. And what it really needs is to be able to still be going at three o'clock on Sunday afternoon with that kind of pace and, and nothing intervening in the way. Because that's the only way you're going to win them on against Toyota, is by having no problems, zero, none, not a one, ladder, nothing. I think there at the moment, certainly the characteristic of the circuit, as soon as the grip starts to go down, they seem to get a little bit stronger, it appears. Uh, they seem to be a little bit stronger in this section of circuit as well, being the very low speed chicanes and then pulling out through the Lesmo 1 and Lesmo 2. And interesting to see how it definitely develops through the course of now and also leading towards the testing towards Le Mans. The Alpine is going to have the same problem at Le Mans that it has here. Its fuel tank doesn't allow it to run as long as the others do, which means it spends more time stationary. Yeah, the one difference at Le Mans, we have to wait and see how it stands out, that because it's such a long lap, yeah. it may be that it can just creep onto the same lap. So, for example, do 10.1 laps, instead of doing 10.9 and not being able to do the 11th, is a bit of a waste of time in reality. Exactly. That means you're stuck at the side of the track. 21 seconds, and it's now the gap as Roman Dumas continues to close down on the Toyota. A bit of a discussion there about how to drop the car down and get it on its way so a little pit stop work still being worked out within the team. Jim Flickenhouse obviously pretty happy with the way things are going. I should think so. I, I expect some spirited information from uh, Jim. Close <laughs> race. 
But, you know, let's hope that the car is still running reliably and quickly at the flag as well, because an overall podium here with two Toyotas starting the race is a big result, both for him and for Alpine as well. One of the things that will endear this car to the fan base for the Le Mans 24 hours, although I'm sure Alan will add in that there's some concerns about it, it's filthy. Yep. It's absolutely filthy. Yeah. Like a dirty it looks good on pictures, but uh, from a technical point of view, then dirt means it's losing stuff everywhere. Well, talking about losing stuff everywhere, number seven Toyota is currently our race leader by under 20 seconds. The number eight car, though, has been the problem child. Let's hear from Toyota's Rob Loypen. Rob Loypen, we're back here again. It's not been the day for the number eight Toyota. Tell us what the issue is, what they're dealing with now. It is definitely not their day. Uh, we are looking at uh, the fuel pressure, which has been an issue uh, after Brendan jumped into the car. Uh, we have changed the fuel collector. That means that everything has been taken apart around the fuel tank. And uh, yeah, we hope to repair it soon and then go out again. So there's been two or three separate issues now today. We have had uh, two issues. The first one is uh, the one related to the fuel pressure, uh, which, as Brendan jumped into the car, was created there by settings. Uh, so this has uh, went, this went on until uh, now. And the other one, uh, we have to investigate this. It was when uh, Brendan went wide in, uh, in the chicane. So these are two separate issues. The other one, we had changed the front left corner, uh, which went OK. Uh, and now, yeah, looking into this situation, and as it's the race before Le Mans, you would like to do everything to let, let this happen there. Of course, um, you're going to get the car back out. Uh, yes. But what does that leave you in terms of points? I would have to check, so I don't know where we are at the present moment. Uh, we say in the uh, LMH class we are position five, I think. I don't know what the 308 is, or the 708 or Clickenhaus is doing. Um, so I would like to, I would have to check this. It's what will be expected for today. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, and they've got to complete a certain distance to be able to be active to participate for points and that's going to be the key thing not necessarily whether they get out again in time but let's go to Kobayashi leading the race no problems for them the key thing for the number eight car is covering at the minimum distance to score points. Yep. We are two hours uh, remaining. We are now on lap 136, half of which again takes us to lap 202, potentially. So what's 75% of that? That's 75 the five percent of the problem. Is. A race percent of 100 is 75, 75. so it's 150. What? Okay. Yeah. It's, 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 yes. Um, Let's, OK, so how many laps are they behind? They are currently only 35 laps behind. So if they don't lose any more time, if they rejoin now, they comfortably make it. And they, by the way, would not fall slower than the fourth because the seven or eight is routine. But they can't afford to lose more than another 15 laps before the end of the race. Or, or, or give or take. So actually, that's not a lot of time. That's 20 minutes more stationary in the entire race, and they could potentially not score points at all. And more to the point in that uh, bargain, they can't play with that gap with the lead car because he's under pressure. Yeah. Well, and also, he can't really give away 10 laps because otherwise an LMP2 car will win it. Got a good battle on our hands here. Messier Rivera yep. leading the GTE AM class as through the lap on that uh, car. Comes another seven car. Andrew Watson in the D station, Aston Martin in second place, 30 seconds behind. Yep. Fastest lap of the race for Ben Barker in GR's Porsche. That's in fifth place. Fastest lap of the race for Alessio Picariello in the Dempsey Proton 88 car. Are Porsche coming back into it a little more as the temperature drops a bit? Uh, Picariello is having a good spell here. A little way down the field, he's in 10th position in that GTM class, but there's been plenty of fastest laps from that car in this spell. There is Andrew Watson in the 57 car. It's been a great spell from him. And it will be, as I say, between him and Tony Fuji to finish this race. They're looking very good 
for a very good result here. Can he catch Rivera? I'm not sure about that. Uh, we've got almost two hours to go. It's 31 seconds is the gap. But uh, with a bit of help, you never do know, do you? Gap for the lead overall as we take a look at the third place card. This is Ricardo Pera, 2.4 seconds back. Trouble for the oh, seven. Oh, the trouble. race leader in trouble. Number seven car, very slow for Kamui Kobayashi. Very, very it's stopping. slow. It's stopping. This car's stopping. That's 24 laps into the stint, and the leader is stopped. And just gone by him was Roman Dumas, who does not go off laughing, but takes the lead of the race for Glickenhaus. That Toyota, unless they are very lucky, is not getting back to the pit lane. Brendan Hartley managed to crawl the car back all the way through. Oh, my goodness. You stop on the side and you for a cycle, for a cycle. Stop on the side for a cycle. Right, they've got lights. Lights are on. Who's home? Can he get it to fire up? Yes, yes he can. There you go. All the way through again. Lots of control. Or just stop weaving. There's fast cars coming. Yeah, but how far down has he dropped here? 36 seconds at the moment at this is sector line as yeah. now the Glickenhaus has gone through the first chicane, so yeah. effectively half a lap yeah. is the distance. Glickenhaus leads at Monza with the 709 of Roman Dumas. They oh, was a pit stop fairly soon, but uh, Nico Lapierre is going to be close now to the number seven. 709 will be coming in yeah. any time now. Toyota scramble to the pit apron as you would expect. No, it goes through. Yeah. Error He's message reported on the steering wheel, which then he had to do the power cycle. Now, in this situation, then, usually it is something to do with the hybrid and the boost and yep. that sort of profile structure. Now, I would suspect with the previous problem as well of the eight, when uh, they had the situation for Brendan Hartley, then they're a little bit hypersensitive about it, but uh, not going as according to plan as it did in Portimao or in Spa, for Toyota. A two minutes and 39 lap, a full minute lost there by the uh, the Toyota, and that's a minute he can't afford to lose. Uh, only a minute lost, though, by the Toyota. Don't forget the the, 80, uh, the number eight car is is 25 laps lost already. Well, Roman Dumas leads now by 41 seconds. So here is your race leader. Where's that camera that's been on the pit wall next to Jim Glickenhaus? Because there will have been spontaneous combustion. Okay. Here he comes yeah. for his fuel stop. So it's a brief lead over Toyota, but the race is not over. 29 laps on that stint for the 709 car. I should see if the Toyota stays out. He's got a cucumber, isn't he? He can stay out. The Toyota's got about another five, six laps to go in the stint. However, the Glickenhaus always will have to stop earlier. It can do less laps on its tank of fuel than the Toyota can. Adjusting the mirrors there as well for the driver because he knows he's going to have a Toyota behind him in a few laps' time because, of course, when the Toyota does have to stop for fuel, it will drop back behind the Glickenhaus again. So Roman Duma wants all the weapons in his armory. So Toyota goes through to lead again. Oh, it's got... It's going down into the pits. If yeah. you look there, the, the, this car is going into no. the box as well. Trolleys are underneath it. Look. Trolleys are ready. Brakes. It's Change brakes. The brakes, OK. Louise Beckett's down in the pits, just shouted up. Brakes are going to be changed. We spoke about the amount of dirt on those elephant foot louvers that are just directly behind the front wheels. That was from very early on in this race. Yeah. And the front brakes are the ones that are taking the real hit round here. Drama galore. Never, yeah. never seen this car from so high above. Looks like a Lola T70 from above. That's yeah. what it looks like. Now, Alpine, I have to tell back you, in the game. Yep. this absolutely 100% puts the 36 right into the game for a potential win here. Yeah, but let's look towards the end of the race because of the fuel stop lens. This Alpine has got uh, two stops and a splash. Actually, sorry, apologies, two stints to go. It's, got, it's actually clear. It's clear to go through with the same number of uh, stops as Kobayashi. So it's a 31-second gap from Kobayashi to Nico Lapierre. It is all going crazy in GTEM as well. This is expected to be a 10-minute stop, potentially, for the Glickenhaus. This That's is going to be rough for them. It's going to be rough for them, but it's also going to be rough when you look towards the big picture of Le Mans, because if in a six-hour race you're actually changing brakes after four hours, 
then you can do the simple maths and extrapolate out. Even though Le Mans is different in terms of its cooling capacity and everything else, it still suggests that they need to work a lot on this. And this car is homologated to a great extent as well. So something in that brake material needs a lot of looking at. Uh, Kamui Kobayashi back in front. Sorry, you can't change the brake material because it takes about six months for a manufacturer to be able to press a new set of discs and pads to be able to go through. So it's not as if you could suddenly just pull a different change one. Brand. You could go to a changed brand, but the cost in that is huge. And also the way that everything is designed around and about the characteristics of your disc and pad. Can you, in a hypercar, change your manufacturer? Or is it part of the homologation? It used to be with LMP2. I remember the uh, points we had for the, the issues with, with brake discs. Can you? Yeah, I think if, you, if it's under a safety point, you can do basically anything. So in this respect, we clearly know that brakes are a performance factor, but they are also definitely a safety factor. And a cost factor. Absolutely. Well, there's drama um, as we get into the final two hours of the six hours of Monza. Four hours ago, we had five hypercars. We currently have two. <laughs> and some Halton Lane. So, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it's all new. They're all pushing the boundaries with every bit of this technology. And that means that an overall podium is an LMP2 potential. Five minutes back at the moment, the United Autosports 22 car with a 47 second lead over the Team WRT car. Um, also pointing out that after four hours of Monza, an overall podium is a potential for an LMP2 car. As Alan has pointed out, Le Mans is six times longer than we have currently run, and we have no more hypercars coming to Le Mans than started here. It's going to be an interesting month or so, isn't it? Isn't it though? This is uh, the glory days of LMP2 are not done yet. Uh, no, it might be the most glorious coming. Oh, oh the, the Richard Mill Racing Team, Tatiana Calderon shoots the chicane. That's for position. And I yes, think. it is. Tom Blomqvist was right behind her, and she will have to allow him to go through and does before she rejoins. And Loic Duval is not far behind, 10 seconds back for Real Team Racing. Uh, he was in front of them when he came He's into pitted. the pit lane. He's yeah. pitted just now. He was in front of them when he came into the pit lane. Louise Beckett, like everybody does, trying to stay out of the way as teams are frantically getting everything sorted. This was not expected, Alan. They're getting bits out of the toolbox that they didn't have ready. Yeah, it's... As well, in principle, there's a difference between changing these things in testing, and there's a difference when it's actually hot live in a race. And this is where you see too many people in a garage. This is where you need to have structure within your team. Like this gentleman here on the right, standing, doing nothing but spectating, so he needs to be completely out of the way. Yeah. And in that respect, there's, a, I would say, a new learning of just the team and the integration of all of the new parties within the team. They'll learn from this. They've got a month. That's why you're here. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Every day is a school day in life and in racing. We're on board with our LMP2 leader, Kevin Est, a TTE Pro leader, Kevin Est. Moving up to third position overall now, United Autosports' Fabio Scherer, two laps down from the lead battle, 33 seconds between those top two. And may I just look at, as we've seen Estra now pulling away a little bit from Puer Guidi, it's now up to five and a half seconds, which is a huge breathing gap in GTE Pro. And I have to say, Neil Gianni was the architect after being able to get into the lead through a really good pit stop by the Porsche team to be able to give Estra the chance now to stretch it away. Look what's happening in the AM class as well. The Porsches aren't hanging out the back of the field like the long-term Rouge anymore. Now it's like they're in the mountains and suddenly the Porsches, it's all coming towards them. Is the temperature of the track changing? Is that making life more easy or less difficult for the Porsches, let's say? Also, the other thing is there are less corners here than Portimao and at the same time, uh, you have put less energy into those tyres. And so from that perspective, they've been able to play, I think, pretty clever strategy game. I think they've also learned a lot yeah. from Portimao, which shocked quite a few people in how hard they were on the tyres, driving-wise and the way the setup is, and also just general preparation. But the more rubber that goes down on the circuit, the better it is for the tyres. So the later into the race, more you get into the better position for the tyre line. Now, part of the other element might be that they may have... 
GR Racing got, got Ben Barker, their fastest guy. Dempsey Proton 77, Jackson Evans is in. Team Project One, Matteo Cairoli. They've got all their gentlemen drive time out of the way. No, and no not all of them do. Not all have. No, no. Uh, Mike Wainwright's got a little bit to do he still, does. hasn't he? He does. But I think maybe some of the others have. And some of their rivals, now Simon Mann is in at AF Corsa, Seven's Giancarlo Fisichella at AF Corsa. Seven is in the pit lane. Is this a scheduled stop? Yes, it is. This is okay. 30 laps, but this is right on the critical point because they need to do 31 laps for the next two stints to avoid a splash. Ooh. Whereas Nicola Lapierre, he has also got uh, two stops to go, but he doesn't need to do that extra splash. Okay. Right rear puncture for the number seven car as well. Ooh. Is that from when they pulled over and stopped? Because they stopped exactly where the Aston Martin yep, blew its left did. front tyre. And don't forget what side of the track the tractor blower was on. That was going down that side of the grass on the driver's left as he comes up the hill there. So could well be. It's not been straightforward, has it? It really hasn't. It's uh, just everybody bar the Alpine has had problems. Yep. This is big. well done, Graham. Uh, that was Graham Goodwin there. 709, uh, 708 rather, out of the pit lane. 709. it is rather, Roman Duma. Nick de Vries back in Racing Team Netherlands, LMP2 uh, Pro-Am leader. Pro-Am, United Auto Sports third overall leads uh, LMP2 rather. Uh, Team WRT, Charles Malaysi, fourth overall for, uh, uh, for LMP2 uh, in second place. Third in LMP2 into Europol's Jakub Schmikowski. So into Europol having a very strong race at the moment, though he has just been warned about uh, track limits. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great race in LMP2. It has been nip and tuck. It has gone in every different direction possible. And, and for, for once, there has been a race of attrition in LMP2. We've yeah. not seen that for a long time. Can I just say, and I say this so often, coming to Monza, somebody said, what's so great about coming to Monza? I said, it's a classic racetrack, not just because it's been around a long time, but because it always produces good races. This is the great race. Yeah. And we've still got almost two hours of it to go. No. Still no money on anybody yet. I'm disagreeing with you. It's not a great race. It's four great races. Yes, and that's the is. great thing about this is we've got those races overlaid here, yeah. which is what gives us that added uh, layer of drama that comes only in this sort of racing. It allows those storylines to develop over time, and sometimes you can see them coming, and sometimes they just come up and bite you. Yep. And Toyota. And so. <laughs> so Toyota Gazoo Racing, Kamu Kobayashi, eight back right. out. Eight is on the apron. This will be our last running car. And uh, this should make its points without a problem then. Yeah. By your calculations from before, if they don't have any more problems. Yeah. Just talking about problems earlier on, we had the Risi Competizione uh, receiving a penalty, if we remember. I've just seen the actual official notice, and that was due to refueling too long while the pit exit was closed during safety car procedures. So they did a full refuel, and they're meant to only take five seconds, if I remember correctly, of fuel under an emergency situation, then uh, refuel under brake. Number eight Toyota is 43 laps behind. If we go just over the 200 lap mark, which I, my really rubbish maths suggest we might do, there'll be six or seven laps to the good. It's not a big margin for a car that's already 43. They've lost, ten, they've lost 10 laps per hour it so can't far. can't afford another major yeah. issue. They can't afford in, another anyway. minor issue. Yeah. It's, it's seven laps in 10 minutes here. And Bark up to third at the moment. Remember, we do still yeah. need to see uh, Mike Wayne went back into that car. That's yes. a great spell from Ben Barker. Andrew Watson just stopped out of second place for Dean Station. He's dropped to fifth, but he stayed in. And here is the battle between Racing Team Netherlands and Jota Sport, the 28 Jota car. Tom Blomqvist at the wheel, closing in on Nick de Vries. The gap was half a second at the line. And Blomqvist is quicker here at this phase of the race. This is the battle for fourth overall in LMP2. United Autosports Team WRT into Europol competition, competing here for what could be their first ever World Championship podium. Yeah. Uh, what a fantastic result that would be for a tiny team from Poland who, who dreamed big and started off in V de V and ended up 
in a podium position with uh, an hour and 45 to go here in the World Endurance Championship. Got Thank ACO you. titles, their name, Asia Le Mans Series in LMP3, three times second place in the LMS Championship in LMP3, and two fifth positions in the first two races in the World Endurance Championship, and now truly in a position where it could be better than that. Yep. Uh, great stuff from the, that team and uh, making big Boom. moves. This is the high -class, high class racing car. And then is Dennis Anderson still at the wheel. Woo! Oh, that was, was that Cooper? Yeah. It was Cooper. Cooper's at the wheel, but. Didn't look quite straightforward, that one, did it? No. It wasn't a dive. But no. watch this again. This is from inside the 34 car. Dennis Anderson to the right hand side. He's up the inside there. Yeah. He backed out of it, which was his actual issue, because he then, if he had gone in side by side, then it would have been a side to side hit, yeah. which everybody would have kind of bounced over the curb and got away with it okay, but by backing out of it, he put himself in a position where it was right rear to left front, yeah. which spun the other car around. Oh, that would be tough if they get a penalty again and drop themselves out of the top three, but still an hour and 45 to go. Probably factory driver Nicholas Nielsen being strapped mm -hmm. into the leading car in GTE Am yep. from Alessia Rivera. They were 45 seconds to the good when that stop started. In it comes the second place car. They yeah. started last. Yes, yes they, did. they did. In comes the second place car on GTM. This is Marcus Gomez. And he's going to be replaced by a so Farfus, I think, for, I think you're right. for the car. I think Paul Dallalana has done his minimum drive time. Here comes our LMP2 leader, third place overall, Fabio Scherer. Squeaks in front of the GR Racing Porsche. Being driven by Ben Barker. That is now our AM leader again. So we need to work out where that fuel misalignment or non alignment is going to leave them. They didn't stop under the first short full course yellow, chose track position and thought that maybe things might come their way. Well, maybe they might still. Sorry, who are you talking about? GR, the number 86 Porsche. They definitely do need uh, Mike Wainwright back in that car. Yes. Now, if there is a splash at the end, Mike Wainwright might be getting in for a short sh shift. Might well be and that. They've got, uh, they don't have a splash, they've got two stints to go. And uh, they can equal them out at, say, 26 laps. Normally, the car can do 32 laps on this time. Well, Mike Wainwright needs to do about 12 minutes or something, I think. We I think it's a little longer. Maybe 20 minutes, yeah. Uh, Nick Nielsen in A, of course, as you documented, it was Augusto Farfus who gets in the 98 Aston Martin. Jackson Evans pits from behind then with the 77 Dempsey Proton Porsche as we watch High Class versus Dragon Speed. This is an all Danish battle who's in the Dragon Speed car. Uh, that is uh, Juan Pablo Montoya, so not quite as Danish as Henrik Hedman. Now, I have to go back and check the results on this one. This, as things stand, could be the third WC race ever with an LMP2 car on the overall podium. One of them came at Le Mans with the yep. uh, result with the Jack Chan DC racing cars, second and third. The other came in the very first WC race at Sebring with Starworks uh, putting the oh. car on the overall podium uh, at Sebring. Very good. Bear in mind that the, the, uh, that was a joint race. Uh, so it was not the overall podium, but it was the podium for the WC cars that competed there. Right. Juan Pablo Montoya, you can just see from the Goodyear blimp airship with the uh, white just, just not getting by the high-class racing entry there. Dennis Anderson hanging on. And this is for third in Pro-Am and eighth place in LMP2. Anderson eighth, Montoya in ninth place. Leader in Pro-Am in fourth place, Racing Team Netherlands with Nick De Vries at the wheel. Absolutely. That race, by the way, in 2012, second uh, place. And that race went to uh, one of the Audis, Roman De Maier amongst the drivers in that car. The uh, first place car was another Audi. Expertly driven. <laughs> is that Dindo? Yeah. yeah. It was actually. He had a great day. <laughs> Dindo has got that car in his dealership in Italy, yeah. just down the road from here. Is that the one? Yeah, that one. Really sure. Fantastic. First ever Good. World Endurance Championship winning car. Wow.
Good battle here for Dennis Anderson. This is why gentlemen drivers like endurance racing. Where else do you get to race an ex-Grand Prix driver, a three-time Daytona 24-hour winner, a NASCAR racer, a multiple a twice IndyCar Indy 500 champion, winner. a double Indy 500 champion? Not all in the same field, by the way, but all in the body of one person in one car. And that's why endurance racing is so much fun. And in the next race, he gets to race alongside, in that car, uh, an Indy uh, IMSA champion and the reigning GT world champion. Yeah. That's what uh, is special. And uh, it's, it's been, oh, oh. just a minor contact, I suspect, there. Good move by Juan Pablo Montoya. The stewards will look at the contact between the uh, high-class car of Dennis Anderson there, the red and white car, and the 34 car of... Uh, it was Kubi Shmukovs uh, of... Um, yeah, Shmukovsky driving it, yep. wasn't it? It was. Yeah. Uh, into Europol car that currently lies in third. Dennis Anderson, showing spirit there and just uh, giving Juan Pablo the opportunity to realise you can't lift off there, sunshine. <laughs> Here it comes, this is the move to the outside. Taking a couple of laps and, and Juan using his experience to go outside, inside here. I'm sure there was contact, actually. Uh, I think so. A good race from Dennis Anderson, this. He's uh, shown real spirit. They just get better and better, the high-class team. And uh, as we said, you know, they've raced all the way up the ladder into World Endurance. They've, they've climbed the ACO's ladder. Both Toyotas back out now. They're second and fourth. Alpine lead by 40 seconds. 709, remember, will still be on a podium if it completes this race. Yeah. It's uh, the hypercar class making its way back up the order with that uh, pit stop just underway now for the one car. It seems early. Let's get down to the pit lane. Louise Beckett with Jim Glickenhouse. We saw him looking uh, fairly sanguine about the 709 car, which is now back out on track. Jim Glickenhouse, what can we say about this race? It's still so far to go, but it's all going on. We couldn't have predicted this at all, could we, for the 708 and the 709 now? Yeah. 708 lost the spark plug in the beginning of the uh, race, so it was running on seven cylinders. And then it something happened to the gearbox. We're not sure what, but since it dropped metal into the oil, I didn't want to re just replace it and damage another gearbox. Um, the 709 is running really well and really quickly, uh, but the brakes in the front were wearing more than we expected. So for safety, we replaced them. We're able to run very fast lap times, and uh, you know, there's over an hour and 40 minutes left, so we'll give us some of that. What can you do about that situation? Is that gonna, what can you do? I, I don't think it means much. It's very hot now. Toyota have the same issue. We'll look at the place. But I, I don't see it as being a systemic problem or anything. OK, great. Thank you. You got it. All right, well, we've got a full Grand Prix distance still to go in terms of time to be run. So let's wait and see how this one ends up. And Alan, it's not just Hypercar that's in the balance. GTE Pro is in the balance. GTM is in the balance. Nobody's got a clue who's going to come out on top in LMP2. And that's, that's all four classes. Still, you know, if you put your money on anybody now, you lose a reasonable, got a reasonable chance of losing your shirt. Well, I'll take your money anyway and hold it just in case. But uh, right now, I don't know if uh, there may be too many people who would bet the end of this race, never mind bet on the end of the next one being Le Mans. Mm. But uh, it's pretty nip and tuck. This particular battle definitely has swung in the direction of uh, Porsche in terms of leading it because we've got Kevin Estra that's got a, a six second gap and he's able to hold Pierre Guidi at uh, arm's length. But on the other side, Jimmy Bruni's now caught right up in the back of Miguel Molina. I think it's going to need a pit stop to be able to achieve it because the traffic effect doesn't help the GTE cars as much as it helps the hyper cars. And so therefore uh, the pit stop as they did when they got Neil Yanni into the lead of the race in the sister car. I think that's the position that they'll have to look at. But uh, right now, the balance between these two, they do provide performance at different points on the circuit, but uh, equal over the whole lap. 
A uh, bit of an update comes from our friend on Twitter at WC Data. Adds two further races than the WC history. We've seen LMP2 cars on the overall podium. Bahrain. Last year, in fact, ja uh, ja uh, the Jackie Chan DC racing car. And Bahrain as well in 2013 uh, with G Drive making the podium. Thank you. With two Bahrain ra races this year. <laughs> and who's going to bet against that? <laughs> <laughs> well, is it going to be cool in Bahrain, do we think, and kind on cars? No. 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 It's. Not re it's related a little bit to air temperature, yeah. which is definitely going to be a bit cooler. It's not the August uh, 44 degrees that we had in the first year um, of the Bahrain racing, which was, I have to say, a little bit extreme for my little Scottish body. But uh, it's still pretty tough on everything. Dennis Anderson, the high-class car we saw battling with one Pablo Montoya, now in the pit lane. I think that, that is Dennis's uh, time in the car done. I suspect very much so. Could go back to uh, Magnus and Jay of the... I would think there's the driver change feeling, going on. Feeling we need to see this Anders Fjordback is getting back Anders in the car. Fjordback got to do a final stint there for himself. And he's still silver right, I think. Uh, the only other car that was in the pit lane has now exited. GR Racing, Tom Gamble back in. So it's Gamble and... Ben Barker, I think, to the end. Mike Wainwright. Well, oh, Wainwright's Wainwright. still got the... Of course he has, yes. He's it's been, it's been a good time. run from GR Racing, whatever happens from here. a good run from them. Yeah. We had the uh, misfortune on the lap going to the grid in the opening round. Did not take part in that, but uh, getting some good miles on their new Porsche this year. Someone else getting some real good quick laps in and miles in is Kamui Kobayashi. Uh, who has just done nine laps and average 1.2 seconds quicker than Nicola Lapierre that's leading the race. So it looks like Kobayashi's got the hurry up. It's, you know, they've, they've got to push. They've got to push here. Yeah. They need to put the Alpine crew under pressure. It's, but he, it's an hour and 30 minutes to go still, and this is not done. So he's averaged a second a lap for nine laps. That's nine seconds he's closed. There's 30 seconds. 36 seconds between them. It's an awful lot of laps still. It is, but the Alpine also helps with this pitch stop. Yep, this is very true. So the battle for third place continues. They were a third of a second apart at the line. That's possibly one of the bigger gaps around the lap between the Air Corsa number 52 Ferrari and the white 91 Porsche behind. The white and blue car further back, Team Project One, Matteo Cairoli, and that car has been up and down like the Assyrian Empire, to assimilate a phrase, but is now in third position. Don't forget, Egidio Perfetti jumped from third on the grid to second in the very first corner in that car. And then they seem to suffer tyre dead woes or something else, as all the Porsches just sagged down the order. Now they are coming right back into it, Matteo Cairoli third place, Andrew Watson second in the D station, Aston Martin 12 seconds in front and a gap to Nick Nielsen for the AF Corsa 83 car in the lead it's a whopping 29 seconds from first to second a number of these GTM cars still with some uh, bronze driver time to burn, included in them by the way, is the number 88 car that's been uh, brought, herring up the order, so we've got some 52 and 91 battling away here. Yep. And moves to defend, moves to take the optimum line through. The chicane gets it. And good drive out there from the Ferrari 2. That should fend off the close attention to Jimmy Bruni for another lap. Fastest lap of the race goes to Kamui Kobayashi. Meanwhile, lap 152, and it's about a hundredth quicker than uh, the previous best lap. That's uh, a 137-156. In a pre-event press conference, Duncan asked Jimmy Bruni whether he would mind breaking the hearts of the Tifosi as an Italian here in Monza, no, no, no. Beating, <laughs> beating the Ferrari. He said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Team WRT go to work. It's a driver change here with Charles Malesi, 45 seconds back. Did not make much of an impact there on the, uh, the gap to Fabio Scherer. That blinding speed we saw in qualifying not able to reproduce that across that stint. I'm sure his stint times were pretty good. It was a 1.41.407 um, average time across that 27 lap stint. And again, I think that shows the hunger of Fabio Scherer, who of course missed the last race, didn't he? 
uh, for United Auto he Sport. Did. So he is back in the car. That is our race leader. And Jakub Schmikowski was how far behind? A minute, minute 11. 11 behind second place. So that into Europol car is getting close. Still no uh, decision on the contacts that we saw at turn one down at Retifilio. Whatever we see in the remaining hour and a half here, though, Martin, what we've got is teams that we've not seen very often in the mix. That includes the Glickenau squad, it includes the Interiorpol squad, and they're getting a taste of what it takes to be there. And that's going to pay dividends moving forward. Back through we come, turn one. That's uh, the view from the Goodyear airship. Porsche's got better top end. The Ferrari gets off the corner pretty well. Yeah, yeah. So between it, they're sort of ebbing and flowing a little bit. It's going to take a, a reasonable run to allow Jimmy Bruni to have a, a good blast at Molina because Molina is certainly not going to wave him past. There is no question about it. Good hard but racing it, in this class, isn't it? Has been it, from it, the very start of GT Pro, and it's carried on to whenever the end comes for what's been a fantastic class of international racing. I think it'll come down in this particular battle to in and out laps. Uh, at the pit stop. There is Robin Freeze taking over at WRT from uh, Charles Milesi. The car only drops one spot down to third position with that pit stop. Remains ahead of racing team Nederland who are in fourth. They're about 20 seconds further back down the road or were at the line. There is an Europol car coming up behind this battle, so he'll be on them soon. And it's sometimes it's those opportunities for a GT racer. It's not necessarily cars you catch. It can be cars that catch you if they dive in front of your rival at the last moment, or in front of you at the last moment. It can definitely affect the balance of supremacy. There's our LMP2 leader, still Fabio Scherer. They've got a balance of supremacy at the moment. They've got a good lead, 40 seconds, give or take and uh, equal on the number of pit stops to the end of the race. Well, now they owe a pit stop relative to WRT, but uh, prior to that, they were they were effectively on the same number of stops as now Felipe Albuquerque gets ready. He'll take over when that car comes into the pit. Shearer will jump out in probably one more lap. This could be his last lap, actually, before it happens. In come the Interpol competition yeah. team, and that's Boyd uh, Brundle. Shibosky getting out of the car. Yeah, so Brundle, Brundle Minor uh, climbs aboard. Alex Brundle will be in, you'd think, to the end. So, too, you would think Felipe Albuquerque. Yeah, they will be. There's two stints to the end. It's and so they'll be, double to go through now, Mark. It's going to be a monster arm wrestle to win this one, isn't it? I mean, this is a big, big battle going on. Yeah, I think in, the, in this particular one, you know, there's enough gaps between them. Unless there is something like a full course, a safety car that yeah. brings him back in. Yeah. You know, Alex Brundle uh, definitely then would see his opportunity. There's no question and give it everything. But I uh, can't imagine Robin Frins is going to think anything different than Felipe Albuquerque, we know. Yeah. WRT got caught a little bit because they did their stop predominantly under green and went back out when the safety car uh, just started. So ultimately lost the time, most of the time, in that yep. particular point. Yep, absolutely. They were unfortunate. They were lucky not to get caught in the pits, but they were unfortunate that everybody else was going much faster for most of their time on pit road. Out comes Alex Brundle in the 34 car. Not the quickest pit stop time, but uh, not bad. 121 on pit road. In comes the leader in LMP2 and third place overall, Fabio Scherer. That's been a good double stint from Fabio Scherer. Racing Team Nederland can't be far away either. They're in fourth place now. The inter Europol cars drop behind them. And Roman Duma, 25 seconds behind Nick de Vries. Uh, third in the Glickenhaus in a hypercar, but in fact in sixth place overall. On a different fuel stint, uh, the Racing Team Nederland car. It's under 20 seconds between uh, Robin Vrins and Nick de Vries. Yep. That one's got mileage to come, hasn't it? <laughs> you think? Battle rages on still. Jimmy Bruni just nudging up behind Miguel Molina. has got a good run going through Curva de Biasone, but no chance down at the Roger. The Ferrari driver covers off the inside line. The Porsche man will have to try again somewhere else. And meanwhile, here comes more LMP2 traffic. That's still the high-class car behind them. And behind them is the WRT car of Robin Freens. 
So Robin Freens just behind this battle. Expect at least one of those LMP2 cars to come by. And there goes our LMP2 leader, Felipe Albuquerque, out of the pit lane. Another car that uh, they're going to try to get out is the Jota 38 that we saw coming in earlier on. They're going to try and get that back out. Louise Beckett has uh, just been down there, as we see at the back of that lineup, actually the sister car, uh, which is Stoffel van Dorn. Yeah, and that car fresh out of the pit lane is in sixth place. Louis de Val for Real Team is in fifth. Into your poles, yellow and green car Alex Bundle is in fourth. But here comes the Jota car, trying to fight its way through the Porsche-Ferrari battle for third in GTE Pro. And look how hard it is for the P2 cars to pass in a straight line. And here comes Jimmy Bruni down the inside, gets eased over towards the grass by Miguel Molina. And again, Jimmy Bruni would have done exactly the same in defence. There's no easy passes. Race leader in the pits, Nico Lapierre. For Alpine, not the Toyota. That was a few years back. Race leader Nico Lapierre is in. Door is shut. I think there's been a driver change there as well in that car. Lapierre yeah. had done a double that stint. Nick Lau? So it'll go back normally by. Uh, oh, and there's. Sorry to jump there. Oh. A little bit wide for Molina onto the gravel. Doesn't give quite enough for Jimmy Bruni to have a sniff up the inside into the first Lesmo. Toyota back in the lead, number seven car has retaken the lead, Kabu Kobayashi. Jimmy Bruni in the white 91 Porsche, all over the back of Miguel Molina. This is the battle for third, their teammates similarly ahead of them by about half a minute. Kevin Esch ahead of uh, Alessandro Pierre Guidi. It's Five and a half seconds, not just under half a second as this battle is. Long stop for ARC Bratislava. Matej Konopka in the pit lane. Not seeing that at the moment. Too much on track action. And uh, Matej Vazivier it was who took over the Alpine. He comes back out of the pit lane in second, charged with chasing down, catching and passing Kamu Kobayashi in the Toyota. Uh, recovery drive uh, underway from the click house of Ronald Demaris up around the outside this time from the Porsche, the 91 car. Has he got room to do this? Oh, if he doesn't he get does. the, he does. I was going to say, if he doesn't get the first apex, he's going to try and hold the second one on the left there, but he got in front under braking. Stalwart defence by Miguel Molina, but in the last couple of laps, Alan McNish, he's been sort of all over the kerbs and kicking up the gravel. He sort of sensed that the Porsche had a bit more tyre left in reserve. Yeah, the, the definitely now I think will pull away Jimmy Bruni and that will sort of settle this battle down because there's a 30 second gap up ahead to Puer Giri, who's in second place. But already Bruni has done his fastest sector one of the race so far by immediately getting past. Now, admittedly, he got a little bit of a draft for Molina down the straight, but he's still able to deliver it. Here we're now on board with uh, Kazuki Nakajima in the Toyota. This car is still not in the top 30 overall, but he's now managed to get itself up into fourth place due to the fact that uh, the Glickenhaus has retired, and uh, that will allow it to sort of keep in the points and keep it in that points battle. It'll receive 12 points with its teammates 25, which will bring the championship battle to within six points, if my calculations are correct. And that is significantly tighter than it was coming into this race. Also in hypercar, back up in the sixth position on that recovery drive now is the 709 Glickenhaus. Minute and 21 seconds off third place. Yeah. That is a gap that will be coming down. We'll keep an eye on that one. Moments give you an idea. It's about two and a half seconds a lap quicker, uh, Dumas, than Philippe Albuquerque. Different on uh, fuel strategy, of course, fuel, uh, the uh, pit stop times for these two cars. Fastest lap of the race, you're quite right, from Jimmy Bruni, 146.627. 30 seconds back from Pierre Guidi. That's significantly quicker than any of the other cars in GT Pro that time around. Still looking at the talking about the Glickenhaus there. 
I heard from Jim Lickenhouse that uh, brakes he didn't think were an intrinsic issue, even when the car went back out after the change of the front brakes, there's still a lot of dust coming off them in the heavy braking area. So it's clear that uh, they do have a little bit of work to do there, whether it's something that is in the DNA, in the way that the cooling package is done, or in the brake manufacturer, or whatever. Uh, but there's a little bit of work to be done there before Le Mans. Talking about a bit of work, on board with this man. Quickest first sector of the race so far. Now caught behind a bit of traffic in the two Lesmos, but he's half a lap ahead of Mathieu Vexivier in the Alpine we're seeing now, just crossing the line to start the... Which number of lap is that? 159th lap. Yep. So 159 laps in the books, 51.8 seconds is the lead gap between the two relatively underlaid, because we have had the delay for the number seven uh, Toyota. Third overall is that number 22 United Auto Sports uh, Orica, the LMP2 car with Felipe Albuquerque at the wheel. Uh, he's got 38 seconds advantage over the Team WRT car, 31 car, with the third car Overall in LMP2, fifth overall in the race, Nick de Vries in what is the Pro Am leading 29 racing team Nevlin car. 16 seconds back from that, we get to the recovering Roman Dumas in the 709 car. That's an eight minute stop for a change of brakes on the 709. They are racing back and will, if staying out of trouble, make some further progress up the order. Yeah, a minute and a quarter behind the 22 car in third place overall. Of course, they will go on to a hypercar podium if they finish where they are now, whether they're third, fourth, fifth, whatever down the order. I think the, the sort of battle there is the fact that Nick de Vries and the racing team Netherlands in fifth place overall, first in Pro-Am, actually still owes us a pit stop, so we'll then come back in towards uh, the areas of the inter europe Battle for third, LMP uh, in GTM rather, Team Project 1, the 56 car, and that is... The Cairoli. Porsche of Matteo Cairoli with Augusto Farfus up behind him. Augusto Farfus racing in touring cars last weekend in Motorland Aragon with near 800 horsepower in a two-ton rear-wheel drive touring car. So he's probably finding this to be a little bit underpowered, to be honest, but it stops a bit better. Matteo Cairoli, we're talking about Jimmy Bruni, Matteo Cairoli, another Italian passionate about Porsche may well be part of the future of the Porsche brand in motorsport. Uh, I'm not sure how much longer they can fend him away from a Porsche factory uh, factory seat, but uh, he'll relish this on home ground with Team Project One and a driver of the quality of Augusto Farfus to battle out there. Porsche leads Aston Martin for third position. It's another Aston Martin ahead, by the way, in second position yeah. in GTE Am. Been trying not to mention D Station and Andrew Watson too much, just for <laughs> fear of giving them the jinx of the commentator, because at the moment they're having a really good run. Drive through penalty for car number 20. That's the high class entry for not respecting blue flags and causing contact with car number 34. So the uh, the yellow and green car of Inter Europol not judged to be at fault for that. So a penalty handed to uh, uh, it was. Was that Dennis Anderson Dennis before Anderson. the driver change? It was, wasn't Dennis it? Dennis Anderson. So I'm Anders Fjordback will have to serve it. But if a penalty was coming, I'd have probably called it that way. And the blue flag side of it, I haven't taken into account. But the way I saw the contact, yes. Um, this is a great battle. Yeah, and uh, really good stuff. The Aston just with a little bit more top end, it seems, than the Porsche. And uh, at a circuit that is quite top endy, like Monza, that doesn't hurt too much. You spend a lot of time at full throttle here over 70 percent of the lap that's getting on to old hockenheim kind of percentage seems seem to remember one time they said in formula one 89 percent of the lap you spent at full throttle at hockenheim or something wow. insane like that out through the forests i uh, should say by the way the brothers drivers from these cars both paul Dallana from the chasing 98 car has done his uh, yeah. required minimum time, as has Egidio Perfetti from yeah. the 56 car. Well, both started the race, and that, that's almost always the way they go, to try and get their drivers in right at the beginning. Both have done significantly more than they need to. Both have done over two hours yeah. aboard, aboard well, the cars. There's Paul on the left, Felipe Fraga on the right, and uh, fellow Brazilian Augusto Farfus there in the 98 Aston, chasing the Italian in the Porsche. Whoa, on the grass is Tom Blomqvist. 
Oh, it's not, it's 38, not 28. Uh, coming back in, that's Antonio Felix da Costa, Ant Davidson and Roberto Gonzalez car. And that is Ant Davidson going very, very slowly. Louise was expecting the car in anyway. Let's hear what the team have to say. Sorry, just too late on the ball. Just too late on the ball. Another one on the main street. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. So we can change one more box. We can change one more box. You're too late on the call. He's out of fuel. Well, that doesn't normally put you off into the grass. Yeah, that was the thing that surprised me was he was off in the gravel, but uh, let's see, he's coming back on like a limp home board. Yep. So, yes, I mean, the, the, the initial part of the message there, too late on the call, that means they, need, they were bingo fuel, they needed to come in and didn't say so. And he should also have warning lights that tell him things like that, but you rely on your engineer and try not to get too distracted by lights. Only minimal laps, so that's the thing. Yeah. Since yeah. You know, early on in the race, I've been doing little in and out, short laps, short stints. But he's up to speed only, again. Looks like he's only been out for four laps. Yeah. I wonder what it is. Can't, can't be that they're out of fuel. It's standard that they stick fuel in the moment the car arrives. Well, the only other thing is, was it a call for another problem that came too late? Yeah. Maybe they, they seen? Yeah, maybe they are warning him of something they've seen come up. Has he got a slow puncture or something? Well, he's back up to speed. That doesn't look like somebody who's coming back with a puncture. Did he have an electronics issue? It's the brain's trust at Jota. He will come into the pit lane, I think. It would be good if we could see the sort of trip across the gravel and yeah. the grass, whether that was actually the result of something that was earlier on. Dragon Speed in the pits, Juan Pablo Montoya brought the number 21 car in from 8th place in LMP2, 11th overall. And it's the car in the pits, 38 is in, 60 are in, and uh, 708 are in. Let's get down to hear from Louise Beckett, see if she can tell us a little bit more, Louise. Uh, you're at Jota, what do they know? So Anthony reported back that there was hesitation in the car, so they were calling him in to come in anyway because they knew that they would probably need to check this issue more. Uh, and it, it was just too late on the call for him to come in. OK, so it's got, a, it's got an electronics or an, a, a long running problem with the car and uh, they had hoped to stop him doing another slow lap. Ben Hanley takes over the Dragon Speed car for the until the end of the race. Well, like everybody else, if the car is playing up now, they just want to learn what they can and try and use this as training for fixing issues. If you learn what a, a problem is, hopefully it won't recur. Well, there's been a lot of problems today, yeah. much more than expected, and certainly from cars and operations that, uh, you know, normally we haven't had this level of problems. We want to come back to Le Mans. There might be a two uh, Monza. There might be a few teams again. Now, nah, actually, we're, we're good. <laughs> we didn't like Monza very much. We didn't have much fun. Uh, not among them here, United, so far. Not among them here either in this battle in the GC Amcar team, Project One and uh, AMR. And into the pit lane is our third and fourth place battle, Jimmy Bruni and Miguel Molina. Bruni stops in the Porsche. Molina stops now in the Ferrari. Back in the pit lane uh, again. Ooh. The extraordinary thing about this LMP2 battle this season has been this tale of the three big teams, yep. United, Jota, WRT, and they've all hit problems. Um, you've had perfect races. Uh, the, the Spa opener for United was absolutely faultless. After the first lap shenanigans between the two Jotas, you've barely ever seen a race that perfect from the two-car team uh, to come back with the result that they got, and here we are again. It's, uh, it has been pendular, I think is the, is the phrase. That, uh, they're either very, very good or they hit multiple troubles. Yeah. When they're good, they're very, very good. When they're bad, they're horrid. Right. Uh, pit stop two for real team. Loic Duval, I think, may well stay in. Jimmy Bruni, Miguel Molina, as you saw, having service. The Porsche coming out narrowly in front, inches. Fourth down in inches, an hour and nine minutes to go, and they go a lap down to the 92 Porsche, which will owe us a stop. That was the last to stop on the last round. 
It's going to be the next lap that yep. uh, 92 Porsche will be in the leading of uh, Porsche of Kevin Astro. Now, does the 52 Ferrari come in, or the, yes, it does. Uh, does the 51 Ferrari come in, or does it stay out as long as Astro? It does. It stays out as long. So Alessandro Pierguidi has somehow saved a lap of fuel as well. Yeah, he'll be going in for what the next stop. Yeah, time. but I thought the 92 car stopped on its own last time round. I may just have missed the Ferrari going in as well. Uh, no, Collado did 34 laps on the previous stage, and uh, Puerguini's on 33 laps on yeah. this particular stage, so we're up to the same sort of numbers. Might have been James that found the extra lap to get them back on terms. Graham Goodwin, the fastest lap of that car's race, goes to uh, Philippe Albuquerque in the 22. United Auto Sports car 139.602, which is just tenths off uh, the fact the time just posted by Matt, the face of the air in the Alpine. Fastest lap for the uh, the car two goes to Sophia Flersch in the number one uh, Richard Mille racing car, running ninth and sixth in LMP2. And just a moment ago, uh, also a fastest lap for that car for the second place car in GTE Am that went to Andrew Watson with a 147.5. We're entering happy hour time. This is what we're getting close towards. We qualified at six o'clock yesterday, and it's uh, quarter to five now with an hour to go. We will finish the race at about the time that we started qualifying yesterday. Um, and it does seem to be just a little bit of a cooler day. Much more humid, but that doesn't bring the track temperature up. I wonder if they're just finding a little bit more, even at the end of the stint. 92 on the pit road, or a white Porsche at any rate. Yeah, 92 it is, as indeed comes the 51 Ferrari. So it's as you were. Last lap, uh, time at last time around, it was 91 and 52. This time, 92 and 51. And it becomes a matter of who can turn the car around more quickly amongst the two pit crews rather than the two wheelmen. And again, if the Porsche team gain one or two seconds, they start to cover the ability of the Ferrari team, who are further downstream in the pits, to release their car. And we think. When the Porsche team gained four seconds in a stop a couple of stops ago, two of it might have been in the actual stop. The other two, because the Ferrari couldn't be released when the Porsche was coming close to it down the pit lane. Left sides only. That's pretty much been the way it's been. Looks like left sides only for Ferrari as well. I think the Porsche is on its way. Sounded like it. There it goes. Ferrari losing more time here. Not a bad-looking pit stop from Batty Pregliasco's crew. Out they go. They were about eight and a half seconds apart coming in. It's not Looks dramatically like that, different, no. is it? Looks like that might be the same, although the Ferrari is going to come into quite a lot of traffic now. That's just shot by him. Here we go, look, including the race leader, Louis Kobayashi. Who, by the way, is stretching that lead. 59 seconds to good now over Mathieu Vazivier. Mm. Uh, fastest final sector of the race for the Toyota as well. It was in clear air all the way through sector three, which is basically Exeter Scari to the finish line. Full second taken out of the Alpine's time. Yeah. And uh, the Alpine, not quite as quick even as the Glickenhaus in sixth place, is uh, closing in pretty rapidly on Nick de Vries at the moment. You don't get many of those laps where everything runs really clean for you, and so when you do, you properly have to take advantage really did there. Uh, Looks those battles we can keep keeping an eye on. Uh, Matteo Caroli still leads Augusto Farfus for that uh, battle of the final podium position in GTE Am. It was indeed as you were. Jimmy Bruni and Miguel Molina still nose to tail. Yeah. And in LMP2, as we're looking for there, well, it's 40 seconds between United and Team WRT, further 17 seconds back before we get to Racing Team Nedland. There's actually some significant gaps in that field now. Yeah, start, a couple of them starting to open up a little bit, some of them very, very close still. And hopefully there are some very young fans there still enjoying themselves. That's not quite a... Oh, it is now a change for position. Change back for position, in fact, because the 98 Aston had got in front. We didn't see that, I don't think. Across, across the line, he was, what, a tenth up? Yeah, no, okay. Less than half a tenth. And then lost under braking to the Porsche. That's why he's got the three coloured lights on the side. Marker 
for being in third position. They will go out on his car and come on the Porsche at the end of sector one, which was breaking into the Roger. And now when we see the side shot of the Porsche, it'll have the three yellow lights on, or orange lights on. And there it does. Cracking stuff with these two. Has been from lap after lap after lap in. To pit lane comes Nick de Vries. Seeds fifth place overall to Roman Dumas. Moves up another one, but will owe a pit stop fairly soon, the 709. De Vries needs two laps, in fact, I think. De Vries and Racing Team Netherlands need to keep their nose clean, looking for another Pro-Am win. Rinaldi Racing Ferrari being warned about obeying blue flags. More guest cars, by the way, take care. Those this weekend, the 61 car is position best of the GTM cars that are not full season entrants. They're 10th at the moment, Chris Hallrick. 10th in GTM, 28th overall. Bici Competizioni in 10th place in LMP2 as well. Not been a smooth race for them, has it? Hasn't really been drama, but it just hasn't really been quite as quick as they'd have hoped, I think. They're down behind high class and dragon speed. There's an outfit of that ability, all right, they don't have much to go on here in Monza in recent years, but then nor does anybody else. That uh, pit stop cycle uh, for the racing team Netherlands car drops them down to fourth in the class, behind the interior port competition car again. So uh, Alex Brundle, four and a half seconds clear of Nick de Vries. That could be an interesting battle to well, of course, the flag. Yeah, that was at the line, so Brundle was coming by at uh, 180 miles an hour and de Vries was doing zero as he sat on the jack so that could be up to 30 seconds no it's it was the set first time in uh, first time in beacon okay and when in when there's troubles ahead left leg in left leg out you do, do the hokey the okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's it's big yeah the okie okay is definitely big the hyper okay. there is your race leader Kamui Kobayashi Coming far away from the end of his stint striding away now it's a minute and three seconds clear well, it started on pole position and leads with an hour and two minutes to go. Fairly standard, straightforward race so far then for Toyota, <laughs> as you say it like that, but anything but in reality. Mike Conway, I think, will take over fairly shortly from Kamui Kobayashi and probably see the race out. From a demand, meanwhile, is 62 seconds off a podium position with 62 minutes remaining. Mm. That has come. That is still coming down. It's coming about down a, a, a minute. Line. A minute. Yeah. yeah. There are pit stops to take into account here, Second of course. A minute. Yeah. But uh, so you're getting your money out. No. Not in this race. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Change. Ooh. This time doesn't quite manage to do it. Has he got better traction coming out? But uh, Farfus yeah. manages to get it done. Squares it away nicely. Top end speed helps to creep the Aston Martin away as they get towards the braking area for the Roger, the second of our three chicanes here in Monza. Start, the sun's starting to uh, beat down there out of the cloud cover. It's pretty humid. There's been quite a lot of cloud cover today, but when the clouds aren't there, you really feel the heat of the sun. The tra track temperatures have actually probably been quite kind to the cars. frenetic action at the top of this field with brake racing and some misfortune. We're 30 seconds away from the start of the final hour. GTM, this is how that moves start around the outside. Yep. Probably honking on there around the exit of Parabolica. And Augusto Farfus. Uh, one of the Dempsey Proton cars, that's 77 or 88. It's the 88, 88, that's it's the 88, 88 car. Trying to unlap himself from this yeah. pair. And through comes the Jota car. It's a 28 car of Stoffel Van Dorn. As we head into the final hour here in Monza. Pit lane for our race leader, Kamui Kobayashi. This was an expected and scheduled stop. And as we anticipated, perhaps 
Mike Conway taking over the man who started from pole position. And Toyota Gazoo Racing will definitely be hoping that the Brit is still the race leader as he was in the first turn coming out of the last. In between times, a very different story to any that we've seen so far this season. So far this year in Spa and most recently in Portimao, the number seven Toyota has had the pace on the sister number eight car. Here, number eight didn't quite have the pace and has had no fortune other than bad. Here, though, comes the challenge for the new race leader. And this is Mathieu Vazivier for Alpine going across the stripe to move ahead of the number seven Toyota, the car that was briefly in the lead. The 709 Glickenhaus is in fifth place overall, third in hypercar. As the seven car leaves the pit lane, it is a two horse race. Just a little quick onboard glimpse during the pit stop of Mike Conway. And here is Mike at speed again. Full tanks, fresh rubber. And the job is to claim a third straight, a third ever hypercar victory for Toyota. It won't be a one-two as they've had at the previous two races. And it would be the first hypercar win for the crew of number seven, Graham if they survive the next hour in front. Yeah, and uh, they've given us a couple of moments, haven't they? They sure have. Well, Jose Maria Lopez did his stints in the number seven car in the middle of the race. That leaves him available to chat to R. Louise Beckett. Let's get down to the pit lane. Jose Maria Lopez, Mike Conway's just taken the number seven to the end of the race. Could you have ever imagined the race would be playing out like this? <laughs> Uh, it's endurance races. You have to be prepared for everything. Uh, it's been a crazy race. Uh, having problems, unfortunately, on car eight. We had some problems too. A puncture. Glickenhaus had a problem. Had a problem, and uh, yeah, um, it's been crazy. But we are prepared for that. You know, we kind of know how hard it is. So, yeah, we managed to have a good ry uh, rhythm. Kamui did a fantastic job, and then we have to see the strategy, how it's going to play in the end. But, uh, yeah, let's hope that everything comes together and we can bring back home uh, the, the trophy. It's unfortunate for the issues, but is it nice to have that fight brought to you? Oh, definitely, definitely. To have the fight, to see to see Alpine, to, be, to see Glickenhaus having a, a, very, a very good pace, it, it, it's very good, it's what we want, you know, it's competition. It's going to be more and more difficult for us as well. So we take it as a good challenge. We, we're ready for that. And uh, yeah, yeah, I think uh, there is a very bright future ahead of us. And we're glad, we're glad that it's like this. Thank you. Thank you. We're here. We want the competition. And uh, it's been two cars bringing that competition to them here today. This has been one of them off that battle with the need for a brake change in the 709. Just uh, that car, I think, is going to need a splash. 56 minutes to go. The Toyota. No, the Blickenhaus has just made a stop. Uh, yeah, I think the Toyota as well is on the limit of it. So, uh, so 56 minutes to go. Out comes the Blickenhaus in the hands of Richard Westbrook now. That comes back out in eighth position. Through to cross the line for the end of lap 1-7. Four, three, sorry, is uh, Mathieu Vazivier aboard the 36 car. Also saw, by the way, the 33, the TF Sport car that led the race in GTM, but had that uh, massive blowout that uh, rather ruined their day. Crawling in, I suspect, out of fuel, but managed to make it back to the pit box and has just uh, rejoined the race. So Vazivier, 13.8 seconds to the good, but uh, uses the pit stop reasonably, so, well, reasonably soon. It's 11 laps which should be his final stop. That will be his final yep. stop, and then uh, the question is, can uh, the Toyota get to the end without an additional splash? Yep. So uh, the gaps should, should all things remain as they are, and it's not been the case for the last five hours, uh, should mean that Toyota are looking reasonably comfortable, despite the issue we saw, the number seven requiring a stop on track to 
a power cycle and then a puncture reported with the car happily for the team pretty close to its fueling window anyway yeah third overall United Autosports LMP2 uh, with a comfortable lead Felipe Alpica over the Team WRT 31 car up in France Alex Brundle back up into third position with Nick De Vries putting him under pressure and there Brundle, is, there is Brundle, De Vries. yellow and green De Vries yellow oh, in fact that's not De Vries behind him the, that's the third yellow car that's 44 ASC Bratislava's Oli Webb trying to unlap himself the yellow and black racing team Netherlands car in the background there four seconds that is De Vries and there's our GT Am leader who just went straight across the gravel Somebody did. Somebody had a full-on rally cross moment there. I wonder if that was the uh, real team racing car. So there is Nick De Vries behind the 83 car of Niklas Nielsen. He leads in the GTM class from D Station's Andrew Watson, still at the wheel. Clearly super glued the door shut when he got in. And Augusto Farfas is in third. So Aston Martin second and third. And Ferrari defending a lead here. Was it 83 that gravel trapped? 54. Uh, 54. It was 83. There's a great little note came up on our it timing is. screens Pickle here. Right. The, uh, we may have gravel <laughs> on the track at turn yeah. 9 and 10, which There's. is this one here. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty safe to say, yes. Uh, that would be Giancarlo Fisichella. He knows all the lines around here. Monza rally isn't uh, until later in the year, traditionally, can we just mention to him. Well, here is the race leader overall, Maggio Vazivier. Again, he seems to have superglued himself firmly into the seat of the Alpine. Five hours and seven minutes done. An hour to go here in Monza. The FIA World Endurance Championships first race in Monza, incredibly, in its ninth season. And a great bumper crop of cars. The biggest field we've brought so far to the table in 2021, including a few interlopers ready for the final shakedown for the Le Mans 24 hours and the glory of winning for the first time in WEC at Le Mans. Toyota locked out the front row of the podium in hypercar. Didn't manage to lock out the top two places, exiting turn one into the Retifilio. Just a little bit cautious, Sebastian Buemi in the number eight Toyota and getting the jump on him was the Alpine of Andre Negrau. Got through into second place, courtesy of a bit of uh, cheeky nip and tuckery. But then as they got up above 130 kilometers an hour, Toyota able to deploy their hybrid drive. End result, Toyota 1-2. So much so standard, you might have thought. In the GTE class, it was Porsche, Ferrari, Porsche, Ferrari on the grid, and that much remained constant through the first corner. Ben Keating in the pale blue Aston, easing the Chetelar car offline in the first corner to defend his pole position. And as the Chetelar team protested, through went to Porsche. First penalty of the race for Alex Brandl in the inter Europol car. And for a move that he made down the inside into the first corner, Andrew Harianto bringing out the first full course yellow, spinning at the Roggia. Most cars fueled battles continued all the way up and down the order in all four classes then drama for Chetilar his car crashed heavily in FP1 just avoided taking the 91 copy, copy. Porsche out there was a little bit of contact there with the spinning car then drama huge drama for the number eight Toyota Brendan Hartley freshly into the car slowing right down Glickenhaus up to third in hypercar and overall as the Toyota came in with electronic issues. Much more evident issues for Ben Keating right at the end of his double stint, the tyre letting go and ripping the front of the Aston apart, sending it from first to last in GTE Am. More friendly rivalry between the GTE Pro drivers. The 92 Porsche getting eased out of the lead and second in one fell swoop. But they have fought their way right back. 92, the pole sitters back in the lead. After four hours, the Glickenhaus uh, dramas continued. Early on, 7.08 had problems, then 7.09 coming in for a brake change at the end of the fourth hour, just as it had taken the lead from Toyota after a glitch for the number seven car. 
92 leading in GTE Pro, 83 in GTE Am, 22 leading in LMP2 and third overall at the moment. And our race leader is Toyota number seven chasing the Alpine at number 36. In the shadow of the Alps and the Italian lakes is the Royal Park of Monza, just about 20 kilometers out of the center of Milan. And on track, currently Alpine lead from Toyota. It's a one-two for the hypercars. Third place overall is our leader in LMP2. United lead from WRT and into Europol. But the Glickenhaus in seventh is closing. Porsche, Ferrari, Porsche, Ferrari. Looks like nothing has changed in GT Pro. Everything changed and changed back. A, of course, a lead from Aston Martins and Porsches in the GTE AM class. The delayed number eight Toyota 33rd overall on target should it lose no more than three further laps to complete the race and bring home points for fourth in hypercar despite its tardy delays. But our race leader is Mathieu Vazivier in the Alpine. 48 minutes remain. Could this be a glorious triumph for the French team? Alan McNish, yes or no? I think that this particular glorious triumph is going to be a close run thing. It is going to be, isn't it? I have a feeling Nine we're not seconds done. to Conway. Uh, it's the question is whether Conway can stretch the fuel mileages or not. And I suspect probably unlikely to be able to do it. The thing is uh, that if he does, he'll be doing a splash of fuel, whereas uh, the actual other car with, with Maxivi will actually have more fuel to put in. So it's going to come down to who's the most di disciplined. Does anybody make, make a mistake? Do we see any further mechanical, electronic, electro uh, ele uh, electrical dramas? We've seen plenty of that through this race. Well, the performance in the race, again, the 22 United Autosports car, 42 seconds to the good over a well-driven 31 TWRT car. And holding that advantage and holding it very well indeed. It's been very constant for the last couple of hours, really, between the two of them. It has. Uh, the advantage went in the favour of United Autosports at uh, the safety car when the WRT car pitted just at the beginning and was refueling, and uh, then others were able to achieve it at slightly less of average speeds. It's altogether closer for the final podium position in LMP2. Alex Brundle holds just a four-second uh, advantage over Nick de Vries, who also, by the way, leads the LMP2 Pro-Am class with the racing team Netherlands car. Into Europol 34, currently holding the final podium position in LMP2. Chasing back in seventh overall, and close to both of those cars is the 709 Glickenhaus, car that led this race twice this afternoon before uh, brake issues. Saw the team pitting for eight minutes to uh, replace the braking system. The car back up to seventh overall. Still, of course, sits uh, in third in the hypercar class as the 31 Team WRT car comes in for... Well, that's 46 minutes at the end of the race. That's pretty edgy. Very close. Very close. Interesting little graphic there for Kevin Estra saying he's up three places, of course, not in class. Started first in class, leads the class. We started 18th on the overall grid, he's 15th overall, leading in GTE Pro. Even more strange, that's only 25 laps on the stint for the Team WRT car. Now, is that absolutely as they planned, or have they got a problem? Have to wait and find out. Louise Beckett will be down in the pit lane. Nick Nielsen in at AF Corsa. Driver change. Now, that now he can't be... be near his maximum, so. I'd have thought not. Uh, so Has quick... Francois Perodo actually done his minimum? 45 minutes remaining. Maybe Nick Nielsen is just feeling a little bit iffy. And so, Francois Perodo has. Has done... Alessio Rivera done enough? Yeah, he's done quite a lot, I think. I'm not right. sure he did. He did the first stint and a bit, and he did a single, I thought. That, yeah. Is that a four-tire change there? That was a four-tire for Nic tire Nicholas change. Nicholas Nielsen is just, just shy of an hour. Yeah. There are minimums that you must do as a bronze driver. There are maximums that you can do. Well, let's get down to United Auto Sports. They lie third overall, leading in LMP2. 
Louise Beckett with a chance to catch up with their young Phil Hansen, third overall. Phil Hansen, we're going into the last hour and the 22 is still dominant. Uh, can you sit back a bit at this point? I don't think you can ever sit back in one of these races, to be honest. Like you said, there's still an hour to go, or well, 45 minutes to go. <laughs> um, it feels like the longest 45 minutes ever when you have a 40 second lead that we do currently. Um, but yeah, up to now, it's gone really well. Okay, thank you. Yes. Well, Phil is the only United Autosports driver that has done that the well, all the races so far this season, this is his third, because his teammates have swapped around, depending on who's available, who isn't. And he's the only man in the points in LMP2, separating all six Jota drivers who are first and third. However, if nothing changes now, he will leave here as the points leader. Um, by the way, Augusto Farfus goes to the lead in uh, the GTM class. Yeah. Nick Nielsen still shown at the wheel of the car, so whether or not that was driver assistance or maybe a drinks bottle. Could, could be. be something like that. Could be because the driver is not counted as a member of the pit change crew. They are fundamentally not in any driver um, drive time issues with that crew. Mm -hmm. uh, Augusto Farfus pits now for his final stop. Um, Tomonobu Fuji is at the wheel now at the D station racing after uh -huh. what was a oh. fantastic run from. That was a bit wide there. Wasn't it just? Hey, Mike Conway, I saw was Mike... that going as fast as we expect? Yeah, I saw Kamui Kobayashi doing the same early on in the race. Went very, very wide. And that's a corner that when you really attack into it, you can lose the rear of the car quite easily. And uh, it's happened a few times in Lesmo 1. Maybe they are desperately trying to cruise and lift and coast and save that fuel. They're pushing 37.4. Okay. 37.4 is not too far off their qualifying. No, it's a 37.1, remember, is the fastest lap of the race. It's just three tenths of a second off that. Less than three tenths of a second off that. Taken two seconds out of Maggio Vazivier in the last few laps, come down from 9.27 point something. It's a 137.6 from the Alpine that time around, a 137.4, 136.9 now uh, from Conway, and he is pushing. That's the fastest lap of the race, two tenths off the previous fastest lap. So the gap now between the two, 7.1 seconds. This is the move they're trying to make, isn't it? Yep, 136.9, put the Alpine under ultimate pressure. Going around the D-station car of Tomonobu Tomono Fuji, to take over from Andrew Watson. So far for stays in the 98 Aston. They're looking for an Aston 1-2 here. It's two different teams of Aston Martins. TF Sport running the 777 car and AMR running the 98. The 1-2 the, the is going to be out of their reach without a problem for the lead car. But uh -huh. It's been a fine... It's a, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a fine performance from the 83 and from yeah. both of those Aston Martin squads. And frankly, from the 33 as well, yeah. had it not been for... Well, as he said himself, Ben Keating, sort of self-inflicted, but he's having to stretch the envelope for those tyres, and it went one lap too long. But, uh, he led and led well. As ever. And a good run from him. Uh, to Europe all on pit lane now for their final stop of this race, and that is well within the, the window, as it is for Jota Sport for the 28 car, 7th and 8th, and as that happens, going up into fifth position overall and passing Nick De Vries is the Glickenhaus. Yeah, Richard Westbrook just went by him in the final sector, so he's up to fifth place overall. Remains third in hypercar. There are still two LMP2 cars ahead of him, and they are, well, Robin Freens for WRT is one lap ahead of the Glickenhaus. No, no, it's not. He's 23 seconds Oh, he's 23 ahead. now, isn't he? So, so 23 yeah. seconds is doable. Um, it's a, over a minute to... Oh! He was not healthy. That's why he was so late into Lesmo, because he's got that braking issue that the number eight car had. That's what we saw from Brendan Harley. It was much more dramatic because he nearly smashed into the back of the 98 Aston. Well, now, is this just him pushing? Watch again. Is he on the white line? I think that's just lock up. Yeah. Maybe that's just pushing. That's just lock up. Somebody has helpfully knocked some of the polystyrene out of the way. To lessen the problem for him. 40 minutes remaining. United Autosports now on pit lane from third overall. And the lead in LMP2. 
no fuel worries for this car until the end of the race. It's all beginning to fall into place, isn't it, now? And uh, once we get through these outlaps from the LMP2 leading group, we'll see where this actually sits in the run to the line. Which was the car we thought was edgy on fuel in the um, WRT? WRT. Because they, they stopped. They were in and the pits. They were in the pits as the safety car came out. Alpine lead, one red light on the side of their car. The last lap for Mike Conway was a, a 137.85, so he was really pushing into the pits for the final fuel stop. Potentially comes the Alpine. Can they make 39 minutes? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, easily. So that hands the lead back to Toyota. Mike Conway already in the lead. There he is. But Conway will have a splash at the end of this race, and uh, that, I think, is going to be the defining factor, because this will be just a short splash. So the, purely the refueling time between the two cars will be the difference. So how much can he build up here? These are going to be absolutely, potentially, race-winning laps for both cars. Last stop for Toyota, 1 minute 17. Last for Alpine, 1 minute 15. How much? Shorter, if any, will that be? Here goes the 36. 38 and a half minutes to the end of this race. And it will be Mattia Vazivier to bring it home. Do you know, the croupier hasn't even called Fet Vaugeur. Never mind, got the ball out and started spinning the roulette wheel, has he? This is going to be right down to the wire. One minute one was their pit stop. That's the number to look for, isn't it? When we see the, the uh, Toyota coming back, uh, come back back out from the stop, which will inevitably come. Well, it's how much of that is pit lane delta? Yeah, because 25 that, seconds. Because that will be 25, unchangeable. Okay. A drive through is 25 seconds here. Right. So it's 61 minus 25, which is... 36. Thank you. <laughs> 33 is the fuel, I think you'll find the Toyota so 20 seconds ahead after the stop. 33 for fuel. I Total. think the Toyota will so be 20 be seconds ahead after the stop. Right, so they need seven seconds of fuel. Okay. They need four laps of fuel. Okay. okay. Right. Yep. Oh, right. In, in a problem free run to the to the flag. Yes. Under green flags. And with no other drama anywhere else. Seven seconds. Else. No shooting through chicanes, no mistakes. Yep. And and none none permitted from Mathieu Vazivier. Yep. He's got to be fully lit, fully hundred percent millimeter accurate for the remaining thirty seven minutes. Unless I don't, we, we are not yet at the magical 25-minute mark, at which point all chaos descends upon us. <laughs> 12 minutes to go until all wheels fall off all wagons. <laughs> yeah, I didn't realise that was a... a it's a, a thing. A WC it's a rule. feature. Here's uh, our third-place car, and whatever else happens, um, this is the newer of their chassis since its first race, 709, has proved that they have work to do in the braking area. And Alan, when you see him get onto the brakes, there's clouds, much less now. There was when the discs were very fresh, clouds of black debris being thrown out by the wheels. Yeah, certainly uh, the braking energy is pretty high and uh, they had some issues with that. Here is about high speed and very heavy braking uh, and uh, you get cold discs going down the straight and then you get very quick increase in temperature. And once you start to get into the cycle where the wear rate goes up, then it's just uncontrollable. And that appears to be a little bit what maybe have happened to the Glickers. Now, as we watch our AF Corsa car leading, we're going to hear from Francois Perodo. Keep your eyes, though, on the battle behind for third place. Teo Cairoli and Augusto Farfus battling. Francois Perodo starting at the back of the grid at the start of this race came through the field so well and continuing that. Yeah, it's looking quite good. There's only uh, 45 minutes left, I think, and we're leading the race. It was bad news last night when we heard that we were disqualified after a technical infringement. But uh, Alessio took the start. He did a great job, uh, handed the car P1. And of course, I mean, that's racing. We were helped by the safety car. So I did the job for my drive time and then uh, hopefully the boys will bring her home on the top step, fingers crossed. Okay, fingers crossed, we'll speak to you later. Thank, Thank you. you.
Nick Nielsen is at the wheel. Second place in GTM D stations, Tomonobo Fuji. His last lap at 148.2. Oh, four close yellow coming. Whoa! Well, that this will not change the gaps between the cars. Prepare a full course yellow at 24, at 25.30. 17, 25.30, prepare full course yellow. Debris at the entrance to Ascari on driver's right is the reason for this. It won't allow the gaps to close, but it will remove some of the need for Toyota to spend time stationary. It allows them to come and fuel now, doesn't it? Yeah. Have they got it's time to do it? In, uh, well, he's in, in Parabolica. In yeah, he yeah. can fuel now. They can come now, and they will lose almost no time at all. That almost guarantees that they can't be caught. That's a really tough break for Alpine. And the radio to race control. Yeah, Toyota 7 hasn't. It's gone past. For why, Keats? For why? Looks like pieces of curbs actually came up there. That's pieces of the inside curb of yeah. Parabolica, the left-hand one that especially GT cars are cutting. A big chunk of splitter there, isn't there? No, that no, was I a think curb. that was curb, curb with the bolt holes. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right, Alan. That was bolt holes to hold the wow. curb down, the inner curbing. So two cars have came into the pits. That's uh, Richard Meal Racing Team LMP2 in eighth place and ninth place uh, High Class Racing. Both of them have pitted. Why would you not pit if you're Toyota? Why would you not? He had the they, chance. Yes, they had the chance. This does take away the racing time as well, in a way, because it holds it. Um, they were able to do that with the laps. And they're 90 seconds ahead. They would have been, they would have crept back out long before Alpine got to them. I can't answer your question. They do make some bizarre decisions sometimes. You know, I'm only a doofus, but it does seem, thank you, it does, <laughs> just as well we're not live on camera, it does seem that that was a golden opportunity to give your team the fuel they need. So full course yellow is continuing, even though they've picked up that curb. I'm sure they're inspecting what the rest of the curb around it is like as yeah. well. Part of that is the curb has come out, but it's bolted in, and often you find the that bolts. the remainder of the bolts are sticking out, and, and those tend not to be very kind on tyres. So we're looking there at Marshalls picking stuff up. They may be identifying if there is an issue there. If the bolts have ripped out as well, then you need to find them and all well and good, and we'll just go ahead with less curb. 32 minutes to go. How much racing do we get? This is the race ebbing away from Alpine, unless there is a drama for Toyota. Toyota could well be coming in. Louise Beckett, they went by last time. There's no major movement from the team, but as I say that, they're starting to now. The refueler is ready and in position, but nobody else is moving just yet. OK, there should be another five minutes Six of minutes. full horse yellow. Six minutes of full that, horse yellow. That strikes me as an inspection. Yeah. I think they are concerned about okay, exactly what you said. OK, they're getting ready now. OK. Toyota. Sorry, cut her off mid-sentence into the pit. So, that, so now, with that expected to be the case, how tough is that on Alpine, who had only stopped a few minutes earlier? It's the same as WRT earlier on in this race. Yeah. You know, it's a, like penalties in football, and I hate to say it, but I know all about that situation. It goes with you sometimes, goes against you in others. But uh, we're in with Alpine at the moment, and let's go and listen to my two activities radio. That's it, that's it. They will decide, the guy continue, maybe it's okay for them, or they will pit. Yeah, that was uh, half a lap ago. Have they pitted? No, they haven't. Yeah, but Mathieu Vexivé is coming out of the first chicane, whereas right now Mike Conway is actually going into the final corner parabolica. And at this average speed they're doing, it's effectively like a free stop for the Toyota. Yeah, absolutely. Because he'll be doing the same speed down the pit lane as they are out on the track. So the only Pretty difference much. will be the six or seven seconds it takes to put the fuel in. And he's got a two minute 40 lead. And 
it's insurmountable unless something happens to the Toyota. Yep, it's cruising in the pit lane now. This is one of the things, though, you always try and stretch your fuel mileages and try to bring yourself into the position that if you do get something like this, you have the opportunity to take it. If you don't do that, then you tend to miss out on the opportunities that present themselves. Number seven is in the pits. Kevin Escher has pitted for fuel. So too has Miguel Molina. That's first and fourth in GTE Pro. So have, deep breath, Norman Arto, Ben Hanley, Sophia Flerge, Anders Fjordback and Ryan Cullen. That is six, seven, eight, nine, ten in LMP2. So has Andrew Harrianto at Dempsey Proton in GTE Am. So they have all clearly gone. <gasps> Thank goodness for that. Now our fuel worries are over. So to confirm what we believe is happening under this full course yellow, there's a big chunk of curb with the bolt holes, but no bolts. Uh, that would seem to indicate that they're going to do an inspection to see whether or not where that was ripped from yeah. still has the bolts in place, or if not, whether or not they can find those fitments. Great view of the Autodroma Nazionale di Monza in the forest here of the Royal Park in Monza. And just sweeping through, cutting through down at the bottom there, that's the banking. There's banking at the north and the south of this track, and the road course comes all the way around. And you basically, a complete 10 kilometer lap would be around the banking, down the straight, through the road course, and back to the banking to end the lap. So uh, a phenomenal track last used. For Formula One cars in the 1960s, they were still using the high banking here. If you watch John Frankenheimer's Grand Prix film, you will see Grand Prix cars racing on the banking in Monza. Or if you walk up the banking, you realise how mental it was, <laughs> how insane it was. Yeah. As Jimmy Bruni has just taken a splash of fuel and back out. And the same deal as with the Toyota, you lose almost nothing. The only time you give away is whatever time it takes to put the fuel hose in plus give or take a second to slow down and speed up from uh, rolling in. And you saw just behind them Miguel Molina, and that's a third to fourth fight. And so basically pretty much status quo between the Porsche and the Ferrari. Then. Yeah, Toyota taking no chances. New tyres on the right side of the number seven car, as they had time to do it. Let's hear from the 92 Porsche. And they will have to bump as well, huh? They might come the next lap when they realise they didn't jump us. If I was them, I'd have done exactly that, done the opposite to us. So I think they might try and gamble and save fuel to the end. We, we were literally on a coin toss, but on a coin toss, sorry. But we had the gap, so we could do it. So now we stay out and let me know how many laps go. We currently 28 minutes remaining. I think in the wake of the Risi Competizione car, we are going to see maybe a curb fired up. We are. That was the final straw that broke the camel's back. All those sticky tires pulling, pulling, pulling for five hours at the curbing. Finally pulled it out. You saw one man there with a Birmingham screwdriver, approximately five pounds, and uh, another man there with a pair of Stilsons. So you're either going to undo it or hammer it in. That's right, that power tool. They've been bolting a new section of curb back down in that corner. Full course yellow will be removed at 17.34.30. In less than one minute, we're removing full course yellow. Into the last quarter effect, 25 minutes. Yep. And what looked like it could have been shaping up to be a very juicy battle. I'm afraid that curbing has rather put a, a mocker on. Toyota got a free stop. But don't curb your enthusiasm because yeah, it's going to be a race to finish in at least two of these classes. Clearly here, can you and GT Pro, they're not quite sure which way this is going to play out yet. No, I, but they're all good for fuel now. And, and again, uh, Kevin Esch is engineer. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Full course yellow removed, full course yellow removed. Away we go. Kevin Estes, engineer, saying that Ferrari, or they, trying to decide which lap to come in on, toss of a coin. As he said, never do the same as what the other guys are doing. You don't usually gain an advantage from that. I mean, there are times when you have to, but there generally aren't. There is a very close battle for GTE Pro, just 
eight tenths of a second Kevin Escher ahead of Alessandro Pierre Guidi at the line as we restarted. We're on board with Ale. That white car just up ahead. That's the leader. And he's just been held up by the 22 United Auto Sports car as well. He won't come off the turn the way he wanted to. GT cars have a seems a higher apex to exit speed the LMP2 cars and then they have to wait for them to get out of the way. So Pierre Guidi versus Estra for the win here. 25 minutes to go. I wonder what Porsche are thinking. Luis Beckett might be able to find out from Neil Jarni. And he's potentially watching his car head to victory here. Neil Jarni, after five hours and 35 minutes, it's come down to this. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> one second difference. This has been a, a, a real up and down game between uh, the Ferrari and us. Um, just really a ping pong game. Uh, and uh, just right now we had to come for a splash and dash. They didn't. So now the gap is just uh, very close. So let's see. Um, hopefully they have to save some fuel now and then we can pull the gap up again. But let's see. Okay, thank you. Plenty of gaps still doable here in this uh, last 24 minutes, Martin. First of, uh, first thing to mention, by the way, is right at the end of that four-car shell, a 29 racing team Netherland pitted uh, in and out very rapidly, just 44 seconds on pit road. Nick de Vries retains third position overall, retains the lead uh, for the 29 squad in LMP2 Pro-Am. Richard Westbrook now under seven seconds from fourth position overall in that recovering Glickenhaus. There is a great battle potentially underway here uh, for the final podium positions, plural, in GTE AM. Tomo Bufuji is not going to catch Nick Nielsen, but has Augusta Farfus closing in on him, under eight seconds back. Matteo Caroli under 15 seconds back from that. In fact, before that uh, full course yellow came out, looked very much as if Farfus was going to drive to the rear of the 777 car. That, at the moment, has just stalled a little, but that battle is still very much alive. Got the makeup. Over three seconds a lap at the moment on Tomorrow Fuji. So it's going to be close from Augusto Farfus. But right now, Aston Martin second and third, but they, of course, are leading. The car that started last was second fastest in qualifying, but lost its time because of a ride height infringement. It's the battle overall for the win in GTE Pro, though, that I think is going to capture our interest here. Kevin Estra has got the hammer down. Alessandro Pierguidi, it's, well, two cars between the two and one and a half seconds. And they've gambled on track position versus splash and dash. And the question is, can they do it? There is uh, the click and house of Richard Westbrook. He's uh, closing in rapidly on Robin Fiennes. It's under five seconds now uh, for what will be fourth position overall. Good recovery drive from this team after the brake change forced them into the pits for eight minutes whilst leading the race, let's not forget. And there he is. He was 2.3 seconds behind, uh, 2.3 seconds quicker on the last lap. And he is one, two, three and a half, nearly four seconds back still. Bit of traffic over there it for the Glicken House. Yeah. And WRT with a long run in front, a couple of and cars they'll catch under braking. If, he, if Robin Freeze doesn't get by, then the Glickenhaus will close up quickly. 3.7 seconds, the gap at the line. Uh, goes up the inside of the GT Pro Porsche, closes up and get, again under braking. Two lights on the side of the WRT car, that's because it's second in LMP2. Yeah. We'll stay in that position, whatever happens with any kind of clean pass from the Glickenhaus. Westbrook had to really get in there late to get round the GT Pro Porsche, so he's a little slower off the turn. He has got better speed than Robin Freeds in the LMP2 from Team WRT. So now he's coming down relentlessly. Meanwhile, uh, Farfus is taking tenths out in every sector from the 777 car of Bufuji. That's going to go right to the end here, I think. 1.7 seconds quicker on the last lap the Brazilian was than his Japanese rival. Interesting little dynamic coming into the GTE Pro battle because they're closing on the 44 Ligier ahead. Ooh. 
That could come into the equation here. They, they're not closing on it. They're right. basically up his exhaust pipes, aren't they? Yes. But is that going to delay Kevin Estrin? That's Miro Konopka, who is lapping maybe a tenth quicker than Est, and maybe six tenths quicker than Alessandro Pierre Guidi. There's the 33 Aston Martin that started from pole, the turquoise car. A big tyre delamination ripped the left corner of the car apart and cost them any chance of a win here, which is a real shame. Ben Keating and his team looked like they had a car that was capable of matching anybody in GTE Am, as they have done on both occasions so far this season. And there is Jim Glickenhouse. Don't show me, show my car. Point eight of a second across the line, closer now as they come into turn one. This is about fourth position overall in the race. That's point eight of a car apart <laughs> there, wasn't it, at the apex? And Westbrook, with the top speed of the hypercar, drives around the outside. He's got more power, he's got more rubber, he's got more grip, he's got fourth place. That will be, I think, as far as speed will take him. It's 49 seconds up the road for the United car. It's been a good day, I think, for Glickenhaus, despite the disappointment of the retirement with gearbox issues of the other car. It's been a competitive run. Whatever Jim says, I think we all agree there's possibly some consideration to be done about the braking system on that car before we get to Le Mans. I don't think they're going to kid themselves, are they? No. They've had to change brakes after four hours. They know that needs issues uh, sorting. That is a, a, a massive Achilles heel. Whatever other reliability issues the car may or may not have, if you're changing brakes six times in a race or five times in a race, you ain't going to stay in the lead group for very long. But Toyota also have massive issues with the number eight, and that they can't possibly only be considered as a car issue. There must be a fundamental underlying problem there that they are lucky, perhaps, not to have had with the number seven as well. Well, we have that one power recycle, didn't we, for the number seven car, plus the puncture. But, uh, from the point of view of Toyota, lots of questions. The point of view of Flickenhaus, some significant questions, but also some real plus points here. What we now know is that car's quick. Yep. It's in the window, which is exactly where it needs to be. Two retirements from our bumper field. One car didn't start the inception racing. Uh, Ferrari was due to stop. Pit stop of car seven under investigation. That's the final pit stop of the uh, leading Toyota of Mike Conway when they came under, under that full course yellow, which was five laps ago. Two retirements, the number 60 Iron Lynx Am class Ferrari, which had a big shunt in FP2, barely turned a wheel in qualifying and clearly not a happy bunny after that. May have looked straight-ish, don't think it was entirely sorted. And the 708, the Glicken House that raced in Portimao, and uh, fairly major gearbox issues. Here is the Ferrari, the Ferrari, the Toyota. Toyota pit stop. Now, what is the issue here? Fuel going in. How many hands bottle. on the car? Mm, well, windscreen and drinks bottle are both safety issues. Three. Not sure. Let's watch this. Is it how long the hose was on? Is it how long the hose was on? They've, they've been caught by this before. I can't see. In the final hour, is that an issue? I mean, we don't have don't the same so. sort of Nürburgring 24-hour rules, but is that an issue if you have a short stop? That seems wildly punitive if you still have to have 34 seconds well, or something of, of hose connection. And even more ominously, team manager, car seven to the race director. Oh, OK, so we've got 15 minutes left. In 20 minutes, will we know who's won the race? Depends how quickly you walk to the race director. <laughs> I'd be going quite yeah. slowly if I was him. Yeah, it may do. It's quite a long way to the race director's office. They were pit out. Oh, course. some stairs. It's quite warm. It's warm. It's warm. It's warm. It's warm. Here is the number seven car then. Yeah, well, it's been a drama-filled day, hasn't it, really? Just. If you think about it, it's just becoming even more drama-filled. Can we come back next week? Oh, no, that's what the uh, European Le Mans series drivers did, isn't it? <laughs> and Graham, who was here last weekend for the MS in Le Mans Cup. <laughs> you want to go home. We, we want more of this kind of racing, though. This is fantastic. Yeah, and I tell you what, 
If this doesn't make your mouth water a little bit for the morning oh, August. Yes, yes. We've had four good races throughout the fields of these, uh, and of course the, the field deeper still when yep. we get to Le Mans. Ben Hanley, Norman Nato at it. Yeah. This is uh, quite nice. This is for position Ben Hanley in the white car, Real Team Racing's Norman Nato. This is for sixth in LMP2. But more importantly, it's for second in the Pro-Am category yep. of LMP2 as well. And Racing Pro Team Netherlands is uh, significantly far up the road leading that category. Yep. But it's a lap ahead of that battle, isn't it? Great stuff. So there is the Racing Team Netherlands car, the yellow and black car. That is the Pro-Am leader. It's third in LMP2. The battle behind it on the road is for sixth in LMP2, so it's a lap difference. It is indeed. But those are one, two, three in Pro-Am. Flash of the headlights there from Norman Nato. He doesn't want the Ferrari to get in the way. The Ferrari has been in the way, didn't get in the way. Uh, Hanley's got a good run on him. Yeah, here we go. Nato was caught a little bit in the wake of the Ferrari, and that sort of allowed Hanley to take a nice wide line. Deal done. Yeah, Nato's not giving it up. He's coming back. This will be the last of the late, late breakers. Ben Hanley on the bumps. That commands the inside line. Takes the spot up to sixth position. And he is in second in Pro-Am, yes. And that is what it's all about. There's the real team racing crew shaking their heads. Not an awful lot the Norman Nato could do about that. And to some degree, this all plays out with who had fresher tyres when, which of the gentlemen drivers was in when, what's left over at the end of the race for the hot shoes to try and battle for every inch of this track. OK, what are we being shown here? It's Is a foot on the white line. Foot on the white line. Is that line. a no jump? You're supposed to be, yeah, behind, you've got to be behind the, the white, white line. 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 Yep. Well, now, in tennis, that's in. This yeah, but we're not, we're not in Wimbledon here. I know. Yep. You're not in Wimbledon now, Toto. Goodness. Well, that... At Alamanish, you've got 12 minutes and 48 seconds to find the rule in the rule book and then guess what the appropriate penalty uh, the might be. And the penalties could be ranging in these things. Stop and go, drive through. It'd be a penalty. You know, they can't do a drive through. Uh, so, sorry, a stop and go or a drive through. Well, I think stop it'll and be a time be... penalty at the end of the race. Yeah. Stop and go would be 30 seconds added to their race yeah, time. Which still means they would win yeah. if they did it now. Yep. Yeah. And a drive through would be less than 30 seconds. 25 seconds on pit lane. Yeah, I would always take the time penalty as opposed to the drive through. The drive through, you kind of an issue. Time penalty yep. after the race, you know exactly what you're playing with until the line. Yep. So he's got to stay 30 seconds ahead of Mathieu Vazivier. This is like an aggregate race. Do you remember <laughs> when we used to have those? Part one, red flag, part two. Well, he is ahead, but he's only ahead by 12 seconds, and he was behind by 17 seconds after part one. So although he's in front, he's actually five seconds behind. Yeah, yeah just that's why that we don't do that anymore. Before my time. There's not many people not Arthur, that remember our time of, <laughs> of aggregate races. Ask your father, Graham, or Alan. He'll tell you all the chapter. Uh, and Augusta Farfus, by the way, is still catching uh, Tomo Fuji, but probably not quickly enough. Yeah. Under six seconds, he is taking time out. It took a tenth out of yeah, the last Yeah, but it was over a minutes. second the lap before that. Yeah. So in clear air, it looks to me like uh, Farfus has got much the quicker car. But, uh, it's going to be tight. It's, yeah. it's definitely going to be tight. Norman Nato, Ben Hanley, that uh, battle looks done for the moment. They're GT basically the length of the Roggia to the Lesmos apart. Yeah. That's not a big gap. That's one little mistake. Across the line, across the last timing line, it was precisely to a thousandth, one second, the gap in uh, GTE Pro. Across the uh, the start-finish line, it's a couple of hundreds closer again. Not done yet in GTE no. Pro. And with Pride of Ferrari on the line here at home. But we heard about the Porsche team saying it's a coin toss about whether you come in and do a splash or yep. you gamble on getting to the end. We're with Alessandro Pierre Guidi, they gambled. Yep. And can they make it to the end of the race? Saw him being very busy hands there out of the Roggia into Curva de Lesmo. 
Spino Lesmo, sports centre there on the left-hand side, just the other side of the wall. Wall kicks up the gravel. He's not giving this one. If he runs dry in the final lap, at least he knows he goes down fighting. Alexander Selig there. Is this going to go their way? Our Porsche, they have the lead. Are they going to hold on? 0.8 of a second in it. And nine minutes. Team Manager Car 70 race director, second time of asking. Yeah. That's uh, that's in caps. I mean they all are, but that yep. is uh, that is the race director now shouting. Don't like, make me come and get you, yes. I think is that what's about. I think this could be race director. Information to the pit lane, information to the pit lane. Warning on car number seven for a pit stop infringement. Warning on car number seven for a pit stop infringement. Warning only, it would yeah. appear. Honestly, you know, one foot on the white line, I, th I think a drive-through penalty would have been extremely harsh in that circumstance. A drive-through penalty that cost them the race, that would be really, really, really tough. Now, if they're not close enough, but, uh, you know, we're, set, we're potentially setting precedents for what might happen at Le Mans here. And if you've got a foot on the white line after 23 and a half hours, because everybody is, has been up for 40, yep. which is the reality of it at the end of Le Mans. Yep. Here we go again. For that much, so I... The, so the tyre is on the white line. The tyre's on the white line. As well as the foot. I think the tyre is the issue there. Okay, still, it's a warning. However, do that at Le Mans, boys. You're back in the pits. Absolutely. Through comes the race leader and the LMP2 leader. And is that the, G that's the GTE Pro third place car? Yeah. It's all the number eight Toyota shaping up behind, but actually can't stay with the number seven car, even at this late stage of the race. So clearly all is not well with Toyota number eight. It's not even on page one of the timing screen, so it's barely in the top 30, if at all. I turn to page three, it's still 33rd, 43 laps back. It's not lost any more laps to the leader no. since it came back out. It's so my, it's my, my maths is correct. They are seven laps in, at least, aren't they? We're on lap 198. We've got seven and a half, eight minutes to go, so we'll get to lap 203, 204. Yeah, the 709, meanwhile, is closing on Felipe Albuquerque. It's 37 seconds behind now, but with under eight minutes left, that gap is not going to close. Well, it'll close significantly. Is, is at the moment uh, lapping something like two seconds a lap uh, quicker than the car ahead. So we're going to get down to something in the 20s, aren't we? Yep. But uh, it's been, I think, a fine fight back from the 709. They've lost eight minutes. They'll fall, um, what, something like 20 seconds shy of a podium position. Yep. I think got every reason to go away from this, highly encouraged by the progress with this car. Uh, not, sure, not sure they're going to be much more than eight minutes behind the leader either, are they? They're four laps behind, aren't they? At, at one minute 30 a lap. 140 if we give them that. Right, so, so 100 so seconds a lap. Yeah, so four, four laps, so that's 400 seconds. That's, uh, that's, not, that's six not minutes and 40 minutes. seconds. Yeah, yeah. And they lost eight minutes in the pits. They did. If they hadn't had that, all right, if Toyota hadn't had the two problems with the number seven car, then they would be yep. further away again. But actually, they could have won this race. How spelt, they could have been making Toyota really sweat. That's a very good point really sweat. Here is our second place car, D-Station Racing, Tomonobu Fuji. Now, this is a new car to the championship this season, a full season entry, and of course, Fuji-san, desperate to race in the shadow of his namesake, the Holy Mountain, Mount Fuji, but we will not go to Fuji this year. However, Augusto Farfus closing in from behind. Sounds a bit and closing like in rapidly might have now. a broken exhaust, actually, but closing down quickly inside the final six minutes. Now, the race doesn't stop at six minutes. If they've just gone across the line, another lap. it might be a last lap lunch. It's 2.2 seconds is the gap for that second place battle in GTM. This is the battle with the GR racing car in between for the overall win in GT Pro. That gap across the line, eight tenths of a second, plus this bit of traffic. Yep, Alessandro Pierre Guidi in the red Ferrari comes around the outside, the GR racing Porsche. 
And that is Mike Wainwright, as we suspected. He had a small amount of time to do, but the way the race has fallen, he's in for the final stint. GR Racing Car will finish inside the top 10. He's a lap ahead of Tony Vlander's Ferrari, the 61 car. Solid race from GR Racing this yep. time. They've run well at the front uh, with Ben Barker. Yep, no errors, no problems for the car that we've been aware of. Farfus oh, is good lit thing. here. Um, this, he's taken wow. the tents out in every... It's, it's gone blue. It's a qualifying lap for Augusto Farfus. He's going to have two or three of them to try and get on terms with Tomonobu Fuji. D-Station haven't finished on the podium this year, have no. they? Well, either way... And 98 this... haven't? I'll check. I, I don't think they have either. Uh, I think they had a pretty uh, tough time of it. I think spot. they have. I think they've been on the podium. Uh, double check. Uh, either way, AF Corsa, the 83 car, blaring, blaring some catastrophe, will win in AM, but will it be Porsche or Ferrari in Pro? The gap shows no signs of getting any larger. It's still two or three car lengths from Kevin Esch in the 92 Porsche to Alessandro Pierre Guidi in the 51 Ferrari. The 33 Aston Martin has had a second place this year. Aston Martin Racing's best result was last time it was a fourth. Yeah, so 98 hasn't been on the podium either. So 98 and 777 both will be, if they finish where they are now, first or, time podium finishers. Uh, even if this reverses, yeah. 1.5 seconds as they cross the line, it's a further tenth taken out of Fuji in yeah. the first sector. Fastest race lap for Augusto Farfus, 147.129. Bear with me, bear with, bear with. Their qualifying lap in that car was a... Can't find 98 now, I'm looking for it. Where is it? Well, to give you an idea how quick that is from Augusto Farfus, that's quicker than Kevin Estra went round last, uh, the last lap. Their qualifying lap was a 148.4. Yep. He's gone faster now than the car did 23 hours and, 50, uh, and 20 Guidi. minutes ago. There's two tenths of a second here as well. Coming together, the <laughs> GT broke back for the overall win. Porsche versus Ferrari on Ferrari's home ground. Yep. Italian in a Ferrari against a Frenchman in a Porsche. Welcome yep. to the World Championship. Absolutely. And let's not forget, at the end of this season, the victorious crew in this championship will become FIA World Champions. That is a big deal for these guys. Both these teams have been champions before, haven't they? Kevin Oestermarker uh, with uh, Michael Christensen. Yep. And James Collado and Alessandro Pierre Guidi preceded them as our champions in super season. Two very different characters. I mean, Kevin Estra, <laughs> it's, it's got that special kind of far away glance. That we, oh, and it's going to oh, be. It's, it's, that, they that's needed it. fuel. That was it. That's it. They gambled long and hard, and in the end, they needed a lap of fuel. Two minutes left in the battle, and he's in the pit lane. And we heard Kevin Estra's engineer saying it was a coin toss. They went. Possibly in, in you know, traditional Porsche manner going, we, we want to get to the end. We know we want to finish this one. Here's the battle for second in GTE Am. So one GT battle uh, surrenders and the other one continues to enthrall. They're right behind the high class racing entry. That is Anders Fjordback completing his driving time. Big lap underway at the moment for Richard Westbrook as well. He's gone purple. Uh, oh, this, uh, uh, first sector of the race for anybody, but he's got a lot of traffic between him and the number seven. It's the, this is the move. Noel Farfus around the outside and down the inside comes to Alex Brundle. Is that Brundle? It is. Goes through. Fuji's on the inside. This could play oh. back to the seven, triple sevens. Who's going to get the better run out the corner? Well, Farfus. Side by side. Amazing start. No, Farfus can't keep that. It was outside the white line, and that is in one of the particular corners that they have been warned about. Good grief. I know. Fantastic. A minute remains. The leader will maybe not even start one more lap. This might be the very last lap of the race. Third and second, second and third, you name it, you call it. My money's on, I don't know, 83, it's going to win. Seven uh, is coming down now towards the parabolic. 45 end. seconds, the leader will go on to one more lap after this. This is great stuff. Whoa, through goes the Alpine. That's not the race leader. The number seven Toyota is out of the parabolic. Unless he puts the handbrake on now or stops for a cup of tea, there will be one 
to go Clattis. after this one. Fuji clatters the curves, that delays him just a little. It's given Farfus a go for oh. another run. Goes to the inside, goes to the outside. Augusto fresh off nearly a winning weekend last week in pure ETCR and Motorland Oregon. Ended up finishing in second place, but won his final big weekend. He races a Hyundai in the Electric Championship, races an Aston Martin here. He's got the run going again on Fujisan. Seven has started its final lap. Yep. It'll be this lap and, and the, the one that follows for this battle. Yep. Again, Augusto Farfus dancing around in the mirrors of the 777 car. It's a D-Station car in second place in the class of the 98 car for the Northwest AMR team. Time is up. Time is up. <laughs> we, we have finished six hours. We've got a lap to go and this half of the lap for Tomonobu Fuji to hang on to second place for both cars, whichever way they finish, it will be a first podium of the World Endurance Championship season for D-Station Racing, a first podium, full stop, and Farfus again, wide out of the final turn. He's got nothing left to give, has he? But he's got the better run out of the Parabolica. Is there enough here? I don't think no. there quite is. It's going to be the lunge. And that's very dangerous right here, yeah. right now. Fuji will be painted to the white line. Farfus tries to go around the outside, inside. And Fuji, Sam, does he get it squared away? He can park it on the apex here, but he can't park it on the exit. Farfus comes around the outside of Curva Grande, and this could give him the lead and second place in GTE. And what a fantastic last lap battle. Six hours and a minute already into the six hours. Checker is out. Seven Toyota wins it. It will be the Alpine in second, and Glickenhaus will come home third. The 22 United Autosports car leading. That was Kevin Escher taking the chequered flag as well in the white car. And Farfus is in front. Last lap in GTE Am. LMP2 United Autosports. Harfer, there he is across the line. And the winner, the 83 car in uh, GTE Am on his way to the checker as well. And Fuji. No disgrace there, Augusto Farfus, hugely experienced and the reigning Formula E champion. And Tomonobu Fuji just losing out on the final lap. He, wore, he took second place after six hours. That's not when the race is finished. Astonishing stuff from this pair, door banking stuff. And, uh, well, firm. We'll wait and see whether or not everybody agrees it's fair. I, yeah. I thought it enjoyed it. I thought that was entirely reasonable racing. You're racing for a podium spot in the final five minutes. I mean, Augusto ran out wide in the Parabolica a couple of times and does again. And that gives him a slingshot down the straight. But Fuji held him off there. And it is second for the 98 AMR car, third for D Station. OK, they might be a little disappointed not to take second, but for D-Station Racing, it's their first ever World Championship podium, and Farfus just crept in front of the Roger to take second. Wow, that was some six hours of racing. Toyota number seven, first win of the season for Mike Conway, Kamui Kobayashi, and Jose Maria Lopez. And boy, Graham Goodwin, they needed that. Yeah, look at the relief on the faces of some of these Toyota guys, because I think they are relieved. That, that could have turned horribly bad for this team. Both cars had problems. Uh, the number seven car comes home to take the win. Great race from the number 92 Porsche to fend off race-long pressure from the 51 Ferrari. Amazing consistency again from United Autosports. They didn't have the best of the starts this year, uh, start to their season, but uh, they've come back and delivered uh, here again, as they did at Spa. Not the start of the season, Portimao was the one where they had a little bit of a wobble, didn't they? Yeah. But great stuff from the 22 crew, this new look 22 crew. Uh, for the United Autosports team, and that will help them in the defence for their title. And, and GTM, well, the 83 car pretty much cruised to it, but that was one hell of a final lap well, between they, those two Aston Martins. Yeah, they did cruise to it from last on the grid. Yes, indeed. So that's a heck of a race from them as well. And Alessia Rivera. I mean, all three of them, really, you know, Nick Nielsen and Francois Perrault, again, we say so often about these GTEM lines up, lineups in uh, LMP2 and in GTEM itself. Without that man, first of all, you don't have the budget, there's no car on the grid. And secondly, if he's not fast, you don't win stuff. And Francois Perrault 
is fast. Already a WEC champion in GTM and yeah. very much part of the story about who's going to get there this time. So many storylines and one of them is going to be, we're here in the heat of summer in Italy, it's caused some problems. August in France, it's going to be hot. And we've seen what that can do for the cars up and down this grid. You cannot write the story of Le Mans yet no. uh, in 2021. You Good cannot Lord, write no. it. Good Lord, no. And looking as uh, coming, coming in, this is the Pro-Am winner, the yep. Racing Team Netherland car. Fritz van Erd run a fine race. Paul Lipschatan, the late min the last minute replacement for Guido van der Gaard. And um, Nick de Vries replacing Job van Utek. Yep. You're both feeling well at home, guys. Well, and again, like Phil Hansen, overall in NMP2, there he, well, there is Philippe Albuquerque doing some donuts. Um, now, Fritz van Aerd is the only man in that 29 car who could win the Pro-Am title because he hasn't had the same two teammates all the way through. Fabio Scherer, Philippe Albuquerque have both missed a race. So it is Phil Hansen alone in LMP2, and he's now the solo leader of the LMP2 points. So I should say, by the way, great stuff from Phil Hansen, really good run from Fabio Scherer yep. on the return uh, to the championship this weekend. Uh, soaked up the real pressure there. Great stuff from this crew, though, the number seven crew. They're going to be hungry in a month or so's time, aren't they? Very, yep. very hungry indeed. Yep, number eight has won the last three years at the Mon. Number seven. Definitely, they want to turn that around. They want to be champions. They want to be Le Mans winners. And they have to make sure that they've got the pace, the reliability, and there's nothing wrong with their pace. They are the quicker of the two crews overall and have been all season, pretty much were last season. Didn't necessarily have the rub of the green. Will that change this year? So Team WRT finished second in LMP2. Racing Team Netherlands finished third overall in LMP2. Just off the overall P2 podium into Europol competition. Two fifths and a fourth so far yeah. for that team. The consistency is what's paying off for the Polish team. They're learning and they're getting quicker. Absolutely right. Podium cannot be far away. And maybe the next race, what a place that would be to do it for their first time. And our four cast winners arrive. So the United Auto Sports car, and here is the 83A of course of Ferrari. Francois Perodo will join that car in a moment. Nick Nielsen bringing it to the line. And Felipe Albuquerque with a helmet on. Fabio Scherer and Phil Hansen are LMP2 winners. Alessio Rivera will join the 83 guys in a moment or two. There's Alessia there, Francois Perodo. There's a very hot and sweaty James Collado, I think. Just peeling the helmet off. The Ferrari finishing in... Uh, no, he wasn't. Uh, so that was that Miguel Molina, in fact. And Sandro Pierguidi finishing second, of course, in that car. After the late splash, they didn't lose their spots. Also the Porsche 1-2, Porsche 1, Ferrari second in GCE Pro, Porsche in third place. Hypercar doled out the dramas of the, not, not necessarily the close racing side of things, but the dramas but too. of that as well, yeah. from time to time. LMP2, faultless stuff from United Autosports, some fine performances behind. They win LMP2, and third overall, just the fifth time that we've actually seen that in uh, WC history. Glickenhaus Racing, they showed as what they've got, and it's not quite enough yet, but it's coming. There's no doubt whatsoever about that. GTE Pro doled out the entertainment as it has done for the entire life of that class. Of course, there's number 83 car looking solid championship contenders ahead of that dogfight between the two Spitfires. Of of Martin Brock. Toyota number seven with Kamui Kobayashi, Mike Conway, and Jose Maria Lopez. They delivered pole position yesterday, but now converted that into their first race victory of the season in front of a crowd. The first time we've had a crowd in WEC for a long time. But Camus, I have to ask you, it wasn't an easy race. You had some problems out there and you had to recycle the car. What was the, the issue with it? Sorry. <laughs> a bit small. No, your average height, it's yeah, okay. It's okay. Hello. Yep. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think uh, suddenly this car was just shut down and we need to stop in safe place, but actually 
I couldn't find the safe place in there. And I just to stop in the green as much as I can to be safe. And I just got called for the restart the engine. So we need to shut down the car completely. And we need the back again, uh, which costs quite a lot of time. It's a bit shame because we had a quite reasonable margin. But uh, due to that, we are at the back to behind, uh, which is quite big lose. And obviously, we need to push again, which is it's not an easy situation because, as you see, the track is really narrow. Uh, when you're overtaking the, the slow car, actually, it's taking a lot of risk. So uh, was, I think everybody did a great job in the end. I think uh, we tried to push, but tried to be safe in the car. No damage. Uh, we did our best. And in the end, I think we, we managed to win, finally. So uh, very thanks to all the team. Did a great job. It's a bit shame to stop, but uh, I mean, this is the way we start. And uh, we are luckily before the month, so we need just to investigate, which is good. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations to the trio, because now it brings you right into the World Championship fight before the big race at Le Mans, and the momentum definitely is strong. But also, we have to congratulate as well the winners in GTE Pro, Neil Yanni and Kevin Estra. They delivered a killer blow to the Ferrari hopes here in GTE Pro. That was Six hours of Monza, the first time the FIA World Endurance Championship has raced at the Italian Temple of Speed. It started midday under bright blue skies in intense summer sunshine. Toyota had dominated in qualifying, locking out the front row. The biggest hypercar field seen so far, five new hypercars in this race. Second, Lickenhouse joining in. So everybody jockeyed for position in the Retifilio for the first time of asking. Cinetech run Alpine came through past number eight Toyota out of the chicane into second place, but that was short lived. Toyota's hybrid drive put it back in front, running into a 1 2 formation, seven ahead of eight. In the GT Pro field, they qualified Porsche, Ferrari, Porsche, Ferrari, and that remained at the start of the race. But behind them, the AM pole sitter Ben Keating, holding off the Cetelar Porsche, uh, Ferrari, and allowing a Porsche to go by as the Ferrari ran into the gravel. First contact of the race, Alex Brundle turning around the real team racing car, earning a drive through for the team. First full course yellow. Andrew Harianto spinning the 88 Dempsey Porsche into the gravel and needing rescuing. Battles up and down the order. Jota coming through after disappointments in qualifying. And then Chetelar, a second impact with the barriers in the race weekend. The first in free practice one, nearly taking out the 91 Porsche in the process. Trouble for the number eight Toyota just after Brendan Hartley had taken over. The car cruising around very slowly putting the Glickenhaus into the top three as the number eight car headed into the garage. They had a major front-end problem. So too did Ben Keating leading in GTE Am. Tire delamination ripping the front of the Aston Martin apart. Intense battle for position in GTE Pro. 92 Porsche getting back in front during the pit stops and then dramas for the 708 Glickenhaus. Toyota number seven continuing in the lead of the race as there was more problems. Full course yellow, and uh, allowing the battles to rage between the Aston Martins in the closing stage of the race. For GTE Am honors, 98 coming ahead of 777, 83 winning in GTE Am. In GTE Pro, a last minute pit stop, literally in the last two minutes. Uh, slightly taking the battle away from Ferrari, 92 Porsche 1. Third overall for the LMP2 win of the 22 United Autosports car, but victory overall and a hyperclass win for the third time for Toyota. Car number seven making it to the line relatively healthily to claim victory for the first time for that crew. So the Goodyear blimp hanging overhead in torpid skies. Good word, torpid, still and humid. And that's been uh, the weather. It has been pretty ferocious out on track game, Goodwin. That may be the best race I've seen in quite a while. Yeah, I think plenty of gelato and plenty of beer to come after this one. It's been a very warm week and a very, very warm day. And uh, fights well fought there across six hours. 
sets us up nicely, I think, for the summer. Delayed uh, running of the Le Mans 24 hours. 62 cars on that one, including all, at least, or almost all of these. One might not be there. We've got the, uh, the uh, first reserve here, but nothing uh, to complain about about that uh, six hours of entertainment. Leaves questions on the table for some very significant players, including this one. Well, it's worth pointing out, isn't it? Yes, Toyota Gazoo Racing were here last year. Yes, they've been here for several years. Yes, they've won Le Mans several times in a row. Yes, they've won the World Championship several times in a row. It is worth pointing out that hypercar is very much not last year's car with a different body shape. Its whole ethos, the hybrid drive, the mechanics of it, the electronics of it, very much road-based, not what they were racing with last year. So it is effectively as new as the Glickenhaus. I'm completely correct. I mean, I've said it before, I'll say it again and until people tell me to stop saying it. I think Toyota made a mistake. I think they made a mistake in putting the same livery on that car because it does have people believing that there are strands around that car that are in some way a carryover from the LMP1 car. Not it's true at all. It's not an LMP1 no. in a different pair of loafers. No, no. Well, our winners will come out onto the podium. The AF Corsa 83 Ferrari winning in GTE Am, 92 Porsche winning in GTE Pro in LMP2 United Autosports, third overall. This is our overall podium. So United Autosports coming out into third place overall. Fabio Scherer, Phil Hansen and Felipe Albuquerque. The fifth time that's happened in WC history involving six cars now with the double podium at Le Mans in 2017 for Jackie Chan DC Racing, Bahrain in 2020 for Jackie Chan DC Racing, Bahrain in 2013 for Chew Drive and Sebring 2012 for Starworks, the very first WC race. So in which case, it is United Autosports first overall podium in their history. Yeah, Alpine to the second step and a fine race from them. Yeah, really strong race from them they two led they had pace here and if Toyota struck any more trouble then they could well have been in with a great shout but it was the crew of Toyota number seven that won Mike Conway, Josemir Lopez and Kamui Kobayashi and this trio now close within half a dozen points of the overall championship lead Well, that's uh, Mike Conway's ninth overall win in his WC career. He had in his LMP2 successes 13 uh, trips to the top of the podium. Here, it's eight wins for Kamu Kobayashi. He's now come to be level with Mark Webber uh, from his Porsche exploits. The seventh win for Pichita Lopez. And it's the tenth win across all classes for drivers from Argentina. His first win, of course, we've already said, 2021 for the reigning champions. Here's a quirky one. It's the first time Toto won a round three of the WC Championship. And when was the last not Toyota 1-2? I probably ought to be able to tell you that at the drop of a hat, and I can't. Graham's having a ponder. He's trying to think when last year it was. I'm sure there must have been one. Well, rebellion. Yes. So when? Well, whatever else, that closes the championship right up for the Toyota drivers. And realistically, we are expecting one of the two Toyota teams to end up with the championship. There's Phil Hansen. He'll be back out as the uh, top step for the top step of the LMP2 podium. And he alone is now our LMP2 points leader. Fabio Scherra missed Portimao because of positive COVID test. And Philippe Albuquerque missed. One of the others. Brendan Hartley. Miss Portimao. 
Kazuki Nakajima and Sebastian Buemi. It was Spa that Sharon missed them. 75 points. They are six ahead of Pachito Lopez, Camille Kobayashi and Mike Conway because they got, again, a point for pole position. Andre Negrau, Maggio Vazivier and Nicola Lapierre lie in third. And our Glickenhouse crew with uh, Richard Westbrook and his colleagues are in Lavon fourth Lachier, position. The last uh, time that Toyota did, did not didn't have a one to. Fred, um, GTM's left, GTM's left. Well, it was such a strong performance from, all, from both of you throughout that race, but then it all came down to the end, and if they were going to have to stop for that last splash. Yeah, it was, uh, to be honest, four cars, but it, it hasn't been such a close race since uh, years in WEC and GT, so really, really cool to, uh, to race here in Monza. Uh, we had the performance, but just there, you know, and Ferrari was all the time behind us, put in pressure. And the last stop, we, we just went on the Fulco Cielo, did a splash, and they didn't. And we were like, okay, maybe they make it to the end. And he was coming, he was faster, so I was prepared to get as wide as possible. But then he had to pit, uh, obviously he had not enough fuel, so um, we managed to bring back the win, which is uh, which is great, and, and great job by Neil. He, he drove fantastic this race. Well done, both of you, and just what you needed before you get to Le Mans. Thank you. Thanks. So it was, after the real disappointment of Portimao, where the Porsches were absolutely lost, it's what they needed, they finished first and third, Ferrari second and fourth, James Collado, Alessandro Pierre Guidi on the second step, and of course at Le Mans we will have three drivers in the cars, that's the minimum requirement, so they will all have their long-term teammates with them. Six wins now for Kevin Est and uh, two wins out of three GT Pro starts from Neil Jenny. And, uh, six wins, by the way, uh, for Kevin Est have all come at different circuits. Wow, really? Yeah. That's entertaining. So in Spa, when the temperatures were more moderate, they were right there with Ferrari. In the heat of Portimao, Ferrari I mean, had the upper hand with, with no question at all. What about when we get to the end of the year in Bahrain? That, if Porsche might need to have a points advantage by that stage. It's going to be fun. I mean, you know, we said we said the start of the race, didn't we? Remember, it's not just the number of races. Fewer races this season for obvious reasons, but it's the split of the points across those races. From this point forward, we have one six-hour race. We have one eight-hour race, and we have one 24-hour race. Yep. So we've got the majority of the points still to be awarded this season. Four and a half lots of points. That's a hundred and a half. And a half. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah, that is, isn't it? Not done yet. Lots of points. Good year blimp over the park as we see the points for GTE Pro and well, GTE drivers, actually. Kevin Estra and Neil Janik just two points ahead now. They take the lead of the championship from Alessandro Pierre Guidi and James Collado, the 92 Porsche crew from the 51 F Corsa Ferrari crew. Daniel Serra and Miguel Molina falling off that battle a little bit. 20 points is the gap, but a Le Mans win for them would change things really very impressively indeed. And then uh, Jimmy Bruni and Ricard Leitz are further nine points back from there. It's GT Pro, LMP2 next. Let's go down. Louise has got the winners with her. Can I say the number 22 United, you put on a great performance throughout that race and getting the overall third spot from the six hours of Monza. <laughs> Uh, I could not be more proud about these boys. I mean, Fabio, it's his second race in WEC and he goes to the overall podium. I think he's getting not the best, uh, getting going to be spoiled for sure. It's going to be my, I think me and Phil's first overall podium. The car was just, just amazing. It was a great fight against the WR team. But again, uh, I think everyone there did an amazing job. 
We were on the top two the whole weekend. The car was just amazing. Very nice to drive. Phil did an amazing job at the start, going to P1 and holding there. And Fabio as well on his pace, pulling the gap as well. So it's a perfect race, to be honest. Well, go and enjoy going on to that very famous podium. Thank you. Louis grabbing a moment or two with the boys before they went up onto the overall podium. They, of course, also top our LMP2 pile. Uh, they win from Team WRT and Racing Team Netherlands in third place overall. an impressive stat. That means that uh, Felipe Albuquerque and Phil Hansen have now won six of the last seven WC LMP2 races. <laughs> That's the astonishing form they showed at the end of last season to dominate the, uh, the run to the championship and two faultless performances this season in the top in the first three races. But, uh, we just took them on last year, so they head back to the scene of that big victory as well with the wind in their sails after a great race here in Monza. And WRT, if the safety car had fallen differently, could have been they very, might have been on the top step. It could have been very different indeed. But uh... Well, Ferdy Habsburg said we've got to stop making mistakes, we need to iron out the little issues. They didn't make any mistakes. They were very unfortunate. They still lie in fourth place in the team standings, but United Autosports have the lead ahead of Jota, who were 1-2 uh, coming in here. Jota having a pretty tough time. 38 scores nothing, and the 28 car struggling as well. They only finished in fifth position. After their faultless display, aside from the, the turn one shenanigans in Portimao, They'll go away and be asking questions of themselves for sure from here. And into Europol, just a point behind WRT. Be judged by the company you keep. I think we can judge into Europol pretty well so that, far. It's been a very, very impressive start to this campaign. They've invested well, uh, both in terms of the uh, the resource, the, the, the human resource they've put in place here and the training they've put in place with that team. Yeah. There is definitely more to come. They were in podium positions more than once during this race. Uh, we did have one little stumble earlier on in the race for them. Could that have made a difference? And uh, we talked a little earlier, Martin, about had that not been a braking issue, look at how long it uh, took the Glickenhaus team on the pit lane. Yep. They could have won the race. Without a shadow of a doubt, could have won this race on pace. Absolutely. Into Europol will definitely be uh, in the shout for a podium. Fourth place here not far away from the top three racing team Netherlands you just saw WRT and United Autosports United Autosports they need to change their car color to purple really to reflect the sort of patch that they are having however a very very famous first world endurance championship podium for D station racing Tomonobu Fuji may feel disappointed that he was beaten after the six hours by Augusto Farfus in the 98 Aston they take second position two Astons on the podium would have could have who knows what might have happened with Ben Keating and the 33 team that dominated in qualifying and led early on barring that puncture but it was victory from last on the grid for the 83A, of course, of Ferrari. Six wins in the WC. Now for Francois Perodo, level with Duval, Dumas, Estra. That's not a bad trio. It's joined, is it? And there's more stats to come once we've enjoyed the national anthem that will follow for the winning team, AF Corsa.
just gets two bars. That has been floating across the paddock on a daily basis several times a day just to make sure finally we get a chance to hear it on a podium. The stat that comes with that is with Alessio Rivera standing on the top step of the podium, he becomes the 60th winner from Italy in the WC's history. All right, excellent stuff for him. Or rather, the 60th victory. The 60th victory. By an Italian driver. Uh, great stuff for the 83 crew, and they're turning their season around in rapid fire order, aren't they? Yeah, 98 also turning their fortunes around and triple seven. First podium for them, and again, for Tomo Fuji to have Augusto Farfus diving up the inside and taking away second place on the very last lap. That's no disgrace. That was it. Farfus is a quality, world-class driver. Yes, Satoshi Hoshino will be correctly very pleased indeed with that. Point standings there. Settimar Racing still retain the uh, lead in the championship despite a, a really disappointed weekend for them. The 83 car, though, closes to within two points of that, the 98 car, 10 points off the championship lead with a bundle of points to come, 54 AF Corsa, 41 points, Team Project 1's 56, 40 points. Yeah, the Tier Sport, the 33 car, the four horseman car, really unfortunate here, just could have been right back in the fray, but who knows, Ben Keating and his crew go to Le Mans for the seventh time for Ben in a seventh different vehicle. Antonio Fuoco, Giorgio Senna, Giotto, Roberto Lacorte for Chetelar, still slender leaders in the driver's points ahead of Alessio Rivera, Nick Nielsen and Francois Perodo. And next stop for them and for everybody else is the 24 hours of Le Mans for uh, everybody, that is a massive, massive hurdle to get over. D Station finishing third here, 98 AMR, Aston Martin in second place. But they were, although they were close together, and the gap at the line was seven tenths of a second after six hours and five minutes or whatever it took to finish their race, uh, they were still just left behind a little by the AF Corsa car that had a really, really solid run from the back of the grid. It was second quickest in qualifying. We knew it would be a contender. In the Pro-Ams Championship, real team sailed to the top three points ahead of Racing Team Netherlands, who closed them right down. Dragon Speed in third ahead of High Class and ARC Bratislava. There is real team. They finish third here in Pro-Am. Going well this season, their first season in the FR World Endurance Championship stepping up from LMP3 last year in the LMS. Second for the Dragon Speed USA team. Yep, Juan Pablo Montoya appears on a Monza podium once again. Yeah, it's been a while since the last one and the view will be very different. The track is not flooded with Tifosi and Ferrari flags. But I'm sure he'll enjoy it just as much. And our race winners in Pro-Am Racing Team Netherlands of the Dutch National Anthem and uh, after a few days which have been very difficult for people in parts of Holland and Belgium and Germany to have something positive to focus on here and have our racing family friends are recovering from that it's uh, great to finish this weekend with positive it really did what an epic first ever again find that hard to believe first ever FIA World Endurance Championship race here in Mons the six hours of 2021 was an absolute barnstormer from start to finish and the next time we meet will be late August at the Circuit de la Sarth. Till then, from everybody here, from the WEC TV crew, from Louise Beckett, Duncan Vincent, from Graham Goodwin and Alan Minish, I'm Martin Haven saying thank you for joining us. Thank you for your company. We look forward to meeting you again as we get set for the world's greatest endurance motor race, the 24 Heures du Monde. We'll see you then. Bye for now.